This is Audible. Marathon by Christian Cameron. Read by Peter Noble. You doubt, Dion said. I too doubt. Doubt is to piety what exercise is to athletics. But the gods spoke to you, and in a day or less, you will see. Then I walked down the steps of the portico. I contemplated briefly a dramatic assault on my fate. I wondered what would happen if I ran to the left, accosted the slave sweeping the steps, and demanded that he order me to do something so that I might obey. But some things are ordained. Whether the hand of man or the hand of the gods is in it matters little as the petty hands of men may well be the tools of the gods as well. Dion's lesson. So I walked down the steps to where Miltiades stood, his arms crossed over his magnificent breastplate of silvered bronze. His helmet was between his feet, and his shield was being held by his hippaspist. His son Simon stood behind him, also arrayed for war. In truth, my heart soared to meet them. Command me, Lord, I said. Follow me, he said, as his arms embraced me and he crushed me against his chest. Just those two words, and my fate was sealed again. I'm not any younger, and that's a fact, but I gather my story's a good one, or you people wouldn't cluster around so eagerly to hear my tale. Honey, you've brought your scribbler back to me. He's promised to write it all out in the new way, although if I was allowed, I'd rather hear a rhapsode sing it the old way. But the old ways died with the Medes, didn't they? It's all different now. The world I'm telling you about is as dead as old Homer's heroes at Troy. Even my Thugater here thinks I'm the relic of a time when the gods still walked abroad, eh? You young people make me laugh. You're soft. But you're soft because we killed all the monsters. And whose fault is that? And the blushing girls come back. Ah, it makes me younger just to see you, child. I'd take you myself, but all my other wives would object. Ha <laughs> ha! Look at that color on her face, my young friends. There's fire under that skin. Marry her quick, before the fire catches somewhere it oughtn't. It looks to me as if my daughter has brought every young sprig in the town and some foreigners from up the coast as well, just to hear her old man speak of his fate, flattering in a way. But you know that I'll tell you of Marathon, and you know that there is no nobler moment in all the history of men, of Hellenes. We stood against them man to man, and we were better. But it didn't start that way. Not by as long a ride as a man could make in a year on a good horse. For those of you who missed the first nights of my rambling story, I'm Arimnestos of Plataea. I told the story of how my father was the bronze smith of our city, and how we marched to fight the Spartans at Oinoe, and fought three battles in a week. How he was murdered by his cousin Simon. How Simon sold me as a slave, far to the east among the men of Ionia, and how I grew to manhood as a slave in the house of a fine poet in Ephesus, one of the greatest cities in the world, right under the shadow of the temple of Artemis. I was slave to Hipponax the poet, and his son Archilogos. In time they freed me, I became a warrior, and then a great warrior. But when the long war began, the war between the Medes and the Greeks, I served with the Athenians at Sardis. 
Why, you might ask, my Thugater will groan to hear me tell this again. But I loved Brisset's. Indeed, to say I loved her, Hipponax's dark-haired daughter, Artemis's avatar, and perhaps Aphrodite's as well, Helen returned to earth. Well, to say I loved her is to say nothing, as you will hear if you stay to listen. But Isais wasn't the only person I loved in Ephesus. I loved Archilogos, the true friend of my youth. We were well matched in everything. I was his companion, first as a slave, and then free. And we competed. That... Everything. And I also loved Heraclitus, the greatest philosopher of his day. To me, the greatest ever, almost like a god in his wisdom. He, and he alone, kept me from growing to manhood as a pure killer. He gave me advice which I ignored, but which stayed in my head. To this day, in fact, he taught me that the river of our lives flows on and on, and can never be reclaimed. Later I knew that he'd tried to keep me from Brisset's. When her father caught us together, it was the end of my youth. I was cast out of the household, and that's why I was with the Athenians at Sardis, and not in the phalanx of the men of Ephesus to save Hipponax when the Medes gave him his mortal wound. I found him screaming on the battlefield, and I sent him on the last journey because I loved him, even though he had been my owner. It was done with love, but his son, Archilogos, did not see it that way, and we became foes. I spent the next years of the Ionian Revolt, the first years of the Long War, gaining word fame with every blow I struck. I should blush to tell it, but why? When I served at Sardis, I was a man that other men would trust at their side in the phalanx. By the time I led my ship into the Persians at the big fight at Cyprus, I was a warrior that other men feared in the storm of bronze. The Greeks won the sea fight, but lost on land that day at Cyprus, and the back of the revolt should have been broken, but it was not. We retreated to Chios and Lesbos, and I joined Miltiadis of Athens, a great aristocrat and a great pirate, and we got new allies, and the fighting switched to the Cassonese, the land of the Trojan War. We fought the Medes by sea and land. Sometimes we bested them. Miltiades made money, and so did I. I owned my own ship, and I was rich. I killed many men. And then we faced the Medes in Thrace, just a few ships from each side. By then, Briseis had married the most powerful man in the Greek revolt and had found him a broken reed. We beat the Persians and their Thracian allies, and I killed her husband, even though he was supposedly on my side. I laugh even now. That was a good killing, and I spit on his shade. But she didn't want me, except in her bed and in her thoughts. Briseis loved me as I loved her, but she meant to be queen of the Ionians, not a pirate's troll. And all I was in those years was a bloody-handed pirate. Fair enough, but it shattered me for a while. I left Thrace and I left Miltiaris, and I went home to Plataea, where the man who had killed my father and married my mother was lording it over the family farm. Simon 
and his four sons. My cousins. Your cousins, too, Thugater. Simon was a wreck of a man and a coward, but I'd not say the name of his get. They were tough bastards. I didn't hack him down. I went to the assembly as my master, Heraclitus, would have wanted me to do. The law killed old Simon the coward. But his sons wanted revenge. And the Persians were determined to finish off the Ionians and put the Greeks under their heel. And Briseis kept marrying great men and finding them wanting. The world, as you know, is shaped like the bowl of an aspis. Out on the rim flows the edge of the river sea that circles all, and up where the porpax binds a man's arm is the sun and the moon, and the great circle of earth fills all between. Medes and Persians, Scythians and Greeks and Ionians and Aeolians and Italians and Ethiopians and Egyptians and Africans and Lydians and Phrygians and Carians and Celts and Phoenicians and the gods know who else fill the bowl of the Aspis from rim to rim. And in those days, as the long war began to take hold, like a new started fire on dry kindling, you could hear men talking of war, making war, killing, dying, making weapons and training in their use all across the bowl of that aspis, from rim to rim, until the murmur of that bronze-clad god's chorus filled the world. It was the sixth year of the long war, and Hipparchus was archon in Athens, and Miron was archon for his second term in Plataea. Thesicritis of Croton won the Stade Sprint at Olympia. The weather was good. The crops were rolling in. I thought I might settle down and make myself a bronze smith and a farmer, like my father before me. Ares must have laughed. Part One Lade The time will come, Milesians, devisers of evil deeds, when many will feast on you. A splendid gift for them. Your wives will wash the feet of many long-haired men and other men will assume the care of my temple at Didyma. Oracle of Apollo to the men of Miletus, in Herodotus, Book 6, Logos 19. Chapter 1 Shield up, thrust overhand, turn, catch the spear on the rim of my shield, pivot on my toes and thrust at my opponent, he catches my spear on his shield and grins. I can see the flash of his grin in the tau of his Corinthian helmet's faceplate. Then his plumes nod as he turns his head, checks the man behind him. I thrust overhand, hard. He catches my blow, pivots on the balls of his feet, and steps back with his shield facing me. His file mate pushes past him, a heavy, overhand blow driving me back half a step. The music rises, the aulos pipe sounding faster, the drums beating the rhythm like the sound of marching feet. I sidestep faster, and my shield rim flashes like a live thing. My black spear is an iron-tipped tongue of death in my strong right hand, and I am one with the men to the right and left, the men behind. I am not Arimnestos, the killer of men. I am only one Plataean, and together we are this. Plataeans! I roar. I plant my right foot. Every man in the front rank does the same, and the pipes howl, and every man crouches, screams, and pushes forward, and three hundred voices call the ravens of Apollo. 
The roar shakes the walls and echoes from the temple of Hera. The music falls silent, and after a pause, the whole assembly, all the free men and women, the slaves, the freedmen, erupt in applause. Under my armor, I am covered in sweat. Hermogenes, my opponent, puts his arms around me. That was... There are no words to describe how good that was. We danced the Pyrrhiki, the war dance, with the picked three hundred men of Plataea, and Ares himself must have watched us. Older men, the Archon, the lawmakers, clasp my hand. My back is slapped so often that I worry they're pulling the laces on my scale armor. Good to have you back, they all say. I am happy. Ting, 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 ting. The day after the Feast of Ares and I was back at work, planishing. Planishing is when you use a hammer to smooth out finished work. Tap, 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 tap. The hammers need to be polished and the anvil needs to be crisp and well surfaced. And you need a stake of just the right shape with a polished surface. And your strokes need to be perfectly placed, crisp, and all the same strength. It was not my strong point. I remember it well because I was making myself a new helmet and thinking of Miltiades. All my other orders were completed. Winter was coming and there was no reason that I shouldn't play with my equipment. My barns were full, my people fed, and I had a sack of silver buried under the shop floor without having to send to Miltiades for my gold. I had decided I would not go back to Miltiades. Miltiades of Athens, the tyrant of the Chersonese, was my father's patron, and sometimes mine. I'd fought and killed for him, but I'd left him when the killing became a habit I had to break, and when Briseis said she would not have me. Ha! Ah. One of those is the true reason. But Athens, mighty Athens, the bulwark of the Hellenes against the Persians, was deeply divided. Miltiades was no hero back then. Most Athenians saw him as a fool and a tyrant who was bringing the wrath of the great king of Persia down on Greece. Rumor came over the mountains from Attica and Athens that he was to be declared Athimos, and lose his citizen rights, that he would be exiled, that he would be murdered. We heard that the faction of the tyrant slayers, the Alcmionids, was ascendant. I have to tell you, as an aside, that calling the Alcmionids tyrant slayers is both incorrect and laughable, but a fine example of how easily fooled mortal men are by good orators the mighty Alcmionids, the richest family in Attica and perhaps all of Greece. One of their many scions killed one of Pisistratus' sons in Athens. It was a private quarrel, but we still call the overhand sword cut the Harmodius blow, and most men think that the dead man was the tyrant of Athens. In fact, the only reason that the Alcmionids would have arranged the death of the Pisistratids was so that they could seize the city and rule themselves. They were all in the game, all the great men of Athens. They prated about democracy, but what they wanted was power. In the early days of the long war, I was bitter, disillusioned even, to find that the heroic Miltiades was a pirate and a thief, not a freedom fighter. Oh, he was brave as Achilles and wily as Odysseus, but beneath his aristocratic manners lurked a man who would kill a beggar for an obol if it would finance his schemes. After a while I took to hating him for his failure to be the man I wanted him to be. But I'll tell you this, my children, he was a better man than any of the Pisistratids or the Alcmionids. When he wanted something, he reached 
for it. At any rate, it was late summer, and the rumours of open conflict in Athens, our ally, had begun to disturb the even sleepy Plataea. As the saying went, when Athens caught a cold, Plataea sneezed. I recall all this because I was thinking of Miltiades while I was working on my helmet. I thought about him a lot, because, to tell the truth, I was already bored. I'd shaped the helmet twice. First I'd made the bowl far too deep, and the result looked so odd that I'd melted the bronze, added a little more tin, and poured a new plate on the slate where Pater had done the same. I made a wine bucket from that bronze. I didn't trust twice-forged stuff for armour. The second time I was more careful with my prayers, and I made a real invocation to Hephaestus, and I took time to draw the curve in charcoal on a board as part of the invocation. I raised the bowl of the helmet carefully for an hour or two each day, after propping the vines and gathering olives with my slaves and my household, and this helmet grew like a child in a mother's belly, like a miracle. So on that day I remember I was growing afraid. I, who feared no man in the meeting of the spears, was afraid, because the object I was making was beautiful and better than I ever expected of my own work, and I was scared that I might ruin it. So I planished, slowly, ting, 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 ting. The anvil rang like a temple bell with every blow. My apprentice, Tyreus, held the work and rotated it as I requested. He was older than me and in some ways better trained, but he'd never settled with one master, and before he met me he'd never even learned the signs that any man can learn who dedicates to the smith god. I'd had him a month, and he'd changed, just like that, like molten metal settling into the mould. He'd been ready to take a new shape, and he was no work of mine, but it still felt odd to have an older man, and in many ways a better smith as my apprentice. He raised his head as if listening. Ting, 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 like a temple bell. My anvil called aloud to the gods. I was deep into it, the focus that the gods send to a man intent on a task, when I heard what Tyreus heard. The same focus, to be honest, that comes in combat. How Aristides would writhe to hear me suggest a link between the two. I ramble. I heard a horse in the yard. Don't stop, my apprentice ordered. That'll give you an idea of his actual status. He gave me orders. Behind me, Beon, my father's former slave apprentice, and now almost a master smith in his own right, was re-welding a pot. His hammer rang on his own anvil. Heavier blows than mine. What the man says, Beon grunted. Never stop once you're in a task. That was a long speech for Beyond. But I was young, and a horse in the yard promised adventure. As I said, months of farming and smithing had left me bored. I took water from the bucket by the door, and saw a young man in a fine wool clamis slip off his horse's neck, showing a lot of leg and muscle, as pretty young men are wont to do. "'I have a message for Lord Arimnestos,' he said portentously. His disappointment showed in every line of his body. He'd expected better. Pen, my sister Penelope, came down the steps from her eyrie with the women, and Hermogenes, Beyond's son and my best friend, came in from the fields. 
both drawn by the horseman. I let Penn have the boy. He was handsome, and Penn needed some suitors, or my life was going to become very difficult indeed. My mother stayed in the women's porch and didn't emerge, probably because she was drunk. Hades, for a certainty she was drunk. She was the only child of the Basilius of Hispe, a small place west of Plataea. She ran off with my pater, a smith but a powerful man in his own right. She thought he'd become a great man. He did, but not in the way she wanted. He became a great smith. She became a drunk. Did I say this was a pretty story? Back to it, then. The handsome boy with all the muscles paid me no attention at all. I had a rag wrapped around my groin and was otherwise naked. I was covered in soot and looked like a slave, and he'd have had to be a careful observer, not something usually found in handsome boys, to note that I had the muscles of an athlete, not a farrier. I'm Lord Arimnestos's sister, Penelope, she told the young Sprig. My brother is busy. May I take your message, sir? That flustered young Paris, I can tell you. My message is for the Lord himself. He looked around for a social equal, someone to punish all these slaves and women. I laughed and left Penn to the enjoyment of his discomfiture. My helmet was calling me. I drank another dipper of water and got my hammer back in my hand. A ting, ting, a ting. I realized that there was a boy in my workshop. Where in Hades had he come from? He was Stygis, the dark boy from the hero's tomb. No one was clear whether he'd been a prisoner or a bandit. He'd become part of Idomeneus's retinue. I think he'd been a thief. He was silent as the grave. So much to explain. Idomineus was Cretan, a soldier and archer who had been my hippaspist, my squire in the fighting for years. When I cleared out my father's house, Idomineus made himself priest of the hero's tomb. I had trained at that tomb as a boy, and it was my place my sacred place. And Idomineus, for all his madness and his delight in killing, and his debauchery, was my friend, and a member of my oikia, my household, my own retinue of trusted men and women. Stygis was in Idomineus's oikia. He was the Cretan's lover, his eromenos, and his hippaspist, too, as they do things in Crete. My master needs you, Lord, the young man whispered, his eyes downcast. My hand hesitated, the head of the iron hammer high in the air. I let it fall, tang, and cursed, a clear misstroke, and I'd left a small flaw in the surface of the helmet. Tyreus put his hand to my mouth. Curses won't change the metal, he said. See, he had ten more years than I had. In many ways I was an overgrown boy with a talent for ripping men's souls from their bodies. He was a mature man, a man who'd seen enough hardship to learn to make better choices. Fuck, I said. But I didn't throw the helmet across the shop. I'd learned that much. Nor did I gut Stygis with the heavy knife I always wore, even in the shop, or lying with a slave girl, although the red rage flashed over my eyes. Instead, I placed it on a leather bag, washed my hands in the basin, and nodded to Stygis. I need a cup of wine, and I'll be happy to give you one as well. I did my best to imitate Achilles, and be a man of warm hospitality. 
even to a catamite thief who'd just caused me to miss a hammer stroke. I was growing up. Mestiges bowed. I'm honoured, Lord. Of course, in Crete, men who were called Lord were seldom covered in soot and bronze scale, with hands so black that the skin couldn't be seen. But in Boeotia, things were different. Besides, I had a great deal more respect for Stygis than for the perfumed boy in my courtyard. My sister, Penelope, came out of the house with wine. She poured a libation to Artemis, as was right for her, and then to Hephaestus, for me, before serving the rest of the pitcher of wine to Tyreus, Bion, Hermogenes, Stygis, and my guest. Of the crowd, only the guest and pen could be said to be wearing clothes. I just want you to see this in your heads. Only when Stygis had a cup of wine in his fist did I question him. Why does Idomeneus need me? I asked. He killed a man, Stygis replied. What man? I asked. A Plataean? by which I meant a citizen or a man of no account. No, Lord, Stygis said. In fact, we killed two men, one a soldier at the shrine, the other, and Stygis smiled. I killed myself, one of the bandits, Lord. They knew each other, were planning to escape or perhaps take the shrine. Lord Idomeneus thinks they meant to kill all of us. He had a fresh cut, I realized, running from his shoulder to the middle of his side. He saw me looking at it and nodded, beaming with pride. He had a knife, and I did not. This sort of heroic understatement was the rule of the Greeks, and Idomeneus, for all his blood madness, ran a tight ship up there on the mountain. The soldier we killed was Athenian, Stygis said, his smile fading. My master is afraid that he was a man of consequence. That got my attention. My lord, is it nothing to you that I have travelled here from Sardis? The beautiful young man asked. In truth, they were both quite handsome. The aristocrat, like a statue of an athlete, and Stygis a more practical, down-to-earth set of muscles, scars, and smooth skin. I could tell that Penn was pleased by both. I smiled at the aristocrat. Young man, I apologize for my rude dress and quick welcome, and I ask that you stay a day or two. This matter concerns my honor, and must be dealt with immediately. He blushed. I hid a smile, and his eyes flickered to pens. I would be honored to be a guest here, but I have an important message, which I'll hear when I return. I nodded to him. The gods were blinding me, if I had paused a moment to listen to him. But I thought my duty was calling me, and I didn't like him or his heirs. Mind that they don't put you to work in the forge, Penn muttered. I'll be back by midday, I said, and ordered the slaves to bridle my horse. The gods were laughing, and Moira spun her thread so fine. It was the edge of darkness by the time I rode up the hill to the shrine. It may seem comic to you lot to hear that I rode a horse, now I'm lord of a thousand shaggy Thracian ponies and half a hundred Persian beauties. But in Boeotia, in those days, the ownership of a horse was a matter for some remark, and I had four. Laugh if you like, four horses made me one of the richest men in Plataea. Stygis ran by my side. He'd fought a mortal combat, run thirty stardies to fetch me, drunk a horn of wine, and now he'd run thirty stardies back to the shrine. 
Later, when I tell you of the deeds of arms my people performed, think on this. We made hard men then. We bred them to it, like dogs to the hunt. In Sparta they trained aristocrats to be superb. In Attica and Boeotia we trained every free man to be excellent. Calculate the difference, if you like. I could smell the blood at the tomb, even over the night air. I took the leather bottle off my shoulder and poured a libation to old Lathos, who had gone to windy Troy from Green Plataea, and come back alive to die in old age. Now that, my friends, is a hero. At the tomb we have a tradition, that it was Lathos who stopped bold Hector's rush at the ships, not by clever fighting or mad courage, but by getting lesser men to lock their shields and stop his God-sent killing rage. Not a mighty killer, but a man who led other men as a shepherd tends sheep, who kept his men alive and brought them home. So men come to the tomb from all over Greece, men who have seen too much war. Sometimes they are broken past repair, but if they are not, the priest feeds them wine, listens to them and gives them work, or perhaps a small mission, and the completion of that work makes them clean, so that they can go back to the world of men who are not killers. Sometimes, though, a man comes to the tomb with the mark on him. How can I tell this? It is the mark of evil, or of a soul past saving. And then the priest, who is always a retired killer himself, must face the man and kill him on the precinct wall so that his shade screams as it goes down to nothing, lost forever, and his blood waters the souls of the dead and feeds the hero. Ha, <laughs> ha! is a tough place, and no mistake. And we've little tolerance for those men who've lost their way. Can I tell you a hard truth, friends? If a killer goes bad, the best the rest can do is put him down. Wolves know it, dogs know it, and lions know it. Men need to know it, too, even when the man is your friend. But that's another story. More wine here. Idomeneus came out and held my horse as I slid down. Sorry to call you all the way here, Lord. The dent in my perfect helmet still rankled, and I couldn't get the thought of a messenger from Sardis out of my head. Sardis, the capital of Lydia, the satrapy of the Persian Empire closest to Greece. Who would send a messenger from Sardis? And why, in the name of all the gods, hadn't I stopped to ask? But Idomeneus was a man who'd saved my life fifty times. Hard to stay angry with him. I needed to come out anyway. If I stay at the forge too long, I might forget who I used to be. Used to be? Idomeneus laughed his mad laugh. Achilles reborn, now hammering bronze... So, you killed a man, I asked. One of the women pressed a horn cup into my hand. Watered, spiced wine, just warmed. I drank thankfully. We just killed us an Alcmeonid, Idomeneus said. His eyes glinted in the last light. He stood there on the precinct wall and proclaimed his parentage and dared us even to think of killing him. He thought that big name would protect him. I shook my head. The Alcmeonids were rich, powerful, and nasty. Their wealth was boundless, and I couldn't imagine what one of them was doing at the tomb of the hero. Perhaps he was lying, I asked. Idomeneus produced something from under his clammies. It flashed red gold in the last beams of the sun. It was a clasp belt, 
the sort of thing a very rich man wore with his chiton, and every link was beaten gold. It was worth more than my farm, and I have a good farm. Fuck, I said. He had the mark of evil, Idomeneus said. What could I do? I went and looked at the corpse, stretched over the precinct wall in the traditional way. He had been a big man, a head taller than me, with a bell cuirass of bronze as thick as a new flayed hide. He probably weighed twice as much as wiry Idomeneus. He had a single wound, a spear thrust in his left eye. Idomeneus was a very, very dangerous man. The Athenian nobleman must have been too stupid to see that. For the mark truly was on him, and the hero needed blood. His armour was of the best, as was his helmet. Fuck, I said again. What was he doing here? Idomeneus shook his head. Behind him, men and women were lighting the lamps. There were six huts now, instead of just one, as there had been in my youth. My Thracians had one, and former bandits were four to a hut in the others, except the last, which was for the women. They were clean and orderly. Dead deer hung in rows from the trees, and there was a whole boar, and piles of salted skins rolled tight. Idomeneus ran the tomb like a military camp. He was recruiting, I said aloud, answering my own question. Perhaps the grey-eyed goddess stood at my shoulder and said the words into my head, but I saw it. He was in his best armour because he wanted to impress, but he'd challenged Idomeneus somehow, and the mad fuck had killed him. These things happen. My problem, I thought, was how to clean it up. They were all in my Oikia, so I bore the responsibility, and it was my place to put it right. Besides, I knew most of the big men in Athens. I knew Aristides, and he was related to the Alcmeonids by marriage and by blood. I was sure he could make it right, if anyone could. I considered the alternative. I could do nothing. It was possible that no one knew where this man was or what he had intended. It was possible that even if his people found out, they would take no revenge. In the morning I'll cast an augury, I said. Perhaps the Logos will offer me an answer. Idomeneus nodded. You'll stay the night, he asked. Just as you wanted, you mad Cretan, I said. You need to get away from the farm before you turn into a farmer, he said. I had the glimmer of a suspicion that my mad hippaspist had killed a powerful man merely to get me to come up the hill and drink with him. I sighed. Stygis put a warm cup in my hand and led me to the fire circle, where all the former bandits sat. We sang hymns to the gods while a bowl of the heavens turned over our heads. The firelight dappled the ancient oaks around the hero's tomb. Stygis took out a kithara and sang alone, and then we sang with him Spartan songs and aristocratic songs. And I sang Briseis's favourite, one of Sappho's. My eyes kept meeting those of a slave girl. They weren't precisely slaves. Their status was not simple. They'd belonged to a farmer, a widow, and the bandits had killed her and taken her chattels. Then I'd killed the bandits. Whose were they? Were they free? They slept with all the men and did too many chores. She was short, almost pretty, and one of her legs was twisted. Our eyes kept meeting, and later she laughed aloud while I was inside her. Her breath was sweet, 
and she deserved better than a hero who thought only of another woman. But despite her limp and her odd face, she stuck in my head. In those days I must have mounted fifty slave girls a year. Yet I remember her. You'll see why. In the morning I hunted on the mountain with Idomeneus, but if he'd left any deer alive within half a day's walk, I didn't see them. But we did cross the trail, where we'd ambushed the bandits a year before. The road goes as high as it ever does on Kitharon's flank, then drops down into a mud hole, after which it climbs a little before starting the long descent, first to the tomb, and then to Platea herself. There was a cart abandoned by the mud hole, and tracks. The cart was loaded with weapons and leather armor, good, strong stuff, and there were a few coins scattered on the ground. He had servants, I said. And they ran, Idomeneus said. No need to cast an augury, is there? The abandoned wagon meant that the rich man had had attendants, men who even now were running back to the family estates in Attica with a tale of murder. We could chase them down and kill them, Idomeneus said, helpfully. Sometimes you really piss me off, I said, and I meant it. I feel bad, he admitted. What are you going to do? I'll ride into Attica and make it right, I said. Send to the farm, get Epictetus to fill a wagon with my work and have it head for Athens. I'll meet the wagon in the Agora in Athens in ten days, before the Heraklion, and my whole trip won't be wasted fixing your fuck-up. Idomeneus nodded sullenly. He had the mark on him. He said, like a child who feels a parent's law is unfair. The hero wanted his blood. I believe you, I said, and I looked at him. He met my eye, but only just. You can't come, I said. Not unless you want to die, I added. He shrugged. My entertainment of the night before was standing a little apart. I palmed a coin to give her, but she shook her head and looked modestly at the ground. I want to go, she said. I can be a free woman in Attica. I'll warm your bed on the trail. I considered it for a while. Yes, I said. The other two women cried to see her go. I'd have done better if I'd stopped to cast the auguries, but who knows? The gods like a surprise. We made good time up Kitharon's flank, up where the oak trees falter. I killed a young boar with my bow. From there and with that as an omen, I took the old road and we climbed all the way to the top of the ancient mountain and made camp in the wood of the Daidala, the special place of all the Corvaxi, where the crows feast on meat we provide for the god. I made a good camp with a wool sheet as a tent and a big fire. Then I left the slave girl to cook meat from the hero's tomb and I climbed up to the altar. In our family, we say that the altar is to Kitheron himself and not to Zeus, who is, after all, an interloper here. There was a sign on the altar, the remnants of a burnt offering and a hank of black wool. So, Simon's sons lived, and they had come here in the dark of the moon to curse someone. Not hard to guess who. I smiled. I remember that smile. A wolf's snarl. Hate comes easily when you are young. 
It was a clear night, and I could see out to the rim of the world, and everywhere I looked I could see fire. And I thought, war is coming. The thought came from the god, and his eyes helped mine to see the girdle of fire all around the world, standing there on the summit of the mountain. I heaped brush on top of the pile of ash on the old altar, and I rolled the boar's hide, hooves and bones around the fat, then lit the fire. That fire must have been visible to every man and woman from Thebes to Athens. I set the boar to burning and made my prayers. I fed the fire until it was so great that I couldn't stand near it naked, and then I went back down to where the slave girl waited. She served me food. Will you free me? She asked. Or sell me? I laughed. I'll free you, I said. With that twisted foot, you're not worth selling, honey. Besides, I keep my word, do I not? She didn't laugh. I wouldn't know. She stuck out her bad foot and stared at it. Your barley broth is delicious, I said. And it was. That's all the flirtation a slave gets. I was a slave, honey. I know what it's like. And I know that all my talk isn't worth shit until you have your freedom tablet in your hand. But I give you my word, by the high altar of my ancestors, that I will free you in the Agora of Athens and leave you twenty drachmas as dowry. Every god in Olympus must have been listening. A man needs to be careful when he swears and careful what he promises. The sons of men lie, she said, her voice hollow, so that just for a moment I wondered what goddess was sharing my campfire. Will you be different? Try me, I said with a young man's arrogance. I moved towards her, and as I put a hand behind her head, the ravens came, a great flock and they alighted in the trees around my fire, the same trees where the Corvaxi feed them, of course. And they knew me. I had never seen so many. The fire reflected their eyes, a thousand points of fire. And when I put my mouth over hers, her eyes glowed red in the fire, too. We made love anyway. Ah! Youth. We were five days crossing Kitharon, at least in part because I became infatuated with her. Sometimes one body just fits another. Hard to describe to you, virgins. Suffice it to say that despite her twisted foot and odd face, my body adored hers in a way I have seldom experienced. I wanted her every minute, and the wanting was not slaked by the having, as it is so often with men, especially young men. After we had made love on a rock by the trail, where you can first see the rich blue of the sea over Attica, she rose from my best efforts, smiled and threw her chiton over her shoulder and strolled on naked by my horse. Don't you want to get dressed? I asked her. She smiled and shrugged. Why? It'll only come off again before the sun goes down a finger's breadth. And she was right. I could not have enough of her. She wouldn't tell me her name, and sometimes I called her Brisseis. That got a bitter laugh and a hard bite. I begged her and tickled her and offered her money, but she said that telling her true name would break the spell. So I called her Slave Girl, and she resented it. After the slowest trip over the mountain in the history of the Greeks, 
We came down by the fort at Oinoe, where my brother had died. I poured wine to his shade, and we rode on, the horse useful now. We didn't camp in Attica. I was a man of property, and we stayed in inns, or I claimed guest status from men who I knew a little, like Eumenios of Eleusis, who was happy to see me, toasted me in good wine, and warned me that he'd heard that the Alcmeonids were out for my blood. I sneered. They don't even know who I am, I said. I'm just some hick from Beothia. Eumenios shook his head. No, you're a warrior, and a friend of Miltiades and Aristides. It is said in the city that you can lead three hundred picked men of Plataea over the mountain whenever Miltiades snaps his fingers. I shook my head and drank my wine. Who the fuck would say that? Miron is the archon, Hades' brother. In Plataea we care very little for who lords it in Athens, as long as the grain prices are good. But then I thought of the black wool on Kitheron's altar. Simon's sons would spread that story if it would help them to revenge. In the morning, Eumenios pretended he'd missed a night's sleep because of my antics with my slave girl. He saw me mounted, poured a libation, and sent me on my way. But before I'd turned my mare's head out of his gate, he caught my ankle. Go carefully he said. They'll kill you if they can, or bring you to law. Nine days on the road, and we came to Athens. My daughter and young Herodotus have both been to Athens, but I'll tell you about the queen of Greek cities anyway. Athens is not like any other city in the world, and I've been everywhere, from the gates of Heracles to the mountains of the moon. Most men come to Athens from the sea. We came down from the mountains to the west, but the effect is the same. The first thing you see is the Acropolis. It was different then. Now they have new temples a building, fantastic stuff in white marble to rival anything in the east. But it was impressive enough in my day with the big stone buildings that the Pisistratids, the tyrants, had put up. New temples and new government buildings and power in every stone. Athens was rich. Other cities in Greece were stronger, or thought they were stronger, Thebes and Sparta and Corinth. But any man with his wits about him knew that Athens was the queen of cities. Her Acropolis had held the palace of Theseus, and men from that palace went to the war in Troy. She was old and wise and strong and rich. More people lived within the precincts of Athens than in the whole of Boeotia, or so men said. The city was bigger than Sardis, and had almost twelve thousand citizens of military age. Athens had bronze smiths and potters, the best in the world, and farmers and fishermen and sailors and oarsmen and perfumers and tanneries and weavers and swordsmiths and lamp-makers and men who dyed fabric and men who whitened leather and men who did nothing but plait hair, or teach young men to fight. Moreover, they had women who did most of these things. The world was turned on its head in Athens, and in my time I've met women who played instruments, women who coached athletes, women who wove and women who painted pots, even a woman philosopher. It was the city. The city. They're a greedy, rapacious, foxy lot, the Athenians. They lie, steal, and covet other men's possessions. And they argue about everything. 
I've always liked them. I'd never been to Aristides house, but he was a famous man even then. So it was easy enough to ask directions. But I had to turn down a dozen offers on my slave girl. The truth is, she shone with some power, and no man who saw her cared an obol about her limp. And for some reason, men fancied me, too, and even offered for my horse and my blanket and my sword and anything else visible. We should have passed around the shoulder of the Areopagus and walked on down the hills to the cool countryside on the east side of the city. Instead, I paused for a cup of cheap wine. What I really wanted was to walk down the street of the bronze smiths. So I left my horse with slave girl and headed to the Agora. Now there's a fancy new temple for Hephaestus. Back then it was a much smaller affair, with tiny cramped streets all over the low hill, and a small shrine to Athena and Hephaestus at the top, just one priest and no priestess. But I went, made a small sacrifice, and left the meat for the poor, as befitted a foreigner. And then I walked down into the smith's quarter, I'd have done better to take the Beothian dog cap off my head, but I didn't. I gave the sign to the priest, of course, and he passed me the sign for Attica, so that other smiths would treat me as a guest. Then I worked my way down the hill, looking at their shops, admiring their bellows or their tools, or their hordes of apprentices. I finally stopped where an ironsmith was roughing out spear points. Beautiful things. Long as my forearm, with light sockets and heavy ribs, for punching straight through armor. You look like a lad who can use one of these, the smith said. For a dirt-eating Theban, I mean, he added. I spat. I'm a dirt-eating Plataean, I said. Fuck Thebes. Fuck your mother, he said with pleasure. No offence meant stranger. Any Plataean is welcome here. Were you in the three battles? Every one, I answered. Base, the master called. And when one of his boys came, he said, Get this hero a cup of cayenne. You? I asked politely. Oh, I stood my ground once or twice that week, he said. He extended his hand, and we shook, and I passed the sign. You're a smith, he said. Need a place to stay? That's how it was back then. Sad to see those old ways go. Hospitality was like a god to us, to all Greeks. I started to explain that I was on my way to see Aristides, when a well-dressed man leading a horse leaned into the stall. Did I just hear you say you were a Plataean? He asked. I didn't know him from Oedipus, but I was courteous. I have that honor. I am Arimnestos of the Corvaxi of Plataea. The man bowed. You've just saved me quite a journey, then, he said. I'm Clethus, of the Alcmeonids of Attica, and you are under arrest for murder. Chapter 2 The law of Athens is a complex, dangerous monster, and no foreigner like myself could possibly master it. I stood there with my mouth agape like a fool, and the smith came to my rescue. Says who? He asked. I haven't missed an assembly since the Feast of Dionysus, and no one has voted a capital charge. The Alcmeonid shrugged. You don't look like the kind of fellow to vote on the hill, he said casually. What he meant was that ironsmiths didn't get invited to join the Areopagitica, the Council of Elders, mostly old aristocrats who ran the murder trials. I think my smith 
might have let it go, except that this Cletus was such an arrogant sod that he gave offence by breathing. I don't have to be a sodding aristo to know the law, the smith said. Where'd the charge come from? None of your business, Cletus said. He reached for my clamis. Best come along, boy. Some men claim that the gods play no role in human affairs. Such statements always make me laugh. Cletus and I have crossed wits and swords often enough. He's as wily as Odysseus and as strong as Heracles. But on that day he couldn't spare the time to calm the ruffled plumage of an ironsmith. What might have happened if he had? The smith stepped around the counter of his shop with a speed that belied his bulk. Where's your wand, then? he asked. Cletus shrugged. With my men in the Agora. Best go and get it, rich boy, the smith said. Hey, sons of Hephaestus, he called. Down your tools and come. Cletus rallied his wits instantly. Now, Master Smith, no need for that. I'll get my wand. But this man is a killer. A killer of Athens' enemies. I said, a good shot, and it went right into the bull's eye. Not an unlawful killer. By then, there were fifty apprentices looking for a fight, and a dozen smiths, and every hand held a hammer. Cletus looked around. I'll be back with my men, he said. Bring your staff of warrant and don't bother, my new friend the smith called. Then he turned to me. Tell me a tale and make it swift. Men are missing work. So I told him. I left nothing out, not even the dimple I'd left in my helmet. He sent an apprentice for Aristides. I sat on a folding stool that was provided for me, fine ironwork and very elegant, and began to breathe more easily. And then I heard the screams. There were a fair number of screams in Athens, high-pitched, often in fun, sometimes in earnest. But by the third scream I realized that this was my slave girl. I rose to my feet. My smith looked at me. Where are you going? He asked. That's my slave. I said. He shook his head. I've pledged my people to this, he said. You aren't going anywhere. I've made her an oath to free her. I said. Send a boy. Send a pair of men with hammers, please. I ask you. He spat orders at a couple of shop boys, big ones, and they hurried out of the door. Arimnestos, eh? He asked. I've heard of you. Killer of men, right enough. Thought you'd be bigger. I tried to sit still. The screams had stopped. The time passed. More time passed. Finally, the boys came back. Cletus has left the market, the bigger of the two said. He's got your horse and your girl. He talked a lot of crap about what you took from his brother. Did you kill his brother, mister? I shook my head. No, I said, and I felt tired. Did I say I loved Athens? Athens makes me tired. They have a great many rules. Can he really take these things from me? I asked the smith. He shrugged. Alcmeonids do what they like, he said. Most commoners won't even try to stand against them. He grinned. Lucky you're a smith. He's no smith, said a voice behind my chair. And there was Athens's leading pillar of justice, the greatest prig ever to lead warriors in the field, a man so driven by fairness that he had no space left for ambition. I embraced him anyway, because I loved him, despite the fact we had nothing in common. It was Aristides. He was still tall, lanky, graceful, like a man who's had the best training the drachma can buy all his life. 
I gather you've turned to crime, he said. I like to think it was a rare show of humor and not a statement of fact. Not true, my lord. This scion of the Alcmeonids was killed by a man in my service, at a shrine for impiety. I've given orders for his body and his armor to be brought here and all his possessions that weren't looted by his own servants. They will be here in a matter of days. I shrugged. I'm a man of property, not a freebooter, my lord. Aristides nodded solemnly. I'm pleased to hear it. He's a smith, right enough, the ironsmith said. He knows the signs. Aristides looked at me under his bushy eyebrows. Always oh, more to you than meets the eye, young man. So you are a smith. Young man, he called me. He was less than ten years my senior, but he had the dignity of an old man. A bronze smith, I said. And a farmer now. My property brought me three hundred medimnoi this autumn. Aristides laughed. I never expected you to rise to the Hippes class, he said. I'm not sure that I still qualify. I returned. The Alcmeonids just stole my best horse and my slave girl. Aristides' smile was wiped off his face. Really? Smiths and apprentices pressed around him, each telling his own version of the story. Come to my house, Aristides said. I'll send to the council and announce that I have you in my custody and that I'll represent you at the trial. Then everything will be legal. What about my horse? I asked. And my girl? He didn't answer. I shook hands with every smith who had aided me, thanked them all and walked off into the evening with Aristides and a dozen young men he had about him, all armed with heavy staves, I noticed. When we were clear of the industrial quarter, Aristides wrinkled his nose. I've seen you in the Storm of Bronze, Platean. You're a man of worth. How do you stand the stink of all that commerce? He didn't slacken his step and he was a tall man. I shrugged. Money smells the same, whether earned at the point of the spear or in the sweat of a shop. I said. Aristides shook his head. But without virtue, without glory. You're arguing with the wrong man, I answered. My master taught me that War is the king and master of all. Some men it makes lords, and others it makes slaves. I laughed, and then my laughter stopped. What's happening here? Your lads are all armed, and these Alcmeonids were out for my blood. Later, he said, we walked around the steep hill, its rock worn smooth from hundreds of men climbing to the top where criminal trials were held and then past the slums on the east side and back up a big road, the road to the Temple of Poseidon at Sunion. The moon was up by the time we came to a big gate. My farm, Aristides said with pride. I don't sleep in the city anymore. I expect I'll be exiled soon, if not killed. He said it with the flat certainty you hear from a veteran on the night before he takes his death blow. You? Exiled? I shook my head. Five years ago you were the golden boy of Athens. I still am, he said. Men think I seek to be a tyrant when in fact I seek only to provide justice, even to your friends, the Smiths. There are noble men, men of worth, even in the forges and the potter's shops. I insisted. Of course, democracy wouldn't function if there were not. But they keep trying to insist on increased political rights, when any thinking man knows that only a man of property can control a city. We're the only ones with the training. That Smith could no more vote on the Areopagitica than I could dish a helmet. Aristides shed his clamis and chiton, and I noted he was still in top fighting trim. As we talked, slaves attended us, 
I was stripped, oiled, and dressed in a better garment than I'd worn since my last bout of piracy, all while listening to Aristides. Helmets are raised, not dished, I said. Just my point, he said. I shook my head. Allow me to disagree with my host, I said. He smiled politely. Perhaps it is that the perfection of any trade, war, sculpture, poetry, ironsmithing, even tanning or shoemaking, provides a man with the tools of mind to allow a mature man to take an active part in politics, I said. He rubbed his chin. Well put, and not an argument I'd heard put in exactly that way before. But you're not proposing that all men are equal. I sneered. I've stood in the haze of Ares too often to think that, my lord. He nodded. Just so. But an equality of excellence. I must say that I admire the notion. But that equates politics and war, which are noble pursuits, with ironwork and trade, which are not. I took wine from a woman who had to be his wife. I bowed deeply, and she smiled. Arguing with my husband, she said, a waste of breath, unless it's about the running of this house, and then he loses all interest. You are Aramnestos of Plataea. She had gold pins in her chiton, and her hair was piled on her head like a mountain. She was not beautiful, but her face radiated intelligence. Athena might have looked so if she were to dress as a matron. I am he, Despoina. I bowed again. Somehow from my husband's stories, I thought you might be bigger. On the other hand, you're as beautiful as a god, which he somehow forgot to mention. Every slave girl in the house will be at your door. I'll just go and lock them away, lest we have a plague of the nine months' sickness in my house, eh? She smiled. Women are not allowed in the assembly, Aristides said, because if they were, we'd be left with nothing to do but move heavy objects. This is my dear wife, Jocasta. She twirled her keys on her girdle and stepped out of the room. Tell me your notion, then, Aristides said. You speak well, and men seldom face me in debate. I shrugged. I'm as outmatched as a boy with a stave would be against me in the phalanx, Lord. But as you are so polite as to hear me out, you assume that war and politics are noble. You assume that they are ends to themselves. But you cannot make war without spears and we have no spears without ironsmiths. My point exactly. The ironsmith is less noble than the warrior because his craft is subordinate. Aristides smiled as he made his point. His kill shot, he thought. But, my lord, if you will accept my expertise, I said carefully because I did not want to anger him. War is a terrible end unto itself. I've made more war than you, although I'm younger. War is a terrible thing. But without it we could not be free, Aristides said. Ah, so freedom is the higher goal. I smiled. Aristides frowned, and then he grinned. By the gods, he said. If all smiths were like you, I'd replace the Council of Elders with smiths tonight. I shrugged, and then met his grin. Remember, Lord, I was the pupil of Heraclitus. He nodded. Yes, in truth, you are an aristocrat, as you were educated as one. While being a slave, I added, and drank my wine. But Aristides did not laugh. This is no matter for light talk, he said. Athens is an experiment. An experiment that may mean life or death to her. We're attempting to push responsibility for the city down 
as far down as we feel that free men have the power to think and vote. The further down we push these rights, the more fools we must tolerate. And the more shields you have in the phalanx, I said. And the harder it is for the Pisistratids or the Alcmeonids to restore the tyranny. He countered. Is that what this is about? I asked. The tyranny of Athens, again. I'd had four summers of listening to Miltiades plot to take the city. Frankly, I couldn't imagine why any of them wanted it. Aristides nodded. He sat down. The Medes are coming, he said. That was news, and no mistake. I sat on a couch. When? I have no idea, but the city is arming and preparing. You know we are at war with Aegina, he asked. I shrugged. Athens and Aegina and Corinth ruled the waves, so of course they were not friends. It's not much of a war, but we're using it as an excuse to arm. The great king is coming. He's appointed a satrap of Thrace, of Thrace by the gods, on our very doorstep. Datis is his name, or so we're told. We're to be the target as soon as Miletus falls. I started. Miletus falls? I asked. Every man in Athens, every political man. Aristides corrected himself, ignoring my interest in Miletus. He is gathering a retinue. Many, I name no names, have pledged themselves to the great king. He shrugged. Both factions are gathering warriors, citizens and non-citizens. I put my wine cup down and laughed aloud. You are allied with Miltiades. Well might you laugh. Aristides grumbled. He would be tyrant here if he could. Only men like me stand between him and power. But he can't abide the Persians, and he's in the field fighting while we sit here. Piracy for its own profit, you mean? I said. I served with him for four years, my lord. And I might serve him again, but it is not the greater good of Athens that drives Miltiades to battle. More likely it's his attacks on the great king's shipping that have brought the Medes down on Athens. Politics. Aristides said, ignoring me again. He held up his cup to a slave for a refill, and I was annoyed that his slave got a glance and a smile, whereas I was merely a sounding board. Doubtless some busy plotter among the Alcmeonids thought to hire your men for their side and leave you powerless, thinking that otherwise your men would serve me or Miltiades. I snorted with disgust. I was at home in Boeotia tilling my fields. I said... Please do not take it ill, my lord, but I care very little who's lording it in mighty Athens, so long as my bills are paid and my barns are full. You disappoint me, Aristides said. I shrugged. You've seen a couple of handsome boys wrestling by a public fountain? Aristides nodded. Because there are young girls around the fountain? I went on. He laughed. Yes, every day. Ever notice that the girls don't even glance at the boys because such posturing bores them silly, eh? Now we were laughing together. Of course, you have the right of it, my well-spoken friend. Aristides glanced away at Jocasta, and they shared such a smile. It was a pleasure to see them together. Well then, we Plataeans are the girls by the fountain, Come back and talk to us when you've learned to listen and to play tricks that please us. Until then, you and Miltiades and all these Pisistratids and Alcmeonids are just boys wrestling by the fountain. I chuckled. Who made you so wise? He asked. I laughed. A generation of girls at fountains in Ephesus. I said. Now, how do I get my horse and my slave girl back? Aristides shook his head. Ask after the trial, he said. I coughed. Trial? My trial? When is that? I thought you'd fixed that for me. He shook his head. 
The law is the only glue that binds Athens, he said. You will have a trial. I'll be your speaker. When? I asked again. Tomorrow, he said. The idea of a trial drove news about Miltiades and the siege of Miletus out of my head. In Athens, a foreigner cannot speak or defend himself at a trial of any kind. Without a friend, a proxenos, to represent him, a foreigner, even if he's a metic who lives in the city and has a trade and serves in the phalanx, cannot utter a word in his own defense. Actually, I approve of this law. Why let foreigners speak in your assembly? A pox on them. All they'll do is stir up trouble. Aristides walked with me as far as the first public fountain. You are not permitted to speak, he said, but that changes very little. You can still smile and frown and raise your eyebrows. You can control your emotions or give them free reign. Men know who you are. And if they didn't yesterday, they will by this morning. The jurors will watch you. Comport yourself like a man. Ask yourself, what would Achilles do? I laughed. Sulk in his camp until provoked, and then kill anyone who offended him. Aristides frowned. The law is not a matter for levity. I must leave you. I have stops to make and men to see. Be on the hill of the Areopagus by the middle of the day. He handed me a three-leaf wooden tablet with wax pages. Keep this by you, he said. I've written out the charges and your counter-charges, just in case another man has to speak for you. And I want you to understand, we're suing young Cletus for the civil loss of your chattels. That is, the girl and the horse. Of the two, the horse is by far the most valuable, and will, I think, trip young Platus up handily at the trial. Understand? I read the tablet quickly. The writing was tiny and precise, but I am a literate man. I was taught my letters early. Will the trials go on at the same time? I asked. Zeus, you know nothing of our laws. No, your trial is for the murder of a citizen. That will be tried by the Areopagitica, the elders of the city. Friends of the Alcmeonids, every man. In fact, more than half of them are Alcmeonids. He nodded gravely. The civil trials will be held when the roster allows, probably early in the spring. We'll need a jury of at least four hundred. I swallowed some rage. Spring! I promised that girl her freedom. Aristides shrugged. I doubt you'll ever see her again, frankly. I'll see to it that you receive chattel of equal value. I shook my head. Aristides, I trust you, but I will have that girl back, and I will free her. I swore it. It may seem a little thing to you. He shook his head in turn. No, oaths to the gods are weighty matters, and you are a pious man. I apologize, I will do my best. But if they cannot kill you, these men will seek to hurt you, even your woman and your horse. I spat. This is your democracy, aristocrats hitting out at better men through their chattels. He went down to the Agora with the rest of his followers, leaving me two young men with staves, Sophanes, who already had a name as a warrior, and Glaucon, his friend. They were both aristocrats, both followers of Aristides, and both very serious. They wanted me to tell them about Miltiades. I want a good crater to take home, I said, ignoring them and shrugging off my rage. I put the tablet into the back fold of my chiton, a beautiful garment of natural wool, something with a hero on it. Will you take me to the potter's quarter? I had an errand on the way, and so I walked them down past the cemetery and took them to visit Cleon, my hoplite-class friend from my first campaign. 
He met me in his doorway, and he barked like a dog, howled and threw his arms around me. Sophonis and Glaucon watched wide-eyed as we drank a shared cup of wine, a terrible wine, and traded tales. You, Sophonis, he said, Eutherai like a summer storm. Eleutheri is technically in Attica. I told the Basilius to send word to Athens, but that help, if it came at all, would be ten days away. I led my boys out of Eleutheri, down the mountain, down the pass, and along the rocky road to Thebes. As we entered our own territory, we met Lysius and a dozen of his neighbors, all armed, and Theuser coming across the fields with some light-armed men, and as soon as they met with me and my mounted scouts, they ran off ahead of us. Theuser caused me to writhe with frustration and fear, He'd seen the fire at my farm and the beacon, but he hadn't gone up the hill to investigate. He knew nothing. Lysias and his men fell in with us. They'd met the Thracians on the road. And a dozen stades further on, we met another party. Small farmers and Milesian settlers under Alcius, so that I had almost two hundred men behind me as we ran across Asopus at mid-morning. I gave them all a break. Swift as I had to be, these men had run almost forty stades, most of them in armor. If we were going to fight, we needed a rest. The two Thracians were brilliant, covering the ground in front of us and raising the farmers, and I wished I had cavalry like the Lydians and the Medes had, but I didn't. I rested the men an hour, and then we were off again, cutting across the fields of the eastern township, to try and gain a few stardis on the men we were pursuing. It was noon when we found the first body, a man in a dog cap with a pair of spear wounds in his body. His name was Milos, and he was a farmer from along the Asopus. We moved his body off the road and ran on. After a stade, there were three dead men altogether, all Asopus side farmers. The men of the Asopus district, must have made a stand here, Xenophanes said as he panted. He was an older man, a veteran of all three battles in my youth. Listen, boy, I'm finished. I can't run another step. I'll stay and bury these men and send on anyone who can follow. Xenophanes wasn't the only man who was finished. I told off ten men so that there would be no shame and told them to guard the bodies. The rest of us went on at a slow jog. My Thracians found the next bodies, all strangers. Two of them had arrows in them. Teusers, arrows. And at the road junction where the old road to Thebes and the new crossed, there were a dozen more strangers, some wounded and some dead and two of our men to tell us that our platoons were harrying the column as it retreated, and that there were more than a hundred enemies, and perhaps two hundred. We were close, but I knew we were not going to catch them. We were just ten stadis from Theban territory. Every man in the column knew it too, but we said our prayers to Ares and ran on. My slaves had dropped out by then, and I had my shield on my arm and my helmet on top of my head, and most of me hurt as much as if I had already fought. My legs burned, and my left arm felt like a bar of iron sagging from my shoulder, and even my shield strap was an unbearable burden. If I felt like that, what were my boys feeling like? But we were close. At the top of the next hill I was jogging so slowly that walking might have been faster but when I came over the hill I could see them, a dozen armed stragglers in a dense shield wall, trying to avoid a steady rain of arrows. We were close. My heels grew wings, and I ran on. Behind me my boys began to shout. I looked back and men were stripping their greaves off and casting them aside to run faster. Some stopped and threw up, others stripped off their breastplates, and then they ran on. The dozen stragglers broke when they saw us coming, and the fleetest too made it, but the rest 
died in a shower of arrows and javelins. And then Teusar was next to me, and other men I knew, about twenty all light-armed men that Teusar had rallied. I wanted to embrace him, but I didn't have the time. We ran down the last hill, and I could see the dark mass of them crossing the stream that made the border between my city and Thebes. There were quite a few of them, and most were already in Theban territory. I knew immediately what I had to do, what Miron would say if he was here. I ordered the boys to halt. Form up! I shouted. Get in your ranks! Form up! Form at normal order! The ground down to the stream was a single hayfield, and on the far side, another the same. Not for nothing do foreigners call Beotia the dance floor of Ares. Flat ground, perfect for war. Men and boys came down the road. They were strung out over several studies, and while my little phalanx formed, the enemy scrambled up the banks of the stream to safety on Theban territory. In my heart I wanted to run down and kill them all, myself if I had to. There was more at stake, though, more even than my own revenge, although the image of Euphoria's death, rape, torment, horror, came before me every time I paused or thought about anything but the task at hand. My child. She was carrying my child. If this raid came from Simon... How he would enjoy slaying my unborn child. The mind is a dark place, friends. I held the line in my head, though. I gathered my men, formed them in ranks, and then, and only then, did I take them down the hill. The enemy now stood in neat ranks on the far side of the stream. They weren't even trying to make more ground. They were good fighters, I could see by how quiet they were, how little shifting there was in their ranks. Of course they were tired, and they had lost men, and lost their bodies as well, which humiliates any soldier. When we were half a stadia away, they began to shout insults at us. We halted. I walked forward with Tusser. He already had his orders. There he was. Simon, son of Simon. He wore plain armor and a big crest, and he came out of the ranks to meet me like a long-lost brother. Look who it is, he laughed. The polymarch of Plataea. Better stay on your own side of the river, little cousin, or big bad Thebes will eat your pissant city the way a lion eats a foal. Nicely put, I shouted at him. You brand yourself a whore, son of Thebes, traitor! I spat. You are, in fact, your father's son. Laugh while you can, Plataean! He shouted back. I left your wife dead in your dooryard and burned your fucking house. And there is nothing you can do but cry like a boy. And next time I'll get you and all the men who stand between me and what is mine. In that hour, my fate dangled in the wind, along with the battle we were about to fight, and perhaps the fate of Athens, too. With the words, dead in your dooryard, I think that most of my sense of reason left me. Not that I hadn't expected it, after the sacrifices went foul and the riders appeared and the column of smoke. I never promised you a happy story, Thugater. Simon taunted me again, something about what he'd done to her body and how ugly she was. I started forward at him. Had I reached him, he and his two hundred friends would have cut me down. And then what might have happened? Thusar didn't flinch or ask permission. He shot my cousin down right there in cold blood. His arrow flew true, and Simon died with a look of complete disbelief on his hateful face, and an arrow coming out of the top of his chest just above his breastplate. And that changed everything. Suddenly the hired men knew that their paymaster was dead, and I was alive. My boys charged, 
without a word from me. We sang no paean, and we were not in any proper formation, but we went over that stream up the bank into trained men. I remember none of it. Oh, th- that's a lie. I remember going up the bank, almost losing my footing, the jar of a spear on my aspies, and another ringing off my beautiful new helmet. And then I was into them, killing. After a while we pushed them off the stream bank, and then they must have known that they'd had it. I remember Tusar at my back, shooting men in the face or foot when they troubled me. Apollo guided his hand, and he was like death. They were hired men, and their employer was already dead. After a while they broke. I suppose I killed my share of them, but they were far more alive than down when they broke. It is always the way. Men only die when they turn their backs to run. Our light-armed men were not tired. Most of them hadn't got engaged except perhaps to lob a few javelins on the unshielded flank. My rage communicated itself to them, and they followed the hired men. Anyone can kill a man who turns his back. I followed on wings of rage and revenge, so that when I surfaced from my flood tide of blood, I was far down the road to Thebes. I had no spear, just a sword. My shield was cast aside. Beside me was Idomeneus, and at my back was Teuser, and around us were thirty freed men and slaves, all busy stripping the corpses. We were ten stardies into Theban territory. My body would scarcely obey me. I couldn't have raised my sword arm to defend my poor Euphoria. I looked down the road to Thebes, and it was empty. Idomeneus laughed aloud. We fucking killed them all, he said. I've heard since that over two dozen survived, so we didn't, in fact, kill them all, but close enough. I don't remember much after that, except that I made my way back to the stream, and men tried to talk to me, and I ignored them. I stripped my armor and left it on the ground with my helmet and my weapons, and I ran, naked, back up the road. I was exhausted, but I ran anyway. I remember nothing except that I made the run all the way. Perhaps I walked, perhaps I lay down and slept, but I doubt it. The column of smoke from the burning barn rose over all of Plataea, mingling high up with the smoke of three signal fires. I ran across fields, ripping my legs on briar and my feet on the small, hard, spiky nuts that litter our fields at high summer. Not that I noticed. I ran until I could not see, until my breath came like fire into a bellows and sweat flew from me. I had run thirty stardies in armor, fought a battle, and now I was running another thirty stardies. My right arm was all blood to the elbow, sticky and brown, and there were wounds on my thighs and ankles and a deep cut on my left bicep. No idea how it came there, and still I ran. Did I think that I could save her if I ran far enough? Perhaps I wanted to burst my heart. I remember seeing that I'd run all the way to the fork at the foot of the hill, and what I remember best was the strange temptation I had to keep going, over the stream and up to the hero's tomb, and perhaps away over the mountain to Attica, and over the sea to Egypt, to keep going and never go home and never know. Perhaps I lost my wits, but I turned my feet, lengthened my stride, and ran up the dusty lane, sharp gravel under my hard feet. Halfway up the hill, the road turns just a little, and you can see straight to the gate in the wall that surrounds my house. The house itself was burning. Although it was stone and mortar and solidly built, they'd fired the floorboards and the roof beams, and the stone was cracking and falling. And the whole thing had become a chimney, Carrying my riches to the skies in an intended sacrifice. I didn't give it more than a glance. My great wooden gate for which my father had forged the straps and hinges and cut the oak 
was broken and twisted. On the ground was a heavy beam from one of the sheds, Tyreus's shed, as it later proved. They'd used it to break the gate. Around the gateway, women lamented. They keened high wails like the cries of bloody-handed furies tearing to the heavens, demanding revenge. Well, they had their revenge, but as usual, it brought no child born of woman back to life. I pushed through them. The gateway was packed with corpses, some of them black with fire. My farm had not fallen lightly, and my people had not died alone. Beyond lay across the threshold, his spear broken in his hand, his body ripped asunder. Cleon lay by him, throat ripped, and with ten great wounds in his body, and a broken axe clutched in his hands. They lay across the woman they had died defending, and even she had a sword in her hand, and the edge of the blade was bloody. She had not gone down easily. She had not been raped. She was dead before such thoughts could occur to any man, however evil. She was not pregnant, and as I stood there I realized that her hair was not blonde. It was not Euphoria. It was Mater. Mater had died in the gateway, sword in hand. My mind couldn't accept it, couldn't take in the loss of the three of them in one blow. In truth, all my being had been aimed at euphoria, and I had forgotten how many people I loved were in this farm. Mater. I lifted Bion off her legs and laid him down with dignity, although his intestines trailed behind him as I dragged him across the yard. I lifted Cleon, too, and now I was weeping because he had died like a great man and there were dead enemies at his feet. And Mater, how I had hated her for so many years, yet here she was, sword in hand like any hero you might name. Ares, she died well, and sober. I rolled her corpse over, and she had that smile on her face, that smile she wore when she saw that I could say the verses of Theonis, or when I brought Euphoria under the roof, or when she met Miltiades. That she wore that look with a spear in her guts made her seem very great to me. But when I went to lift her, two other hands reached beneath her shoulders. Bloody hands, but smaller. Euphoria's hair was wild. Her chitin was unpinned at one shoulder so that one breast showed on the right and there was blood on her feet. She took Mater's shoulders and lifted, and we laid her down with the other heroes who fell defending the dooryard. She locked me in the basement, Euphoria said. She wasn't crying. She said it was my duty to live. Tyreus and Stygis had held the door to the forge. The hired warriors had given up after they lost two men, then went and fired the house and ran off. So Stygis had let my wife out of the basement before the house collapsed into it. And more. Mater had saved so much. Wall hangings, gold and silver, all thrown into the forge building. Bion and Cleon held the gate while she did it, and then she joined them and they all died together. Or well, that's how Stygis told it, who had stood in the door of the forge and held it. Euphoria held me, crooning. She was strong, and I was suddenly unmanned. It was everything, Beyond's death, Cleon's, martyrs. And Euphoria being alive, and fatigue, I suppose. Stygis asked me if we had fought. I must have told them something because the women stopped screaming for vengeance. And then Euphoria brought me wine, neat, and I drank a cup and passed out like a drunkard. When I came to, it was night, and I could scarcely move. My thighs hurt so much that I had trouble rolling over, 
I was lying on gravel in my forge yard, and I had a blanket of my wife's weaving over me, and she was snuggled to my side, her head against my shoulder. I thought you were dead, I said. She shook her head, and her arm embraced me, a good long squeeze. In the morning my legs still ached as if I was an old man. My shoulders and arms weren't much better, and one of the cuts on my thigh was deeper than I had thought, and wept pus. The bastards had raped any female slave they caught, and killed three of my male slaves. So my yard had the mourning of defeat, along with the dreadful fear of my slave girls that they were pregnant. I went to the stream and washed myself with a prayer to the stream itself for the filth I was putting in her. And then I went back up the hill carrying water, and Euphoria began to wash the women clean, which is the only kindness you can do for a raped woman. I got Stygis and Thereus, who both had small wounds, to bind mine, and then I helped with theirs, and then we began to take stock. We hadn't lost an animal. The buyers were up the hill, and the bastards never made it past the yard. They'd burned the one barn they reached, which was full of barley and hay. It was a loss, but it only held the ready stores for the house and the animals. The house was gone, though. A house that my great-grandfather built of stone and mortar. The best house in all of South Plataea. The home of the Corvaxi, great and small. Simon burned it, destroying the work of his own family, and he killed his own stepmother in the courtyard. May the Furies rip his liver forever. May every shade in Hades treat him with the contempt of a matricide and a traitor. I was standing in the yard, looking at the wreck of the house, rubble and not much more, when men came through the gate, Teucer and Hermogenes, Idomeneus and Alcius, and all the men of the Epilectoi. I walked over to Hermogenes and put my arms around him. Beon died in the yard, I said. I took him by the hand to where his father was laid out. The women had already bathed his body with the water I brought them, and anointed him with oil, and put coins on his eyes. Hermogenes fell to his knees, wept, and poured sand over his head. Other smaller steadings had also been hit. On the way back to Thebes, the hired men had lost their discipline, if they ever had any, and they'd killed and raped whatever they could catch. So I was not alone in my mourning. But Teusar took me aside. Are you blind with rage? He asked. I shook my head. Euphoria is alive, and the unborn baby. I said, I have my wits about me today. Teusar led me outside the old house wall. This man was with them, he said. I took him alive. He's my slave now. Fair enough. A hired man was nobody's. Not a citizen anywhere. Capture meant enslavement. I had played by those rules. I knew the game. I won't kill him, I said. The man met my eye for a moment as I approached him. Then he looked at the ground. You fought for my cousin Simon, I asked. Simon! The man spat. Cletus paid us. Simon came along for the ride, the incompetent fuck. You think he should have held his tongue, friends? But why? He was our slave, and he knew what he had to do if he wanted to live. We needed no threats. Nor would I have done any differently had I stood in his shoes. I nodded. I looked at Teusar. Ask him why that came. To you, sir, prompted. Okay, I'm game. Why did you come? I asked. We were fucking paid to kill you, mate. The man shrugged. Nothing personal. To you, sir, kicked him so hard he fell to the ground. Lord, 
Arimnestos is called Lord. The man got himself upright. We were paid to kill you, Lord. He managed. Could have just told me. Can I buy him from you? I asked Tiusar. You will kill him? Tiusar said. I shrugged. Perhaps. Buy me a good working man, then. This one will be a lazy fuck. Tiusar put the man's rope in my hand. All yours. Now ask him what signaled them to start. I looked at the captive. He was squatting in the dust, but his eyes still had the glint of pride or resentment or just stubbornness. I liked him a little for that. He was beaten, but not defeated. He nodded. We was told to wait until we saw fires at Kalkis, he said. Runner came in yesterday morning. Tusar nodded. See? he asked. I did see. If there was smoke rising over Kalkis, why then the Persians must be in Ubiya. If the Persians were in Ubiya, then the attack on Attica was close, two or three weeks away at most. If the Persians were about to attack Attica, then Athens would be paralyzed, and it was safe for Simon to attack Plataea. Secrets inside secrets like the boxes which nest inside other boxes, smaller and smaller, until there's a tiny nut or a silver bell in the center of seven or eight of them. Someone had plotted this very carefully, as I had suspected. Want to be free? I said. You bet, he said. Hmm. We'll see. That corpse is my mother. That one's a person who saved my life fighting. That's my best friend's father. These women, my slaves. I looked at him, and he grew pale. I... He sputtered. Do as you're told. I said, I know you're a hoplite. Somewhere you are probably a gentleman. I looked around. Right now you're a slave, and if you fuck up, someone will kill you. Now... Truth now. Did you rape? He shook his head. No, he said. And as I said, it was obvious he had been a gentleman. I believed him. Good, then go and start helping. I sent Stygies and one of my forge boys running for Miron, and I asked him to order the muster of the whole phalanx on my say-so. Miron arrived on a mule, without ordering the muster. Why? he asked, as soon as he had his leg over the beast's back. You've slaughtered Thebans on their own ground. We're in for it now. I shook my head. Bold front, Archon. I don't think that we did wrong. Ask any man here whose wife is lying with her throat slit. That's my mother over there. He spat. Fucking Thebans. Very well. What do you suggest, Polymarch? I had the advantage that all the epilectoi were together, so that my officers, that is, my real officers, were there to advise me. We had two hours to plan and we'd hammered it out while we waited for Miron and cleared the rubble of the house. A hundred men, even a hundred tired men, can accomplish a great deal in a short time. My burned barn was now a dark smudge on the ground, and my ruined house was a pile of fire-blackened stone out beyond the house wall. The burned beams had been stacked, and three pyres of scrap wood from all the surrounding farms built on the hilltop. All that in a few hours. By now I was much calmer. I'd had time to breathe, and no one let me do any work, nor did Idomeneus do any, as he was a lord now and a priest. Alcius was the same, so the three of us watched other men lift stones while we debated the campaign. And when Miron asked, we were ready. How are the towers? I asked. 
The West Tower is done, and the East will be complete tomorrow or the next day, if the wind continues to blow dry. He shrugged. They'll be done before Thebes can march. That confirmed what we'd hoped. Then this is our plan, I said. First we free all the slaves who built the towers. You so tear, the Archon said. That's the whole year's profits gone. I nodded. Not just for you, Lord. But listen, we lost ten men yesterday. We'll lose ten times that in the next month, and that is if we win. We need those men as citizens, yes? He shook his head. Perhaps later. I disagreed. We need them now. Because we want to put them in the armor of the dead hired men, install Lysias as their officer, and leave them with another fifty picked men to guard the walls. In fact, we don't want them to sit within the walls. We want them to march down to the ford and camp, with light-armed men prowling around. If you dare... I looked around. I'd sent Yusser tonight to burn some barns in Thebes. Miron shook his head. You are talking about kicking a hornet's nest, he said. Idomeneus raised a long, plucked eyebrow. Ever faced down a bull in a meadow, Archon? He asked. Miron nodded slowly. I have too. You think that as long as we look tough, they'll back down? Alcius laughed. Not really, Lord. The truth is they have twelve thousand hoplites and we do not. But a show of aggression, especially after the tanning we gave those hired men, might slow them up for a week or two. He shrugged. Lysias can always pull inside the walls later when he sees the dust cloud coming. Miron gave a grim smile. All this planning suggests that you won't be here with the phalanx. That's right, I said. According to our prisoners, Eubia was burning yesterday. Calcius is being served up to the Persians. By the time we march, Eubia will have fallen. Alcius nodded. And Datis has the heart of the sailing season at his back, he said. He'll move straight on to Athens. And Athens will fall without my phalanx, Miron asked softly. I laughed. A thousand hoplites. I made a face. Athens can find twelve thousand and perhaps fifteen. They don't need the weight of our spears. Secretly, I suspected that they did need the weight of our spears. But Athens has factions, Miron, factions the like of which you can't imagine. If we appear to honor our agreements and without being asked, we will strengthen Miltiadi's hand enormously. He looked at me, and I looked at him. Archon, I said, please, if Athens falls, or Medizis, Plataea is doomed. Thebes will eat us the way a gull eats a snail. Our only hope of preservation is to act aggressively for Athens. Miron looked out from our hilltop. Men were still carrying brush for the pyres to burn the bodies. And below other men, my neighbors were breaking up the biggest chunks of rubble with iron tools. When I was a much younger man, he said after a while, I stood in your forge yard with your father and a few other men, and we agreed to make an alliance with Athens to preserve our city from the yoke of Thebes. He turned and met my eye. I think the decision for today was made that day. I was wrong to slow the muster. I will see to it, and you will take my citizens over the mountain and do what you can. He stood straight as if ten years had fallen from his shoulders. May Zeus and Ares and grey-eyed Athena stand by you, for if you lose the phalanx even in victory, why then our city will fall. When he went back to his mule, Alcius looked at me. Plataea is lucky to have so many great men in so small a city. Would that Miletus had done as well. We may yet fail, I said. He shrugged. Of course, but not for the lack of trying. Let's go and kill some Medes, Idomeneus said. 
and he grinned. We burned Mater, Bion, and Cleon on the hilltop that afternoon with wine and sacrifices, and a priestess of Hera from the temple. And when they were ash, and the fires were great smoking columns, not unlike the pillars of smoke that the raiders had left behind, the priestess came to me and proposed that I pay for a statue of Mater in the temple. She was a great woman, the priestess said. She was a matron with iron at her temples and a vast reserve of dignity. Young women need examples of how to live and die. I all but spat at her. She was drunk every day of her wedded life, I said. The priestess stepped back. Speak no ill of the dead, she commanded. Is that the way you will speak of her, or as the hero who fell defending your home? I gave her the money. There's a new statue that bears no resemblance to her. The Persians broke the one a local man made, smashing it to gravel with hammers. But in Plataea, the new temple honors Mater as an avatar of Hera. Take from that what you will. While I mourned, the phalanx mustered. A thousand men may not sound like many, but every man needs a slave and a donkey or a mule to carry his kit to cook for him and keep him in fighting trim. And a thousand mules with two thousand men is a long column to lead over mountain tracks. It takes time for men to put their houses in order, and time to gather enough food for thirty days, and time for the slave to kiss his own wife. Time to make sure you have your second best cloak as well as your war cloak. Time to make sure that someone packed you some garlic sausage and some fresh onions from the garden. My packing was done. My mule was still picketed high above Eleutheri, and my friends had rescued my kit from where I left it by Asopus. My good Persian shirt of scale was on Lysias's back and my old helmet with the raven crest was on his head to puzzle the Thebans, and he did it no dishonor. Euphoria fussed about, finding me oil with lavender in it, and retrieving as if by a miracle my father's heavy walking stick from the collapsed cellar of the house, charred a little but still strong as iron, and when she had seen me cared for, she took me by the hand and led me to our spring, up by the vineyard, and then she bathed with me in the deep hole by the spring. There were men all about us on the hill, but none came near, and the olive grove hid us. There's no modesty when you bathe in an open sink of rock, and pregnancy or none, we made love, and then we washed again, and she put on the robe Mater had saved, a beautiful thing of red-purple with gold embroidery, and I helped her put up her hair in a net of linen. In the dooryard where Mater had fallen, she poured the libations on my shield and wiped it with a new linen towel, and then she did the same to my sword and my spear, and finally, defying convention, to my helmet. I longed to crush her to me, but I did not. We were Greeks, not barbarians, our women send us to war with dry eyes, and we left as if going to the fields, and not to face death. There was still smoke rising to the heavens from the funeral pyres when we marched. As we climbed the hills towards Kitheron, we were joined by the main body from the agora of the city itself. In the distance, as we climbed... We could see smoke rising over Theban territory, and there were wolfish smiles as we went. The Epilectoi marched first, up the same road they'd marched just ten days before on their way to the late summer hunt. They weren't boys any more. When they had torn into the hired men, they took losses. Ten killed outright, another dozen dying of wounds. In a community as small as ours, the loss of twenty young men was a knife wound in the gut. Everyone was the friend, the lover, the wife, the sister or brother of one of the dead. But they had killed, and won, and that changed them most of all. 
When we walked up the trails to the tomb of the hero, every man in my front rank knew that he was worthy of the blood of his fathers. He knew that he had been proven in fire, and like bronze, hardened by the working. I could make you an argument that the hired men did us a favor by attacking us, but I'd be full of shit. There is no good war. We stopped at the shrine, as Plataeans have done since the Trojan War, and we poured libations. Some men shouted for me to sacrifice my new slave on the tomb. His name was Jelon, and he was a Greek from Sicily. He heard them call for his blood, and he stood there with my shield on his shoulder, watching me. I looked at Idomeneus. It was his choice, really. He shook his head. No, he said. We have shed enough blood, and the hero craves no more. He sacrificed a ram we'd brought for the purpose, looked at its entrails and shook his head. This isn't going to be good, he said. I spat. I don't need entrails to tell me that, I said. We slept in our cloaks, and in the morning, after Teusar and the light-armed men rejoined from their raid into Thebes, we marched away, over the mountains. Chapter 16 It was hot on the plains of Beotia, and cold in the passes above Kitheron. But when we came down off the passes, the sweltering sea heat nearly choked us and the humidity was such that a man could sweat through his chitin before he had it over his head. I intended to keep to the high roads as long as possible. I didn't want to give away my march. This sounds odd in light of what transpired, but I was very conscious of the passage of days, and it seemed all too possible to me that we would arrive to find Athens surrendered or beaten, in which case I needed to get away unmolested by the Persian cavalry. I was very aware, as Miron wanted me to be, that I held the future of Plataea under my hand. So we were wary, and stayed to the north of Attica as the shadows lengthened and the summer ended. We turned east as we came down the main pass, and marched for two days across uncultivated land, skirting Oinoe. Men saw us, but they did not come forward to speak to us, and I had a handful of my light-armed mounted on horses to keep me informed of the terrain, and we made good time. A week into our march, and we were in Attica proper, an Attica bereft of citizen men, doors were locked against us, and there were only slaves and women, and few enough of them, too. It was as if a dread disease had swept the land and killed them. There was even wheat left in some fields. One night when we camped, my men reaped a whole field with their swords, and left three silver coins on the doorstep of the empty house in payment and we baked bread the next night after grinding it in an empty grist mill and baking it in ovens we found cold. A day's march from Athens, and we could see the Acropolis as clear as day on the horizon. It was not on fire, and I assumed that if Athens had surrendered or made peace, all these folk would have come flooding back down the roads to their farms, so I left my brother-in-law in charge, took my new slave, and rode hard for Athens as the sun rose. The gates were still open. The streets were packed with people, all the farmers from the farms I'd just marched past, I expect. Most of them didn't pay me a glance as I rode by, because the only men who would have been interested in me were in the Agora, voting. Any man still on the streets was a slave, a freedman, or a foreigner. If I had thought that the Agora was full for Phrynichus's play, I was shocked to see how packed it was that late summer day. I had to dismount and leave my horse with Jelon. Then I shouldered my way forward, 
I am not a small man, but neither am I a giant, and no one wanted to make way for me. It took me an hour, five speeches, to make my way from the Tholos to the center of the Agora where the speakers stood. For most of that time I could see Miltiades. He stood virtually alone. The men who stood by him were unknown to me, except Aristides and Sophanes, both of whom stood so proudly that they looked like men fighting in a desperate last stand. When I was close enough, I could hear a man argue from the Bema, the speaker's platform, that there was no need for Athens to march to the aid of Eritrea, that Eubea was an ancient enemy of Athens, true enough, friends, and the great king was welcome to lay them low, and more such stuff. In that hour, as I bulled my way across the Agora and felt every wound on my body, I heard every cringing excuse to avoid war, every noble sentiment against it, speeches of cowardice and speeches of sublime nobility. When I was almost close enough to touch Miltiades, a man ascended the Bema who looked like one of Themistocles' men. He stood with his head bowed for a moment, and then he raised it. What more can we do? he asked. Miltiades asks that we form the phalanx and march to defend the coast, even to save Calchis. But I ask, why must we fight alone? We have walls, and Sparta is not coming. Thebes has made their own peace. We are alone, men of Athens. Are we the protectors of Greece? Sparta craves that title. Let them act the part. He got quite a cheer, too. While men were cheering, it is easy to cheer for other men to do the hard work while you sit at home, I find. Miltiades raised his head. He was plainly dressed for him. In a dark clamis over a plain white chiton with one stripe, the gold pin at his shoulder was his only concession to rank. He raised his head, and his eyes met mine, and lit up the way my eyes lit when they crossed with Euphoria's. He waited until he could clasp my hand, and then he pulled me sharply so that he towed me as one ship will tow another after a storm. He didn't bother to mount the Bema. He simply raised my hand the way a judge in games raises the hand of a victor. You lie! He roared. Plataea is here! Chaos. Men shouted one thing and then another. I saw my father-in-law in the crowd, and I saw Aristides, and I saw Cleitus. I had thought him an exile until then. Our eyes met, and the hate flowed like wine. I was still locked in that when the Archon Basilius pushed to my side. Do you have an army? He asked. A thousand hoplites, I said, which is every man we have. He embraced me. He, an aristocrat, who had no love for me or mine, but he embraced me, and then he pointed to the Bema. You have my permission to speak, he said. So although I was a foreigner, I mounted the speaker's platform. The crowd was not quiet, but I didn't care. I raised my hand. I've brought the full muster of Plataea, I shouted, and left Thebes afraid. Plataea stands with Athens. And by the time I came down from the platform, they were already voting Aristides and Miltiades as strategoi, and sending the phalanx out to fight. As every schoolboy knows, the assembly voted ten strategoi. Aristides and Miltiades were but two of them, and Cletus of the Alcmeonids a third. And even when they began to muster the phalanx, Half of the generals were still dead set against war, or at least offensive war. The very next thing they did was to vote for a runner to be sent to Sparta to beg for help. 
That's how it sounded to me, anyway. And why not? The Spartans, for all my sneers, were the best soldiers in Greece, perhaps in the world. I stood with Miltiades as he hurried men to get their kit. Many men of the phalanx were already prepared, had been so for days. Men of the other party were unprepared, or at least most were, so assured were they that the phalanx would not march. The polymarch of Athens was Callimachus of Aphidna. He was an older man with a fine reputation, both as a warrior and as a politician. I have heard men say that he hesitated, that he only marched when Miltiades threatened to take his men and sail away. Miltiades, after all, had his own army from the Chersonese, almost a thousand hoplites with more military experience than the rest of Athens put together. Not so. Let us be fair. He was hesitant, extremely hesitant, to march. Remember, this was before the Persian fleet had even been sighted. The Persians were just a rumor of terror up the coast, although on a clear day you could see the fires in Eubea rising to the heavens. He was hesitant for a reason. I tasted this hesitancy myself. It is one thing to march in the phalanx. It is another to go in the front rank, and yet another to be a killer of men, a hero, a man who can change a battle. But all of them, the killer, the front ranker, the rear ranker, have more in common than any of them share with the polymarch and the strategos. On their shoulders rests the burden, fight or don't fight, march or don't march. Choose correctly and your name will live forever. For ever. Choose badly or get cursed by the gods and your city is lost, your friends killed, your elders butchered, your women raped and sold as slaves. Understand, if you aren't hesitant about fighting, then you're a fucking idiot. And those men who voted against the fight, they had to go and stand shoulder to shoulder with the men who voted for the fight, and each had to depend on the other. The city was divided about evenly, I'd say, half for glory, half for caution. Callimachus was right to hesitate. I watched the chaotic preparations, the same mess as our Plataean preparations, but magnified ten times, and shook my head. Why such a hurry? I asked. Tomorrow morning will be as good as this evening, and surely you won't march before dark. Miltiades pursed his lips. If you hadn't come just when you did, God sent, I would not have carried this debate. He said. Slaves came up with his kit and his hippaspist, a Thracian I'd seen with him before, shouldered his shield and flashed me a blonde smile. Miltiades smiled himself when he saw his panoply. If I can get them clear of the city before night falls, he said, I have a chance. If we're here in the morning, we'll never march. He shrugged. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I have a feel for these things. Aristides came, surrounded by men I knew, Sophonies, of course, but also Ios and Phrynicus, and a dozen oarsmen I recognized, all dressed as hoplites. Their kit was as good as our front rankers. Athens has money, and money buys armor. I suggested that we free a thousand slaves and put them in the ranks. Aristides said, and these fools declined, saying that it would be too hard to choose what tribes they would go to. He shook his head. Some of them even wanted to decline the service of the armed metics. I stood there while the sun sank, and I had nothing to do but think. After a few minutes, or even an hour, I turned to Aristides. Plataea will take your freedmen. I said, put them in my rear ranks, then your proud citizens have nothing to complain about. He gave me a thin-lipped smile. Tomorrow, Aristides said, 
Today we march out of the city. Miltiades is right. Today or never. The shadows were long enough to make a short man tall when Miltiades took his tribe out of the gate. It was a purely symbolic march. Miltiades was to Athens, as I was to little Plataea, and his men were ready. Many carried their own gear, poor men who knew no other trade but fighting, and they had been assembled and ready since the last vote. Aristides marched next with the men of the Antiochies. By the time Miltiades' men cleared the sacred gate, Aristides' men were ready to march, even though his tribe, by ill chance, contained many of those determinedly against the war. The other Strategoi were less ready, but Aristides had set the example by marching, despite having a third of his taxis missing. And so the other taxes of the tribes marched away as soon as their turns came. I stood and waited. After all, I had a horse. And what I saw heartened me. Men continued to come to the square behind the sacred gate, kiss their wives, pour a quick libation, and run down the road with a slave or a servant and a donkey hurrying after them, so that there was a constant flow of stragglers and sluggards behind the march of the army. The strategoi had left almost half the army behind. It could have been a disaster, but the men of Athens, even those against the war, did their duty. When I mounted my horse, darkness was falling. Have we won, do you think? Jelon asked me. I laughed to hear him say, we. We haven't won. I said, we haven't lost. We've marched. And if Miltiades is to be believed, that means we're still in the game. You could free me now, Jelon said. No one around to kill me. I nodded. I could, but I won't. You fight in the phalanx and fight well. If you live, I'll free you. Free me first, he said. I'm fucked if I'm going to fight as a slave. No one will want me anyway. Who ever heard of a slave hoplite? That was true. I'll tell you what, Jelon. If the Athenians free their slaves, I'll put you in with them. As a slave? He asked, daring. As a free man, you whore son. Now get your ass moving down the road. Jelon made me laugh, in a dark way. I was coming to like him. He bore slavery with a kind of amused contempt that made it impossible for me to punish him while he showed his resistance every minute. I respected that. I also thought that another man, Idomeneus, for instance, would have beaten him to a pulp. The sun was setting, and although we didn't know it yet, Chalcis had just been stormed. One of the richest cities in Greece, an ancient rival of Athens, at sea and on land, the city that colonized Sicily and southern Italy and even the coast of Asia, had fallen by treachery to the great king. Datis organized the warriors massacred, and the women and children sold into slavery, just as he had at Miletus and Lesbos. His tame Greeks turned away from the slaughter, but the Sakai and the Medes and the Persians butchered the men and the elderly and set fire to the city, every house and every temple. The column of smoke rose to the heavens like a sacrificial fire and could be seen from the Acropolis, as Datis intended. That he sent his cavalry across the bridge to sow terror, the way a farmer sows barley. The women were loaded into his troop ships, weeping at their state, women who had been wives, who had known love, who had sat at their looms, proud of their family names. And the ships, crewed by Phoenicians and Ionian Greeks, got their sterns in the water, unfolded the mighty wings of their oars, and turned their ram prows south with a gentle wind at their backs and a protected sea. It was too late for Poseidon to intervene. The great king's fleet was at sea. The oars pulled to the lamentations of five thousand new slaves. 
their rams were pointed at Attica. And even as we marched out of Athens and made our first camp in the hills north of the city, even as men groused or had second thoughts, Datis's scouts were riding through the long grass by the beach at Marathon. Chapter 17 Last night, while we were drinking, the young scribe from Halicarnassus asked me why Athens didn't meet Datis at sea. It's a damn good question, given the size of Athens's fleet today. The truth is, in the time of Marathon, there was no Athenian fleet. I realize that this sounds impossible, but the fact is that the tyrants and the oligarchs shared a healthy fear of the demos, and the fleet gives the demos power, because the power of the fleet is its rowers, not its hoplites, the thetes who pulled the oars, so noblemen owned warships, Tartarus, friends, I owned a warship at the time of Marathon, Aristides owned one, Sophanes' family owned one, and Miltiades owned ten at the height of his power. That was the Athenian fleet, the accumulation of the ships of the rich, not unlike the way they formed a phalanx, come to think of it, and all the ships Athens could muster might have made fifty hulls. Before Lade, fifty hulls had been accounted a mighty fleet, but the world was changed by the great king's decision to spend Greece into defeat. His six hundred triremes, give or take a hundred, won him Lade, though it strained his empire to maintain them, and they emptied the ocean of trained rowers. But Athens had nothing to offer against his six hundred. Our hulls were all on the beach at Piraeus, all those that weren't ferrying refugees across to Salamis, or around the coast to the Peloponnese. The first night, we camped in the precinct of a temple of Heracles, perched high on the ridge above Athena's city. My Plataeans were still forty stadis away to the north, and I saw no reason to bring them along yet, as we had no word of the enemy and the Athenian camp was in enough disorder as it was. Greek armies are usually only as good as the time and distance they are from home. The first night, with the army close enough to home, to sleep there if they wanted, with none of the discipline or shared experience that an army builds with every camp and every smoky meal, they are just a mob of men with little in common, except their duty to the city, Many of them have no notion how to live rough, or how to eat without their wives and slaves to cook. The aristocrats have no problems. The aristocrats' life as a gentleman farmer and hunter is perfectly suited to training campaigners. But the potters and the tanners and the small farmers, all strong men, may never have eaten a meal under the wheel of the heavens in their lives. Jelon and I bedded down with Miltiades men, who had none of these problems, and little but contempt for their fellow Athenians. These were the men he'd led at Lade, and a dozen other fights, and they were confident in themselves, and in their lord. Aristides' men were a different matter. Let me just say that since Cleisthenes' reforms, fairly recent when we marched to Marathon, all of the tribes of Athens were artificial constructs. Cleisthenes had sought to break up the power bases of the great aristocrats, like Miltiades, by ensuring that every tribe was composed in equal parts of men of the city, the potters and tanners, let's say, men of the farms, up-country men, small farmers, and aristocrats too, and men of the sea, fishermen, coastal men, and oarsmen. It was a brilliant law. It gave every Athenian a shared identity with men from the parts of Attica that most individuals had never visited. Another thing that he did, another brilliant thing, was to heroize everyone's ancestors. In Athens, 
The principal difference between an aristocrat and a commoner was not money. Freed men and merchants often had lots of money, and no one thought of them as aristocrats, believe me. No, the biggest difference was ancestors. An aristocrat was a man descended from a god or from a hero. Miltiades was descended from Ajax of Salamis, and through him back to Zeus. Aristides was descended, like me, from Heracles. My friend Ios was descended from parents who were citizens, but they had no memory of anything before their own parents. Cleon's father was a fisherman, but his mother had been a whore. But when Cleisthenes passed his reforms, this happened while I was a slave at Ephesus. He gave every tribe a heroic ancestor and declared by law that everyone in the tribe could count that ancestor in their descent. I've heard men, never Athenians, but other Greeks, say that Cleisthenes brought democracy to Athens. Crap! Cleisthenes was a far, far more brilliant man than that. I never met him, but like most middle-class men, I revere his memory as the man who built the Athens we loved. What he did was to make every man an aristocrat. In one stroke of law, every oarsman and every whore's son had as much reason to serve his city as Aristides and Miltiades and Cleitus, to live well with Arete and to die with honor. I'm not saying that it worked any better than any other political idea, but to me it is a glorious idea, and it made the Athens that stood against the great king. The main consequence was that the precinct of Heracles was filled with men who would never, ever have been in a phalanx fifteen years before. When my father died serving alongside Athens in Eubea, their phalanx had about six thousand men, and while the front ranks were superb, the rear ranks were poor men with spears, no shields, no armor, and no hope of standing for even a heartbeat against a real warrior. That was the way. But the new Athens had a phalanx with twice as many spears, almost twelve thousand, and from what I could see, almost all of them had the white leather spolades for which Athens was famous. The city owned the tanning trade back then, and their white leather was prized from Nocratis to the Troad. They all seemed to have helmets, too. See, what Cleisthenes did was to create a city where a man who made pots and worked a plot of land just big enough to yield two hundred medimnoi of grain, about a tenth of what my farm yielded in a good year, would spend his surplus cash, a very small amount, friends, on armor and weapons, like an aristocrat. Thugater, you are laughing at me. Am I too passionate? Listen, honey, I may be tyrant here, but in my heart I'm a Beotian farmer. I don't want the aristocrats to rule. I want every man to stand up for himself, take his place in the line, farm his plot, eat his own figs and his own cheese, raise his hand in the assembly, and curse when he wants. When I'm honest, I realize that I joined the ranks of the Aristos pretty early. It may be that, as my mother said, our family was always with them. But I never wanted power over other men, except in war. Now you're all laughing at me. I think I should keep my story for another day. Perhaps I'll go and sulk in my tent. Perhaps I'll take Blushing Girl here for company. Ha! <laughs> More wine! That was worth the interruption. Look at that color. Now, where was I? In the morning, I mounted my horse, and Jelon got on my mule, and we rode away north to find my brother-in-law and the Plataeans. The Athenians turned east after they passed the great ridge and headed for the sea. I reached my men before noon and found that they were fed, well slept, and ready to march. 
Antigonus shrugged. I enjoyed being Polymarch, he said. Go back to the Athenians, I'll take it from here. He grinned and slapped my back, but when we had the army moving, he came up beside me in the dust. Don't ever do that to me again, he said quietly. When you didn't come back last night, all I could see was panic and horror. The Persians had you, the fucking Athenians had arrested you. What was I to do? Just as you did, I said, and slapped him on the back in turn. I had brought a pair of guides from Miltiades, both local men from the Athenian phalanx who knew all the trails and small roads that led east from our position. So we made good time, although the way was never straight, and at one point we actually crossed some poor farmer's wheat field. Two thousand men, and as many animals, crushing his precious crop. But it was the only way to join two paths. Attica had some of the worst roads in the world then. I rode ahead with Gelon and Lycon and Philip the Thracian, both serving as volunteers as their cities had no part in this war. And we found a camp, three hayfields, all fallow or recently cut with stone walls all around, on a low ridge with a stream at the bottom. It's one of the best positions I've ever found, and I went back to it on another occasion. We slept secure. I had sentries every night already, a lesson learned from my first campaigns. We rose with dawn. All that hunting on Kitharon had good effect, ate hard bread and drank a little wine, then moved. Before noon we were up with the tail of the Athenian force, which was moving down through the olive groves that crowned the ridges around Aletus's farm and tower. I knew the trails here, again from hunting, and my guides were off their own ground, so I took us a little north, over the same ridge where Aletus's party had killed two deer, and down through the old orchards where mine had killed six. Aristides was first that day. The tribes have a strict rotation in everything, from order of march to place in the battle line, and he was the strategos in charge, because the Athenians rotated the command. He was choosing his camp when I rode up with my little party. He smiled when he saw me. I didn't smile. Any pleasure was wiped from my heart when I saw that he was with Cleitus. Aristides raised a hand. Stop, he said. I had my hunting spear in my fist. We are here to fight the Medes, not each other, Aristides said. Look, I said. You found a horse, I snorted. I thought I heard that something had happened to them. Cleitus had his sword in his hand. How's your mother? he asked. Aristides hit him, hard, in the temple with his fist. Aristides was a good athlete and a fine boxer, and Cleitus fell from his horse. But when I rode over to him, Aristides caught my spear hand in a grip of iron. In this army, he said, there are other men who hate each other, political foes, personal enemies, men with lawsuits. We have tribes with rivalries, and men with conflicting interests in money, men who have absconded with wives and daughters, men who committed crimes. And worst of all, as both of you know, we have men who have taken money from the great king, and who will use their power to break us the way they broke the East Greeks at Lade through defection and treachery. Cleitus got to his feet and put a hand to his head. You have a heavy hand, sir. Aristides nodded. We are in the precinct of Heracles, ancestor to all three of us. You will both come with me to the altar and swear to the gods to keep the peace and fight together like brothers. You are leaders. If you fight each other, we are finished. He killed my mother, I said. And his actions served the great king. He's taking the great king's money. He planned to kill me to keep the Plataeans out of this. 
Plautus looked at me with the kind of contempt I hadn't seen in a man's eyes since I was a slave. You live in a world of delusion, peasant. I would never do anything to serve the great king. I am an Athenian. I will crush you like the insect that you are for hubris, for treating my family as if we were at your level, killed your mother. He laughed. It should have been you. And it is no care of mine if some rattled Beotian whore got in the way. He turned to Aristides. I swore to kill him and all his family. He has insulted me and mine. Aristides crossed his arms. Cletus, most men in this army think your family are traitors. Cletus whirled around in angry denunciation, but Aristides cut him off with a raised hand. If you refuse to swear my oath, Cletus, I will send you from the army and I will cease defending you to the demos. More quietly, he said, This is not the Agora, nor the Palestra. He insulted your family? You insulted his? By all the gods, we're talking about the existence of our city. Are you a playground bully or a man of honor? I had lowered my spear point. Aristides always had that effect on me. His moral advantage was almost as great as Heraclitus's. He lived the words he spoke. But I was still angry. Aristides, I said, I honor you more than most men. But he killed my friends and fellow townsmen and my mother. He killed them for vanity, his so-called revenge. He brought it on himself by trying to treat me the way he treats the demos, as lesser men. You killed his horses, fifty horses, the value of ten farms. You killed them. Aristides stood in front of me, imperturbable. You killed them to humiliate the Alcmeonids, not to save Miltiades, but for your sense of your own honor. Deny it if you can. He murdered my people, Cleithus said, family retainers. Thugs, I said. Aristides, this is foolishness. You of all men know why I did what I did. I do. Aristides said, You did what you did to achieve what you perceived as justice, as did Cleitus. He killed my mother! I yelled. My family is in exile, Cleitus said. My uncle died. He died far from our city. Thanks to you, the dogs of this city bay for our blood, and the little men, tradesmen, men whose grandfathers were slaves, treat us with contempt. For that I would kill you and every man and every woman with a drop of your blood in his veins. So both of you can wallow in selfishness, pride, self-deceit, and Athens can be burned by the Medes. Aristides raised an eyebrow. Come with me. Both of you. Such was his authority that we followed him. He led us over the brow of the hill on which the precinct of the shrine of Heracles stood. Suddenly, in the blaze of the late summer sun, we were looking down the hill to the plain, the fields and olive groves of one of Attica's richest areas, all the way to the beach at Marathon. And from the curve of the beach... As far north as the eye could see were ships, hundreds of ships, ships as thick on the sea as ants around an anthill when the plough rips it asunder. Many of them were already stern in to the beach, over by the marsh at the north end of the bay. They were unloading men and tents, or so I guessed. Closer to us, in the open ground at the foot of the hill, there were a dozen Sakai cavalrymen. They were looking up the hill at us. They had gold on their arms, in their hats, on their saddles, and every one of them had a heavy bow at his waist and a pair of long spears in his fist. There they are, the Persians, the Medes, the Sakai, the armoured fist of the great king, here to chastise Athens for her sins. Now, choose. Stand here in the sight of the enemy 
and fight each other to the death, and on your heads be the future that you squander, or both of you can swear my oath. Fight side by side. Show the army, every man of whom knows your story, and your hate, believe me, that war with Persia is bigger than family, bigger than revenge. And when the Persians are gone, you may kill each other, for all I care. Silence, and the wind sighing over the golden wheat fields down by the sea. I nodded. I will swear, I said. What else could I say? Aristides was the just man. What he asked was just. Nor was Cletus, for all that I still burn with hate for him, less a man than I. I will swear, he said, because you are right. I will go farther, because I am a better man than this Beotian pig. I paid men to fight against you, Plataean, but I am sorry that your mother died. For that alone you have my apology. I might have muttered an apology for the death of his uncle. Even if I did, his was the nobler gesture, but then his was the greater crime. This is so often the way with men. The gesture is the thing that we remember, the grand apology, the noble death. Did my mother's noble death wipe clean a lifetime of woe? Did Cleon's? Is a great apology the equal of a great crime? I don't know, and Heraclitus was no longer alive to tell me. We stood on either side of the low-saddled altar of Heracles, clasped arms like comrades, and swore to stand together against the Persians, to support each other and be brothers and comrades. We followed Aristides word for word until he finished. Until the Persians are defeated, Cletus added. Until the Persians are defeated, I repeated, meeting his eyes. You are both idiots, Aristides said. I'd like to say that a spirit of cooperation swept the army after I swore not to kill Cletus, but I'm not sure anyone noticed. This is the problem with acts of moral courage and ethical purity. Had I struck him down with my hunting spear, I'm sure there might have been consequences, but having stayed my hand, there was no observable change. Heraclitus and Aristides both told me that the only reward for a correct action is the knowledge of having acted well. Fair enough, but I suspect that you have to be Aristides or Heraclitus to feel that such knowledge is enough reward for the sacrifice of something so deeply satisfying as revenge. At any rate, we made camp in the precinct of Heracles. From the summit we could see the Persians unloading their ships. I brought the Plataeans to the north of the Athenians, the left end of our line of camp, and the spot closest to the enemy. We took the rocky end of the temple precinct, almost like a small acropolis. It wasn't much ground, but it would be easy to defend, and it had a big stand of cypress trees in the centre, good shade. As I considered it, I saw a man turn aside to relieve himself in the woods, and I caught him. No man relieves himself inside the camp, I said. Even with the hunting, they'd never been on campaign. Most of my men had no idea how fast disease can stalk a camp. So as soon as we'd stopped, I gathered the warriors in a great circle and stood on a pile of shields, so that they could all hear me. All men will sleep here on the rock, I said. The cypress trees will give us shade and some shelter, but no man is to cut one or build a fire under them for fear of offence to the god. Nor is any man to relieve himself inside the precinct. I will mark a boundary for such things below. Nor will any man use the stream to wash himself, his animal, or his clothes, except where I mark it, so that the stream herself will not feel defiled. 
and so no man's shit will float down into our cookpots, I said. And they laughed, and my point was made. The Plataean Strategoi chose their ground, and then we went down the ancient ramp behind the high ground and chose a low bog for men to use, and had slaves dig trenches across it and lay logs, and we chose a place for the slaves to draw water and wash clothes. Water is going to be a problem, Antigonus said. I don't understand why we have to have all these rules, Epistocles said. He shook his head. If I have to go in the night, do you really think I'm going to walk all this way? Yes, I said. Well, you can guess again, he said with a foolish little laugh. Epistocles, you're an officer, and men will take their lead from you. If men start pissing in our camp, it will soon become unlivable. This is the most defensible terrain for ten stardies. Don't piss on it. I grinned at him, but only in the way I grin when I'm prepared to use my fists to make a man see sense. And he backed away. You seem to think you can give orders like a king, he said. This is war, I said. Some men it makes kings and others it makes slaves. What's that? He said. Never mind, I said, and we went off to find space for two thousand men to sleep. We spent two days making camp and watching the Persians make theirs. They had to land all those men, and some of us wondered why we didn't just rush them when they had about a third of their men ashore. It was disgust, but we did nothing. In fact, there was something awe-inspiring about the size of the Persian force and their fleet. They also had almost a thousand cavalry, deadly horse archers, Persians and Sakai, who had been further north, filtering down from Eritrea in pursuit of the last force in the field there, an army of Athenian settlers and Eubians who had retreated in good order from the initial defeats, but gradually died under the arrows of the Sakai. We had had no idea that they still existed until a runner came in on the third morning, a man with an arrow in his bicep who collapsed as soon as he entered the army's agora. When Athens had defeated Eubea in my father's time, they had determined to hold the place thereafter, and they sent four thousand settlers, lower-class Athenians, to become colonists, and to hold the best farms. There was no love lost between the settlers and the locals, but when the Persians came, they made a good force. They fought three small actions with the Persians, trying to break out, and finally they got fishing boats and shuttled across the straits right under the noses of the enemy. But then the cavalry fell on them. Those men had been fighting and running for two weeks. It was Miltiades' day to command, and he summoned us all as soon as he heard what the messenger had to say. One day's march north, there are two thousand men, good men, and they're dying under the arrows of the Sakai. He looked around. I propose we take our archers and our picked men and go and relieve them. Callimachus shook his head. You cannot split the army, he said. And you cannot defeat their cavalry. That's why we camped here, remember, fire breather? So that their arrows could not easily reach us? Miltiades shook his head. With picked men, if we move fast and take archers of our own, we can beat them, or at least scatter them, the way dogs can drive lions off their prey. Aristides nodded. We have to try. To leave those men to their deaths... No one would ever speak well of us again. Miltiades looked around. Well? I have a hundred Plataeans who can run the whole distance, I said, and twenty archers to run with them. Miltiades smiled, but before he could speak, the polymarch shook his head. If we must do this, then every man should go. In the dark, we can feel our way with guides and be across the ridge before the Medes know we've gone. 
will catch their cavalry napping. He looked around, the weight of the responsibility heavy on him. I think he would rather that the Ubians had died at home. But he was right. Miltiades wanted a heroic raid, but if we were all together and we moved fast, we'd accomplish the mission with much less risk. Everyone chose Callimachus's method over Miltiades. We rose in the dark, hours before the morning star would rise, and we slipped away behind our temple precinct hill, leaving three thousand chosen men to hold the camp behind us. By the time the sun was up, our leading men, my Plataeans, were less than ten stadis from the hilltop where our Eubian Athenians were making their stand. I wanted to run down the road with my epilectoi, but I knew that the only way to do this was with massed bodies of impenetrable spears. I hadn't fought cavalry since the fight on the plains by Ephesus, but what I had learned there seemed pertinent. Stay together and wait for the horsemen to flinch. By mid-morning we were spotting Sakai scouts, and Theuser brought one down with a well-aimed arrow. The next time we saw a party of them form, Theuser had a dozen of his light-armed men together, and they lofted arrows with a little breeze behind them. The Sakai rode out from under their little arrow shower, but their counter-shots fell well short, and after that it was like a deadly game of rovers. Our archers could outrange theirs, and that meant that they couldn't come in on us, and twice Theusev's little band took one of the Sakai off his horse, or left the horse dead, and they gave us room. The Athenians had a city archer corps, all dressed like Scythians. They were mostly poor men, but very proud, and they shot well enough. There were two hundred of them, and they were all together just behind my Plataeans, so that the one time an enterprising Mede worked around my flank in some hedgerows, he emerged into a veritable hail of arrows and ran off, leaving two of his men in the wheat. Casualties like that, ones and twos, don't seem important when I tell a story as big as Marathon. But in skirmishes, in harassment, a dozen dead men can be as important as a lost battle. Our arrows were hitting them, and they weren't reaching us. So just before noon, their captain, whoever he was, decided that enough was enough and sent his best men to stop me. I wish I could say that I saw what was coming, but it was more luck than anything that we weren't caught naked as usual, I have to digress. Hoplites, heavy warriors, don't wander the countryside all dressed up for war. It is hot in Greece, and the aspis is heavy, as is your thorax and your helmet and your spear. Once a man has the aspis on his shoulder and a spear in his hand, his speed is cut on the march. Perhaps it is just that Greeks are lazy. I have, in fact, spent all day marching with an aspis on my shoulder. But in the old days we seldom did it. Instead, we carried our weapons and our servants, sometimes free hippaspists, sometimes slaves, carried our helmets and shields. After the cavalry tried to work around our rear, I halted the column and ordered the Plataeans to arm. That actually increased my vulnerability for a while. Imagine two thousand men on the road, just two or three abreast in no particular order. Then imagine that every second man is busy finding his shield-bearer and getting his aspis on his arm, his helmet on his head. Some men had their body armor on and others did not. Some men had additional pieces of armor, thigh armor and arm guards such as I wore. All of these were carried by servants. In my case, I wore my scale cuirass all day, but the rest of my gear was in a wicker basket on Jelon's back. I even considered changing my shoes. I had Spartan shoes on my feet, and I considered, given the difficult fields on either side of the road, changing to boots. Some men were sitting in the road, changing sandals. 
Others were stripping naked to change into a heavier chitin to wear under armor. Got the picture? Chaos. I hate to think how long we were on that road without a single spear pointing at the enemy. I aged. It is different at sea. At sea you do not engage until you are ready, but on land, especially facing cavalry or light troops, they can hit you whenever they desire it. I was the leader, and I had fucked up. I could feel it. And now, too late, I was trying to retrieve my error. It was a lesson, if you like. As soon as I had a party of men armed, I filled the road with them, regardless of their place in the phalanx. And as soon as the bulk of my men were armed, I started them filing off the road to the left, where I could see the shields of our Eubian refugees flashing among the rocks on the hillside. Our guide, the wounded runner, pointed and gestured, and my eyes were on him when the Persian cavalry came for us. We had about a third of our men formed when they galloped around the corner of the field from behind a grove of olives. They already had arrows on their bows. Their leader was out in front on a big bay horse, and as he came around the corner, he gave a whoop, leaned over, and shot. That arrow went into my shield, and the head emerged on my side, a finger's width just over my wrist where my hand entered the antilabe. Form close, I called, and I was scared, shocked silly. I had just enough nerve to tip my helmet from the back of my head over my face. Every man pressed into the center of the front rank as the shields overlapped. Where? Had they come from? I cursed my failing in not forming up earlier, and I wondered how the rest of my column was doing, and I nearly shat myself in fear. These were not Lydians with spears. These were noble Persians, well-led with discipline and murderous bow-fire, and my men were unprepared. The first hail of arrows hit our shields. A man screamed, as an arrow went into his knee above the grieve. His scream might have been my scream. They came past us close enough for us to see the markings on their horses and the embroidery on their barbarian trousers, and to feel the earth moved by four hundred hooves. The next storm of arrows broke over us like a big wave on a beach. I felt my shield lifted, moved, rocked as if hail was falling on me, and something screamed off my helmet, and I blinked away the pain. My vision was limited to the eye slit in my Corinthian, and sweat was pouring down my body. But I saw it now. The Persian commander had sprung an ambush from behind the olive grove, and I was lucky that I'd paused to form my men, or we'd already be dead. Luck. Tyche. And he had made two mistakes. He sprang his trap a little early, before my left flank was out in the field, away from the rocky wall that his horses didn't want to cross. And he went for us, the formed men, when he could have fallen like a smith's hammer on my unformed men on the road. Instead, we were trapped against the field edge with a rubble pile from an old barn on one flank, and the road full of slaves and Athenians on the other. But we'd stood our ground. It sounds easy enough. You try it. Even as his first arrows rattled against us and men fell, he learned his third error, although I was as surprised as I imagine he was. We had archers in our ranks. As the Persians swept past us, Tusser and his archers rose from within our ranks or knelt under the rims of our shields and shot. Indeed, Tusser was leaning his weight against my hips as he shot, arrow after arrow. He had no horse between his thighs, no reins to manage, and his quiver hung comfortably under his left arm, where I carry my sword in battle. And he drew and shot and drew and shot, three arrows for every one by the Persians, and his had Apollo's hand behind them. When an arrow hits a man in the phalanx, he screams and falls, and his armor makes a mournful clatter as he goes down, 
but his mates close over him, alive or dead. It is but one step to the front to fill the hole. When a horseman takes an arrow, better yet when a horse takes an arrow, it can be a disaster for a dozen other men. One horse can fall over another, and a few casualties, by ill luck or the will of the war god, can stop a charge dead, or cause the animals to flow around their target the way small boys divert a stream on a summer's day. We had fewer than three hundred men formed, but all of Tusev's archers were in our ranks, perhaps thirty men and some javelins, and they shot at least one Persian for every one of us who fell. I suspect that man for man the Persians were the finer archers, but the best archer on a horse, shooting at armoured men behind big shields, is going to lose the contest to the poorer man with his feet firm on the ground, shooting at the enormous target of a man on a horse. And Tusser was the best archer I've ever known. He was safe under my shield rim, and his arrows did not miss. He made chaos of their files, and they broke and rode away, and their red-bearded officer lay, redder now, with one of Tusser's black-fletched arrows in his throat. We spearmen played no role, except to stand and not run, and to be a living wall of wood and bronze for Tusser's archers. We didn't bloody our spears that day. The archers won that engagement for us, and gained status with us as a consequence. The Persian commander watched his best cavalry break around us, leaving a dozen of his noblemen face down in the hayfields, and he gathered the rest of his cavalry and rode away, no doubt reckoning, like a professional, that the terrain was against him and he had no reason to take a risk. He was wrong. There's more to battle than counting the odds and chances and watching the ranges of the enemy weapons. The Athenians and Plataeans were Greeks, men of the phalanx, where fights are decided not by spear fighting but by the will of the mass. To every Plataean, and to every Athenian coming late to the fight, it appeared that we were the better men, and the Persians were afraid. Not true, of course, but on such foolishness is victory made. We watched their dust cloud go, and a few fools shouted that we should follow them. But the Persians wanted us out in the open, and we were happy in among the olive groves and low ridges where they couldn't easily ride around our flanks. We let them go. In half an hour, Miltiades passed through my position. I chose to stay formed and watch the Persians, lest they fall on the rest of the column, or at least that was my decision on the spot. Miltiades went up the hill and fetched out the Obeans. I'll be honest, I was shaken. To my mind, Tusser and his archers had just saved me from a string of foolish errors. Command is different. It is not the same as serving in the front rank. I had been thinking of the wrong things at the wrong time, and I knew how close my whole force, every Plataean, had come to dying at the hands of a hundred Persians. The rescued Eubians were in poor shape. They had no archers. Few Greeks did in those days, except old-fashioned cities like Plataea, and we wouldn't have had half as many without the Milesians, and the Persian cavalry had been able to get close every day whenever they wanted. A few of the Eubians had the spirit to abuse the corpses of the dead Persians as they came down. One man told me that this was the closest he'd come to hitting one since the first day, but the rest simply stumbled off the steep rocks of their hill and begged us for water in the croaking of frogs, for they were parched and weary and had given up hope. Then we all turned on our heels and marched back to our camp, and the Persian cavalry rode away. I lost three men dead, all young Epilectoi in the front rank. Lycon took an arrow in the greave, it held, but he couldn't walk for a day from the pain. My wounded were mostly gashes to the head and neck. Sometimes arrows went deep in the phalanx and got in among the men with no helmets, skidding from head to head. 
Two men with arrows in their thighs had to be carried, and that was hot, miserable work. As soon as our scouts said that the Persian cavalry was gone, most men peeled off their armor and gave it to slaves to carry. But I wouldn't allow my epilectoi out of theirs. I was deeply shaken by the speed with which the Persian cavalry had appeared from behind the olive grove. No one grumbled this time, but it was a long walk back to camp, looking over our shoulders all the way, and blessing every hill, every stream, every rocky field that covered us. Greece is treacherous ground for horses. Praise the gods. The rescue of the Eubians may have been full of arete, and it may have pleased the gods, but it cost us in several ways, and it had disastrous consequences. First, the Eubians were spent. Of almost two thousand men who came down off that hill, fewer than two hundred stayed with the army. The rest simply went home. This is another part of being Greek that needs explaining. Even the Athenian Eubians felt that they had done their duty and more. They had faced weeks of danger and survived, and they went to Athens or returned to their farms without anyone's permission, and no one suggested otherwise. The actual Eubians, about a hundred of them, remained, mostly because their city was gone and their wives were enslaved. And they had no further reason to live. They were a silent lot. Second, the Eubians saw the Persians as invincible. It is no fault of their own. But when men have been harried and driven for weeks, beaten and beaten again, they magnify the danger and the power of the foe to increase their own sense of worth. I am an old man of war, and I have seen it many times. When they sat in our camp and told their story to crowds of Athenians, many of whom had been against this fight from the first, they spread fear like a palpable thing. They didn't mean to do it, but they did. The day after we rescued them, our army was ready to fall apart. Third, all the Persian cavalry had been sent to dog the Eubians. Datis, like any good commander. Had sent his best troops to prevent the Eubians from linking up with us. Now that we'd gained them, the Persian cavalry, mostly Sakai, to be honest, were no longer distracted. The morning after we rescued the Eubians, I combed my hair on the summit of the precinct of Heracles, sitting on a rock. When I had combed it out, Jalon braided it quickly. Two thick braids, which he wrapped around the crown of my head, as padding for my helmet. He did it better than any of my other servants or hippaspist had done, tighter and faster too. I remember that we'd just seen a raven off in the left of the sky, a poor omen, and we were wondering aloud why the gods bothered to send a bad omen. Down at the base of the hill. A big group of Athenians, mostly poor men with no armor, were cutting brush for bedding. They were in a long field, and at the far end was a stand of brush and ferns, and twenty or so men were cutting the brush and gathering bags of fern. They sang as they worked, and I remember being content, even happy, as I listened to them. The Sakai fell on them like the eagle of Zeus falling from the heavens on a rabbit. They came on horses, and they leaped the stone walls at either end of the field, cutting the men off from the camp as easily as if they were children caught stealing apples in an orchard. One brave man tried to run, and three of them chased him down, laughing. They were so close that we could see them laugh. The leader took a rope off his quiver. Whirled it around his head like a performer, and tossed it neatly over the runner. Then he turned his horse and dragged the man, screaming, over the rough ground. At my side, Tuser drew his bow. It was a long shot even for my master archer, but he drew the feathers all the way to his mouth, 
and loosed, and the arrow seemed to linger in the air forever, flying and falling. The Sakai man was riding parallel to our hill, and he didn't see the arrow, and it fell into him as if Apollo guided it. He tumbled from his horse and screamed. I hoped the man caught in the rope would rise and run, but he didn't move. I think he was already dead. The other Sakai let up a thin cry, and as one they turned and butchered the Greeks they had caught. They killed them all, twenty men lost in a few heartbeats. They ripped skin from their victims' heads and their backs the way men skin a rabbit, and they rode across our front, flourishing their ghastly prizes and screaming their thin war cries. Then they rode away. A day later, our servants were afraid even to get water from the stream. The meetings of the Strategoi were demoralizing, too. We met every morning and every evening, and some days more often. If two Strategoi began to talk and a third saw them together, he would wander over, and before you knew it, all eleven would be there. They seemed to love to talk, and they would discuss the most trivial things as seriously as they discussed endlessly the strategic options of the campaign. Firewood, worth an hour of discussion. A general pool of sentries, worth an hour of discussion. A new type of sandal for fighting, an hour. By the fourth day I was ready to scream, because what we needed to discuss was the war. The Persians, the enemy. But like the proverbial corpse at a symposium, we never seemed to discuss the options fully. I had come to the conclusion that the polymarch liked all the talk, because each day of talk made him feel useful, while postponing the moment of decision for yet another day. It was on the fourth day that Aristides exploded. If the Medes could be destroyed with talk, we would certainly triumph, he shouted. It came from nowhere, and his orator's voice carried across the summit of the camp, and all the strategoi fell silent. God's half the camp fell silent. The Athenian polymarch glared at him. It is not your turn to speak, he said. Aristides, the just man, stood his ground. This is all drivel, he said. If no one else will say it, I will. The Persians are peeling our army apart. There is dissension and fear. Our numbers are even. They have a few more men, perhaps. We must attack them and defeat them before our men follow the Obeans home. Cleotus the unlikeliest ally, agreed. We must do something about their cavalry, he said. Our men fear the horses like nothing else. Why don't we simply return to Athens and show them the strength of our walls? Leontus asked. He was the most brazen of the anti-war Strategoi, a handsome man who had the reputation of being a servant of the Alcmeonids. I hear so much about how we should fight a battle. Are you fools? He grinned. Datis has a few thousand men more than we have, and a force of cavalry we can never hope to match. If we pack and march away in the night, he'll burn some olive groves and go home. He hasn't the time to lay siege to Athens. He looked around. Many of the strategoi agreed with him. I had to admit that he had a point and I loathed him politically. Miltiades brought us here to save the Eubians, he went on, and look what we saved, a few beaten men. The assembly never meant for us to fight Persia. Let's gather the army and have a vote. I'll wager gold against silver that they vote to go home and defend the walls, and who can blame them? But arrogant men often overreach. I've done it a few times myself, and I know. He carried on when he ought to have been silent. You think you have an army? We have nothing. There aren't enough gentlemen to fight any one of their regiments. And the rest of these men are chaff, useless mouths. 
The Plataeans will vanish at the first onset, bumpkins. A political stunt by Miltiades to make the rest of you credulous fools feel as if we have allies. The best men of Euboea didn't stop the Medes for ten days, and their own lower orders sold the town to the enemy. Leontus might have carried the hour if he'd shut up before he offended every man standing there. Aristides gave me the slightest of smiles and nodded his head. He was encouraging me to speak. In fact, he was egging me on. Are you bought and paid for? I asked. Leontus whirled, face red. You lie, I added. I wasn't angry, but I put on a good, angry face. I knew what politics required. If I humiliated Leontus, immediately and publicly, his suggestions would wither and die on the vine. My men stood and faced the Persian cavalry. You lie when you say we will run. But since the Persians have bought you, you are paid to say such things. I walked over to him. Deadly Arimnestos, killer of men. Leontus was not, in fact, a coward. This is insane, he said. I only say what... How much gold have the Medes paid you? I roared. He flinched. He only flinched from my bellow. But the men in the circle thought that he looked guilty. And there was a murmur. We're going to be massacred, he shouted and left the meeting in a swirl of his cloak. That helped morale, I can tell you. The next day, the fifth since the Persians landed, I sent my servants down to the stream in the morning to draw water, with all of Tusser's men concealed in the rough ground at the foot of the hill. But the Sakai had not been the eyes and ears of the Persian Empire for nothing. A dozen horsemen came up, looked at the Plataean servants in the stream, and rode away. They smelled a rat. Such is war. At the other end of the line, Miltiades tried a similar stunt, sending a forage party far out into the fields near the beach to gather hay and cut standing wheat, and laying an ambush with his old soldiers. But the Mede cavalry looked it over, and rode away. In the centre, emboldened by our success, the city men of two tribes went down the hill with sickles to gather wheat. Most men had eaten all the food they had brought, and fear of the Persian cavalry was keeping supplies from reaching us. The Sakai fell on them in full view of the army, killed or wounded fifty, and dragged twenty of them off into slavery. In an Athenian tribe of a thousand men, the loss of fifty was considerable. At the next meeting, Miltiades finally spoke. Many men disliked him and feared his pretensions. He made little secret of his intention to make himself tyrant. Generally, he did best for the cause of the war by saying little. But that evening he had had enough. War is not a game for children, he said bitterly. He had their attention right enough. Demosthenes, your men went down the hill like fools. We only did what you did, Demosthenes shouted. Aristides shook his head. You don't have a clue, do you? You don't understand because you've never made war. He crossed his arms. This is not a day of battle with Aegina. This is not a war of Greeks with Greeks. The Plataeans and Miltiades' men laid ambushes and had reinforcements ready. We call this covering our foragers. And the Sakai and the Medes and the Persians, they have made war too. They saw little things, a broken bush, a line of footprints in tall grass, and they knew the men were covered and let them be. But in the center you took no precautions. Leontus is right, Demosthenes said. They are better men than us and we will all be killed. I am not afraid of your Plataean thug, Miltiades. No one can accuse me of taking Persian gold. They are better at this 
skulking manner of war than we are. I want to demand a vote right now to go back to the city. Aristides' voice was calm and strong. You are afraid, and like a schoolboy caught in a lie, you don't wish to admit that you made an error. So better that we abandon the campaign and retreat to the city than face the Medes, eh? Or is it that you'd rather abandon the campaign than admit you need to ask the rest of us how to make war? Vote! Demostocles demanded. And fuck you, you pompous prick. I was killing men with my spear when you were shitting green. Too bad, I said. If you'd learned anything about war, you'd be a better strategos. I held up my hand to silence him. Listen, I'm not pissing on you. When we went after the Eubians, I almost lost my whole phalanx. Why? Because I had no idea how fast the cavalry could come at me. Our servants still had our shields. Ares, it could have been a disaster. I shrugged, and I've been at war since I was seventeen. Fighting the Persians is not like any other war. We have to roll with the punches and learn from mistakes, the way a good Pankrationist does when he fights a bigger man, eh? It was always rewarding to say something sensible and have men like Aristides give me that look, the look that indicated that in the main they thought me a mindless brute. Demostocles looked stunned that I'd admitted to failing. It took the wind out of his sails and left him speechless. Concession and apology can be like that. We need a concerted foraging strategy. I said, every taxis cannot go on its own, and I think we need to contest the plane with them, even if it costs us. We need to go down there and show them who owns these fields, man to man. If we let their cavalry ride where they please, eventually they will beat us. Well, that's how it seems to me. The polymarch gave me a long look, as if up until then he'd thought me a fool. Perhaps he had. I was, after all, Arimnestos, the killer of men, not Arimnestos, the tactician. Miltiades came forward again. I have a plan, he said. I think we need to attack their cavalry and put it out of the war. Many voices spoke up then, and not all of them were strategoi. The problem of the Greeks is that we all like to talk, and all the famous men came to the meetings of the strategoi, whether they held rank or not. Themistocles was a strategos, but Sophanes was not, and he attended anyway. Simon, Miltiades' eldest, held no rank, and he was always there and seemed to feel freer to speak than his father, on and on. So we had closer to a hundred men than eleven. The many voices shouted Miltiades down. Leontus began urging a vote on returning to Athens. Of the hundred men standing there by the altar, the vast majority were with Leontus. What I couldn't tell was how many of the strategoi were with Leontus and Demostocles. But the voices calling for the vote were the loudest. Callimachus stepped forward and blew the horn at his hip, and the Athenians grew quieter. We will vote on the idea of returning to the city, he said. Uproar. We will vote in the morning, he said. This meeting is adjourned. Miltiades followed him as he walked away to his tent. A dozen other men went to follow them, and Aristides and I tried to stop them by forcing them to face us and debate the whole issue. We kept them there several minutes, and Miltiades was gone. Somewhere in there I caught Aristides' eye. He gave a small shake of his head. He thought we'd had it. So did I. I went straight back to my camp and found my brother-in-law, Adidomineus, and I took them off into our little stand of cypress trees. If the army breaks up, we need to plan our own retreat. I said, Ares Dick, Idomineus said. 
You must be joking, Lord. Or is it Lardy again? I shook my head. Aristides thinks they'll vote to retreat to Athens in the morning. And there will be immediate desertions. He paints a bleak picture, lads. I shrugged. We're a long way from home. And if there is a traitor... Idomeneus shook his head. We're all right, he said. Keep the archers safe, head for the hills, and walk the high ground all the way home. Could take a while, but we'll live. What do we eat? Drink? I asked. His strategy was the one I liked, too, but it was fraught with danger. Steal what we can. Hunt when we can. Idomeneus shook his head. It will suck, that's for sure, Lord. But the boys will get it done. Antigonus looked at the speaker's vema in the middle of the encampment. If what you say is really true, he said, we should be gone in the morning. Then men will say we deserted, I said. Antigonus shrugged. Will we care? If these bastards run for Athens, the Persians will eat them, and someone in the city will sell it out just the way the Eubians were sold, and the Ionians. And it won't be a Thetis, Idomeneus added. I heard that bastard at your little meeting, Lord. Calcius was betrayed by an aristocrat. I nodded. I heard that too. Doesn't matter, though. Antigonus, what's your point? He frowned and looked at the ground. It's not a very glorious thought, he admitted. But if Athens is going down, we don't need to give a shit about what they think of us. Our duty is to get our people home alive. It made sense. He was a good man, my brother-in-law. If we cut and run before the Athenians break up, Idomeneus said with his terrible, callous practicality, their cavalry will waste a day or two killing Athenians and we'll never see them. Lord, it could save many men. Then he reverted to form. Seems a horrible waste, though. He grinned. Waste? I asked. This should be the most glorious battle of our time, Idomeneus said. If these fuckheads waste it, I'll go and fight for Persia. I'll never forgive them. Get the boys ready to march, without getting them ready to march. Tell them we might try a raid on their foragers tomorrow, and there'll be a day in the field. I was keeping my options open. I went and walked through the camp, the whole camp. It was like the camps of the East Greeks before Lade. Worse, in a way, because at every fire men urged others to go home, to cut and run. I thought they were cowards, and then I realized that, in effect, I'd just done the same. Why can't Greeks get along? Why can't they maintain a common goal? We lost Lade when the Samians sailed away and abandoned us for the greed of a few men. I saw Marathon going the same way, and I wanted to weep. It was almost dark when Paramanos found me. You move too fast, he said. Miltiades wants you. That was like the old days. I knew what he would want. He'd want the Plataeans to join with his men, the professionals, in covering the retreat of the army. I'd already thought it through. I was about to tell my own lord, a man to whom I owed a great deal, to sod off. I wasn't losing any Plataeans to save Athens. That's how bad things were that night. Miltiades had a tent. Few men did in those days. Greece is kind to soldiers, and it seldom rains. But Miltiades had fought everywhere, and he had a magnificent tent. Another reason for men to hate him. If they needed a reason, of course. I went in, and a slave handed me a big cup of wine. Miltiades was wearing a simple dark chiton and had boots on. I need you and twenty of your best men, he said. 
That caught me by surprise. What for? I asked. We're going to raid the Persian camp, he said. It's the only hope we have. I convinced Callimachus to put off the vote until tomorrow night. He fears treason in the city just as much as I do. He's not a fool. He's just cautious. Miltiades drank some wine. Listen, Philippides, the herald, just came in from the mountains. The Spartans haven't marched yet. It'll be five days, at least, before we can expect them. But they are coming. Aristides came in through the beaded door. He was wearing plain leather armor. They want us to die, he said. Miltiades shrugged. They're pious men, our Lacedaemonian friends. They have a festival. He shrugged. To be honest, I doubt I'd hurry to save Sparta from the Medes either. But when Pheidippides' news is known, the last heart will go out of the army. Five days is too long. We have to strike. I'm ready, Aristides said. Adamnestos hasn't heard the plan, Miltiades said. He glanced at me. Will you do it? Do what? I asked. We need a demonstration in front of the Persians by men who can fight or run in the dark. He shrugged. I can give you all the Athenian archers to go with you. I wouldn't sacrifice you, he said, as if reading my mind. Where will you be? I asked. But I was already smiling, because by all the gods I saw the whole plan as neatly as if it was stitched into leather. The horses. Told you he was smarter than he looked, Mithiades said. If we pull this off, the army will stay, Aristides said. And if we fuck it up, we'll be dead, Mithiades said. He shrugged. I can't take any more officers' meetings. I'll drink to that, I said. I can get a hundred men. Then take a hundred, Miltiades said. The more you take, the more noise you'll make. What can you do there? I remember making a face. I remember laughing. Have you noted that while we sit here doing nothing, the Persians sit there doing nothing? I said. They both nodded. I raised my cup and poured a libation. Ares, Zeus's least favoured child, if they fear us at all, and they must, then they have to fear a night attack. I grinned. So let's feed them one. I'll go for their ships. Ever been out for a walk at night? Ever been out for a walk outside the city? As joyously as we prepared to make our raid, the truth was that none of us had ever been in a night attack. There's a reason why men don't make night attacks on land. At sea it's different. At sea there's always a little light, and not much to bump into if you steer badly. But on land... I roused my epilectoi as soon as I got back, but just preparing them to march took me too much time. By the time I'd led them to the base of the hill and out into the fields, the moon was high, and we were late. The Athenian archers were supposed to meet us opposite their camp, which turned out to be far too vague a direction on a dark night. I looked for them for as long as my heart could take it. Miltiades was long gone, heading up into the hills to get around the marsh and the Persian camp, and I needed to make noise to keep the enemy focused on me. I was taking too long. Everything was taking too long. I gave up on the Athenian archers when I saw how far the moon had moved across the sky. Where the fuck are they? I hissed at Tuser when I got back to my own men. The archer shrugged. So we set off across the fields in the middle watch of the night, an hour late for our plan and moving too fast. We made a great deal of noise. The hedgerows, which seemed to run straight by day, were like the maze of the Minotaur by night. I'd follow one for a distance and then realize that I'd gone close to the sea, 
rather than closer to the enemy, and time was passing. I could all but hear Clotho's shears trimming the wick of Miltiades' life. When the Pleiades were high in the sky, I took my bearings like a sailor, found the North Star and realized that again I was leading the long file of my men away from our camp and towards the sea, and not closer to the enemy encampment. Resolutely I put my right shoulder to the sound of the sea, close now, and searched the next wall for a gate. I crossed, the rest of the men stumbling behind me and making enough noise for an army, which I guess was the idea, and found myself walking across a hayfield in the full light of the moon towards the sea. Of course, the beach curves radically in some places, and I'd simply missed my mark. Again. My heart was pounding. My anxiety had reached a lethal intensity. My helmet burned my head, and I was sweating through my armor, and we still weren't within long bowshot of the enemy. Idomineus came up beside me. You thinking we should go on the beach? He asked. No, I said, because there was no cover at all on the beach. We'd be seen two stardis away, even at night. Of course, even as I thought that, I realized that being seen two stardis away might be a fine thing. Actually, yes, I said. We're going along the beach. Idomineus laughed. Good, I was worried you were lost. I chuckled. I remember the falsity of my laugh, how it caught in my throat. When you are a fearless leader, it is important to appear fearless and knowledgeable. I thought of all the stupid things I'd seen other leaders do. Now I knew why they did it. Somehow command on land was not like command at sea. Too many choices, perhaps. Maybe it's just that your men can simply walk away if they lose trust in you. Down to the beach. As soon as we reached the beach, I could see the enemy camp, the ships drawn up as thickly as fleas on a dog, and the fires inland from the beach all the way past the marsh to the hills. We seemed incredibly close, although in reality we were five long studies from the ships, but because of the curve of the beach, we were looking at the ships across the water, and they were close. As soon as we were down the dune, I hissed the order to form front by files. We were strung out, but the boys were fast, and probably as eager to get formed up, to feel the comfort of the next man's shield, as I was to get them formed. Still, no alarm, so we moved forward. Sand filled my sandals, and I had to remind myself that the beach was, despite the labor, easier on me and easier on the lads than trying to cross the farms of the Marathon Plain. After two studies we seemed to be level with the first Persian ships, and still there was no alarm. I tried to reassure myself that if Miltiades were attacking, I'd hear something from him. The hills were visible as a loom of dark against the paler darkness of the sky to the north and west. Another study and the ships were so close that it seemed we could swim to them. We were just two studies, less, I think, from the ships that were beached, when a man on one of the anchored ships, a Greek, called out, asking who we were, Men, I responded, but in Persian. What? he asked, his voice echoing over the water. Men, I called back again, this time in Greek, and that satisfied him. By such threads do empires hang. Now we were running, stumbling more like through the dark. I had a new notion that I'd put fire into some of their ships, I'd done it before, at Lade, and it had done the trick, and there were plenty of fires near the ships. Less than a study. No alarm. How the gods must have laughed. We came to the first fires, a line of blazes long since burned down to coals, and my men broke ranks and began to slaughter the oarsmen at the fires without my orders. The whole situation slipped away from me in those moments, 
One second, I had a column of trained warriors running through the dark, and the next there were screams, and all my men had gone. Or oh, that's how it seemed to me. To my mind, killing the oarsmen was a complete waste of time. But as a diversion, it did well enough. The problem was that there were about a hundred of us, and almost sixty thousand oarsmen. With the best will in the world, my men couldn't make a dent in them. And then they began to fight back. It was chaos on the beach, and Tartarus too. Arrows falling from the sky as the Medes who had camped just to the north shot into the confusion, and the thousands of oarsmen, unable to believe there were so few of us, fell on each other. Phoenicians against Cilicians, Greeks against Egyptians. I pulled Idomeneus out of the fighting and dragged him clear, the way you pull a dog out of a fight. Order the rally, I remember shouting at him. He had a horn, and I did not. He looked at me with dull, lust-filled eyes. I was fighting, he said reproachfully. Order the rally, I said again. He lifted the horn and sounded three long blasts. All along the beach men heard it. Some understood, and some were lost in the fog of combat. I put my spear in the gut of a man with no shield. I had to assume in the dark that anyone without a shield was one of theirs, and ran back a few paces. Plataea, on me! I roared, again and again. Men came to me in dribs and drabs, some bringing their little swirl of combat with them, some alone. It took forever. Everything takes forever in the dark. Idomeneus sounded the horn again and again later, and still I had fewer than half of my men, my picked best armoured men. I could not afford to leave them on the beach. The trouble, my fault, was that I had not set a rally point or explained to them what I wanted after we hit the enemy. I had to trust that they would know the signal from the hunting expeditions. In the end, most did, but men died because I didn't know enough to plan the recall as part of the attack. Another lesson learned at Bloody Marathon. Every time we blew the rally, we ran back down the beach a little farther from the ships. By the time I had eighty men, perhaps a few more, we were a starter from the enemy. We should have been clear. We weren't. We had taken too long, far too long. And the sun was coming up in the east, still only a line of grey-pink out over the ocean towards Zubia. But it was going to rise like the hand of doom. We were just eighty men, caught a long way from our camp. I cursed and killed a man. By then we were fighting Medes, real soldiers. They weren't swarming us, but their braver souls started to come in close, while others shot at us from a distance. The light was still bad, their bowstrings were damp, and Teuser and his lads were shooting back, so we were relatively unscathed. But I could see better with every passing minute, and that meant that they could too. I was in the centre of my own line. Nothing for it. We needed a miracle. Ready to charge! I called out. There was that reassuring sound as every man closed a little to the centre, and the shields tapped together. Perhaps you've heard it in a drill. It is a sound that always gives you heart, that rattle. It means your friends are still together, still in good order, still with enough heart to fight. I took a deep breath. We were fighting Medes. They couldn't understand me. When I say charge, I bellowed as loud as my throat and lungs could manage. You go fifty paces forward, turn and run as if the hound Kerberos was at your heels. Hear me, Plataeans! There was a cry, something like a war cry, something like a sigh. Charge, I called. And we went at them. The Medes were ready for it. They broke as soon as they saw us come, and only our boldest and fastest caught any of them. I certainly didn't. 
The mead I had my eye on vanished into the near dark of the bushes up the beach. Idomineus, bless him, sounded a single blast as I hit my forty-seventh stride, and we turned together like a figure in the Pyrrhici, which it is, and ran. We were off down that beach like frightened boys chased by an angry parent, and every man understood that we had to break contact now or die when the sun rose. But Persians have good soldiers too. Somewhere in the scrub was an officer who knew his business, and within seconds of us running, they were chasing us, and arrows began to fall. Then it was every man for himself. Some of my boys cut inland, across country. A few ditched their shields. Most didn't. When archers are shooting you, the last thing you want to give up is your shield. I stuck to the beach, and most of the Medes followed, worse luck. Had they stayed a little longer, run away from our false charge a little further, we might have made a clean exit, but we were not so lucky. After a few minutes of running, I looked back, and they were gaining. After all, they had light body armor, which most of them were not wearing anyway, as they'd been awakened by our attack. They had neither helmets nor greaves. They were cautious, but they were getting the measure of us. An arrow hit the middle of the back of the yoke of my armor. Thanks to Ares' hand, it turned on the two layers of bronze. But the power knocked me flat. As I rose, another arrow hit the same place. Then another glanced off my shield. Heavy arrows. And another rang on my helmet, and I thought, Fuck, this is it. I got my feet under me and turned. One of the Medes fell to the beach, his life leaking out between his fingers as he grabbed at the shaft embedded in his guts. Tuser was right at my shoulder, shooting calmly. One, two, and men fell. Turn a little left, he said. I did, and two arrows hit the face of my shield, and he shot back. Zip, pause, zip, with every shot. A mead fell, another arrow into my shield, but now the meads were scrambling for cover. Tuser dropped four right there, coughing their lungs out in the sand. Run, I said. I gave him three steps while I stayed, another arrow off the top of my helmet, and then I turned and ran. My breath was coming like a horse's after a gallop. I sucked in air the way a drunkard sucks wine, and my legs burned as if I'd run ten stadies. The wound Archilogos had given me in the fall of Miletus had a curious numbness to it against the pain of all my other muscles, and sweat rolled down my forehead and into my eyes. The light was growing. I was running down a beach that was well enough lit for target practice, and I was going more and more slowly. Ares, it makes me want to spit sand to remember it, fleeing like a coward and knowing, knowing that in a few moments I would be dead anyway. When it is your last, when all is lost, it doesn't matter whether you were a demonstration or a deception or a last stand, friends. No one worth a shit wants to die with his back to the foe. So I turned. An arrow meant for my back screamed off the face of my shield. I meant to take one with me, but I was out of everything. The daemon had no more to give me, and I, the great fighter of the Plataeans, slumped down behind my shield. I got smaller and smaller as the arrows thudded in, but I could breathe. And I did. I panted like a dog, and I couldn't think of anything, and arrows fell on my shield like hail on a good crop. Twice arrowheads blew right through the face of my aspies. Oh, children. That hour was dark. When I had my breath back, I knew it was just a matter of how I chose to die. I could make it last, down under the rim of my aspies, until they got a man into the brush to my left who could shoot me in the hip or the arse. No laughing matter. I could try to turn again, but to Hades with that, my legs were gone. It seemed to me that the best course was to attack them. It would get the whole thing over with the quickest, and if anyone watched me, 
if there was a single bard left in Greece to sing after this debacle, at least men would say that Arimnestos died with his face to the foe. I took a dozen more breaths, rationing them, taking the air in deep. Then I allowed myself five more, the margin of life and death, five breaths. Arrows continued to slam into the face of my shield. On the edge of the fifth, I rose to my feet. I sneaked a last glance down the beach behind me, and my heart leaped with joy. It was empty. My men had got away. In some situations, nothing would be grimmer than to die alone, but in this one, it filled me with power. Being alone made me feel less a failure, more a hero. I leaned forward into the arrow storm, summoned up power in my legs I didn't think I had, and charged. Anyone asleep? Ah, you flinched, Tugater. You think perhaps I died there, eh? Pour me a little more wine, lad. Yes, I charged. As soon as I got my face over the rim of my aspies, I could see that they were well bunched up, about fifty stardis away. That's why so few arrows missed, I can tell you. I remembered running with you, Alcidas, at the fight in the pass. Here, like there, my feet crunched on gravel. I kept my shield up, and the arrows fell on it like snow on a mountain. And then they stopped. There were screams, screams of pain, and screams of terror. I lowered my aspis a finger's breadth and peered forward through the pre-dawn murk, the sweat, the slits of my helmet. The meads were falling. A dozen of them were down, and the rest were scattering. When I reached them, alive, of course, you daft woman, not a man was alive, and they looked like porcupines for the arrows in them. I turned away from rosy-fingered dawn and the pale sea. There were men coming out of the bush, a hundred men with bows. The Athenian archers had found me. I laughed. I mean, what in Hades can you do but laugh? When you write this, I suppose you'll leave out all the little men, the archers and peltastai. And when I say little, I mean small in the eyes of the great. But they were good men, as you'll see, the psiloi, the stripped men who wear no armor. This is the story of the little men, and you can ignore what happened next if you wish. But it had more effect on the battle than most of the heavily armed men and the gentry would ever want to admit. The archers were elated. They'd saved a famous hero and laid waste to the Medes. And I knew that as long as those men lived in their little houses and their shacks on the flank of the Acropolis, they'd tell and retell that story in their wine shops, at the edge of the Agora, in the bread stalls. Several of them, the boldest, sprinted down the beach and tore a souvenir loose from the huddle of corpses. The first man to pass me shot me a grin. You alive, boss? he asked as he ran by. I had fallen to one knee. I gave him a smile, got to my feet, and wandered after him. In the distance the Medes began to rally. Did I mention that they were first-rate soldiers? just lost half their numbers in an ambush, and they were coming back. I hate any man who says the Medes and Persians were cowards. The Medes on the sand were wearing gold and silver, professional soldiers wearing their pay. The Athenian archers were poor men, and my friend, the first who passed me, whooped when he reached the bodies. But he was a public-spirited man, and he held something aloft, that flashed in the new sun, and he shouted, Gold! And the rest of the archers came pouring out of the scrub at the edge of the beach, some men jumping down the bluffs and sand dunes. They stripped those corpses like men who knew their way around a corpse. I cast no aspersions, but by the time I caught up with them, there was nothing left but skin, gristle, and bone. 
Better look to your bows, lads, I said, pointing down the beach. I stepped forward and fielded an arrow that might have hit a man, scooping it on the face of my shield, and the muscles in my shield arm protested hard. Lad, my arse, an older man said, but he grinned. He had thick arms and heavy shoulders. An oarsman, I suspected. You're that platoon, then? I... I am, I said. Then I put some iron in my voice. Bows! I shouted. Most men jump when I say jump. The archers did. Who's the master archer, then? I asked. After most of them had loosed a couple of arrows with no effect beyond driving the meads back up the beach, the older man turned to me again. With the other half of the boys, they went for the center of the camp. We couldn't find you, and kept getting lost, so I made for the beach. He gave a lopsided grin. I'm a sailor, or was. Beaches make sense to me. I had to laugh. We need to get out of here, I said. That's sense, too. We've had our lick at the Persians. He looked around, and we've got whatever they brought. He called to the men by the bodies. Got all the bows, all their quivers, arrows. To me, he said, all their kits better than ours, better bows by far. I know, I said. Give me a Persian bow any time, he said, flourishing his own. These aren't Persians, I said. I pointed at the low felt hats and boots. They're Medes, a subject people of the Persians. Similar, but not the same. They wear less armor. Sakai are different again. Bigger beards, more leather, and better bows. Ain't you the sophist, though? The former sailor held out his arm. Leonestes of Piraeus. Arrows began to drop all around us. Let's run, I said. We did. After a few hundred strides, they had to carry me. I was mortified, to say the least. One young sprig took my aspies, and another peeled off my helmet. We left the beach when it began to angle away from our camp, and we ran inland. It was easier in daylight. I could see the line of hills and mountains at the far edge of the plain, and the rising ground that marked the shrine and sanctuary of Heracles. As soon as we left the beach... We lost the Medes. I think they'd finally reached the end of their enthusiasm. My Plataeans must have put down twenty of them, perhaps as many as fifty. It's never good when armoured men face unarmoured. And then the ambush by the archers probably dropped at least another thirty. Fifty dead is more like a bad day's battle than a couple of skirmishes before breakfast. The Medes retired to lick their wounds. We carried on across the hay fields and wheat fields and fallow barley fields, jumping stone walls and avoiding hedgerows. We were about halfway to the sanctuary of Heracles when I felt the ground moving. I needed to stop. My lungs were white hot with pain. Other men must have felt the same. As soon as my group stopped, all of them did. The feeling that the earth was trembling increased. I looked around and saw the dust. Cavalry! I panted. Into the brush! To our right was a fallow field with low stone walls and patches of jasmine and other low bushes. It was also full of rocks. We piled in in no particular order. Get to the wall! This one! You! Stand there! Bows up! That was me. The orders flowed out of me as if I was channeling the power of Ares. Leonestes joined me. Form a line. Get your ass to that wall, boy. Bows up, you heard the man. Get a shaft on the string, you whore, son. The cavalry was almost on us. But as is so often the case on a real battlefield, they hadn't seen us. They had other prey. The first volley will win or lose this, I said. My voice was calm. I remember how all the fear of the night raid had been replaced by my usual steady confidence. Why? Because in the dark I had no idea what I was doing, did I? Out here it was just a ship fight on land. Men on the flank of the galloping cavalry saw us, of course. 
but far too late to make any change of direction for the mass. But if Miltiades had raided the horses, he hadn't had much effect, I remember thinking to myself. I glanced at Leonestes, because he was taking so long to give the order that I wondered if he was waiting for me to give it. He winked, turned his head to the enemy, raised his bow. Loose, he roared. Fast as you can, boys! The next shafts rose while the first flight were in the air, rose and fell, and a third volley came up, far more ragged than the first two. Some of the Athenian archers were little more than gutter snipes with bows, while others had fine weapons and plenty of training, probably archers from ships. So among a hundred archers there were maybe twenty real killers, another fifty halfway decent archers, and thirty kids and makeweights. Same in the phalanx, really. The arrows fell on the cavalry, and they evaporated. I remember that when I was a child, snow fell on the farm, and then the weather changed and the sun came out, hot as hot, and the snow went straight to the heavens without melting. The cavalry went like that, a brief interval of thrashing horse terror, all hooves and blood, and some arrows coming back at me. A man took one and died just an arm's length from me, and then they were gone, out of our range and rallying. That fast. They slipped from their horses, adjusted their quivers, and came at us. A couple of dozen began riding for our right flank, the flank closest to the sea. They did this so fast that I think they must have practiced it. For the first time I understood the fear the men of Eubea had for the Persians. These were real Persians. High caps, scale shirts, beautiful enameled bows... I ran across the ground to the men we'd just killed. The horses were still screaming. Six. Our brilliant little improvised ambush had put down only six men. I picked up two bows, scooped the big Persian quivers off their horses while arrows decorated the ground around me, and ran back towards the thin line of Athenians. I got a fine bow, wood so brown that it seemed purple, or perhaps that was dye and horn on the inside face of the bow with sinew in between. There was gold work on the man's quiver, and a line of gold at the knocks on the bow. Anyone who doesn't have a Persian bow, get back! Leonestes shouted. Way the fuck back, boys! A hundred paces! The dismounted Persians in front of us, about fifty of them, walked confidently forward. Even as I watched, they stopped. Most of them planted arrows in the ground for easy shooting. The cavalry, reaching around our right flank, was making heavy going of it. They'd found the tangle of walls and hedgerows. Some of the younger Athenians began to drop shafts on them as if it was sport. It's always easier to be a hero when the enemy can't shoot back, I find. The Persians to our front weren't in any hurry. The cavalry gave up on our right flank. A poor, hasty decision, and just the kind of thing that happens in war. They got low on their horses' necks and rode across our front, and one of our archers with a Persian bow hounded a horseman as they crossed us, heading for our left flank, closer to the hills and the camp. In war, people make mistakes, just as they do in peace. A few minutes ago, these self-same Persians had been chasing someone across our right flank. We'd put a stop to that, and in the to and fro of combat, our Persian adversaries had forgotten their original foes. The cavalry rode hard to get around our left, and then suddenly they were fleeing, and they had riderless horses, and there were men behind them throwing spears, and other men with armour running at them. This transformed our fight. One moment the Persians were exchanging slow, careful shafts with our best archers, and the next they were running to get their mounts before our friends on the left captured the lot. It was close, but the Persians won the race and rode away. They rode about a stade, pulled up and were hit by an invisible hand that plucked a couple of them from their mounts and made all the horses scream. Slingers, only a dozen of them, as I later learned, 
But that was the final straw for the Persians, and they raced for their camp. That's the part of the fighting that I saw. I stayed out there with the archers for an hour or more, and men came past us, little men, as I say, dozens of them with javelins and bows and slings, and a few with nothing but a sack of rocks. No one will ever fully explain that morning. Word went out that Miltiades was in trouble, I guess, or Themistocles asked them to go out and support the archers, who knows. It wasn't part of any master plan, that much I know. However it came about, a couple of thousand Greek freedmen and light-armed men, men too poor to have a panoply and fight in the phalanx, but citizens too proud to abandon Greece, flooded the fields and hedgerows and stone walls. I estimate that with the Athenian archers added in, they might have killed three hundred of the enemy. Nothing, you might say. Nor was there any glory to it. When you are naked and have no weapon but a bag of rocks, you don't go walking out in the open. No, you crawl along hedgerows and share the stone walls with the foxes and the tortoises, too. But the Persians and their allies simply didn't have a horde of light-armed men to keep our light-armed men at bay, and they couldn't afford the steady casualties it would have taken to clear the field. And our little men made those fields a nightmare. As the morning wore on, our light-armed began to take losses. If they were too bold in their little groups, the enemy would cut them off and slaughter them. All told, I would bet that if the gods made a count, then the barbarians actually killed more Greeks than we killed barbarians that day. But again, as I keep saying, war is not about numbers. War is about feelings, emotions, fatigue, joy, terror. I got up the hill to our camp and was thronged by men who had to clasp my hand or slap my back. We lost you. Idomeneus was weeping. Oh, Lord, I am ashamed. I shook my head. Who would not be delighted by this display of loyalty? Theusser had it the worst. I was right at your shoulder, Lord. He said, clearly unhappy. And then I found that I was by another scaled shirt, and it was Idomeneus. I'd lost you in the dark. All dirt comes out in a good wash, I said. How many did we lose? Idomineus shook his head. Too many, Lord. Almost twenty, and your brother-in-law, and Ajax, and Epistocles, and Penelaos. Ares, that hurt. Not Epistocles. His loss was Plataea's gain. But the rest. Pen would kill me for losing her husband. And Penelaos... Maybe they'll come in, Tusser said. You did. I lay down, my spirits low. It always happens after a fight. But this was worse. I hadn't done anything except get my men lost. I had scarcely bloodied my spear. But I'd lost twenty of my best, irreplaceable men with heavy armor and fighting skills. Ajax was as good a spearman as I was, or he had been. I was lying in the shade, feeling bad, when Miltiades came. You're alive, then, he said. Praise the gods. That made me smile, because Miltiades so seldom evoked the gods. Not in that voice. I'm alive, I said, and unwounded, but I lost a lot of men. He still had his shield on his shoulder. You can reach a point of exhaustion where you simply forget to strip Kit off. In fact, I was lying in my scale corslet. I clambered to my feet to embrace him. He was looking beyond me, back towards my camp. I never got near their horses, he said in disgust. We waited for your diversion, and when it came, we struck whatever was nearest. He gave me a grim smile. I missed their horse lines in the dark, and we were in among the Sakai. We killed a few, I suppose. I had never seen Miltiades so down. 
And Aristides? I asked. I was suddenly struck with fear. What if Aristides was dead? He made it to the horse lines, Miltiades said bitterly, but accomplished nothing and lost twenty hoplites getting away. He may have killed twenty of their horses, but he lives. Miltiades nodded heavily. He lives. He shrugged. It is chaos out in that field. Half the hoplites will have lost their shield-bearers before this debacle is over. Better if we'd fought a field battle. He stared at the ground. How did it go so wrong? I had my canteen and I poured him a cup of water, and he dropped his shield and sat heavily. He had a gash on his leg. He wasn't wearing greaves. I washed his leg myself, and when Jelon came up, I sent him for an old chiton I could rip to shreds for wrapping. I didn't want him to see that Miltiades was weeping. You can see from the hindsight of forty years that all was not lost. But trust me, Thugater, when Miltiades sat on his aspis and wept, I felt like joining him. We had lost many good men, and to our minds, schooled in the war of the phalanx, we had accomplished nothing. We had not robbed the Persians of their cavalry, and we had not put heart into the phalanx with a bloodless victory. But while Miltiades wept, the light armed started coming in from the fields, and the barbarians did nothing to stop them. Indeed, had I gone to the edge of the field, I'd have seen something that five thousand other Greeks saw. A stupid act of bravado that changed everything. One of the groups of Psiloi had crawled quite close to the Persian camp and found no one to fight, so they grew bored. Before they could crawl back, one boy leaped up on a stone wall in full view of both armies, and bared his behind at the Persians, sitting on their horses by their camp. He made lewd gestures, and waved, and fanned his buttocks. The Persian cavalry sat tight. Everyone saw this exchange, everyone but Miltiades and me, of course, and in those moments our light-armed felt their power, the barbarians felt their power. Every thrown rock made our boys bolder, and every riderless horse made the Persians more afraid. Before I limped back to camp, with my aspis on my shoulder and my helmet on the back of my head, we owned the fields of Marathon from the mountains to the sea, although I didn't know it yet, and not because of our gentry and our hoplites. It is funny, is it not? We went to rescue the Eubians, and in succeeding we almost wrecked our army. And then, to retrieve that error, we mounted the raid on the Persian camp. We all got lost in the dark and accomplished nothing. But as a consequence of our intention, the little men came to our rescue and flooded the plain with stones and arrows, and the barbarians felt defeated. Best of all, the elated little men came up the hill to the camp and bragged of their stone-throwing victories to their masters, the hoplites. Shame is a powerful tonic with Greeks. So is competition and emulation. And no gentleman wants to face the idea that his servant may be the better man, eh? That was the day of the little men. Before it dawned, we were on the edge of defeat. After it, we had enough votes to stand our ground. And that, in many cases, was the margin. Listen, then. This is the part you came for. The Battle of Marathon. But remember that we only stood our ground because the little men won it for us. Wine for all of them, boys. The first sign of change came while Miltiades was drying his eyes and restoring his demeanor. I had bound his leg. 
and he was using a scrap of my old chiton to wash his face. My brother-in-law walked up as if his appearance were nothing extraordinary. I wrapped him in an embrace that he still remembers, I'd wager. He looked sheepish. We got lost, he said. That made me laugh. And laughter helps, too. I think that was the turning point. Antigonus came in with seven of our missing men, not a wound on them. They'd gone to ground at the break of day, but as our psiloi gradually drove the barbarians off the fields, his little party got bolder and managed to move from field to field. They'd even kept their shields. Ajax came in without his aspis, and with a serious wound in his thigh, carried by a trio of Athenian freedmen, who asked for payment. Stands to reason, don't it, Lord? We gave up loot in a Gary your friend, eh? I could barely understand the man, but I gave him a silver owl, and another to each of his friends, and then I got Miltiades to send his doctor. The arrowhead was still lodged deep in Ajax's thigh, the doctor brought a selection of what appeared to be arrowhead moulds, long, hollow shafts with a hollow for the head of an arrow at the end. They split in half. He used them with ruthless efficiency, rammed the tool into the wound, got the little mould around the arrowhead so that the barb of the arrow was neatly surrounded with smooth, safe metal, and pulled the shaft free. There was a great deal of blood, but Ajax stopped screaming as soon as the shaft came clear, and he managed a watery smile. Ares! Cock! He grunted. I think I'm fucked. His eyes rolled, and he panted, shaking with the exhaustion that only the panic of pain can cause. Don't be a whiner, the doctor quipped and shook his head. Don't try and run the study for a few days. He added and smiled. Then he poured raw honey, a lot of it, straight on the wound and wrapped it so tight I saw his arms bulge with the effort. Miltiades watched, fascinated. All forms of making and craft fascinated him. By then, more and more of the psiloi were coming up the hill and the camp had started to buzz. I heard laughter and the unmistakable sound of a man bragging, and then more laughter. I looked at Miltiades. They don't sound beaten, I said. Perhaps it was the rest and the wine, but Miltiades, a man fifteen years older than me, leaped to his feet. He looked alive. He went out from the stand of trees, and the next I looked he was standing in the middle of a group of the Athenian archers with Themistocles, and they were laughing. Leonestes saw me and beckoned, and I went over. Just telling our tale, Leonestes said, how we rescued you, how you charged the Persians, Medes, barbarians all by yourself like a loon. He grinned. Miltiades raised an eyebrow. Then he stepped up on the dry stone of the sanctuary wall and peered out over the plain towards the Persian camp. They aren't stirring, he said. I can see a line of mounted men right close to their camp. Nothing else. I think that's when the light dawned on all of us. I think they're scared, I said. They're a long way from home, Antigonus added with a nod at their ships. Miltiades agreed. It's hard to put yourself in the enemy's place, isn't it? He said. Themistocles fingered his beard. Have we won, do you think? He asked. Won? Miltiades asked. Don't be silly, but we've pushed them off the ground, and our supplies can reach us, and maybe we've made them feel what we feel. But won? He looked at the cavalry far across the plain. We won't win until we put a spear into every one of them, Themistocles. These are Persians. Themistocles was looking at their fleet. We should never have let them land, he said. But that's for another day. What's the plan now? Miltiades laughed. He seemed ten years younger than he had a few minutes before. 
First we win the vote, he said. Then we fight. By mid-afternoon, the vote was a foregone conclusion. The hoplites were shamed by their servants. There's no other way to put it. Every gentleman needed to wet his spear, and that was that. There were more than three thousand men, by my reckoning, around the altar that evening, as we gathered for the vote of the strategoi. They shouted for the vote, and they demanded that the army make a stand. Leontus tried his best. First he demanded that I be excluded from the vote, as I was a foreigner. The polemarch allowed that. I thought that Miltiades would explode, but then the massed hoplites, and not a few of their servants, started to chant, Fight! 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 Miltiades relaxed. But when it came to the vote, the result was a shock. Five strategoi for fighting, and five for marching back to Athens. The massed hoplites began to chant again, Fight! 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 Someone threw a rock that hit Leontus. Athenians can be bastards. Other men threw rotten figs and eggs, too. Callimachus raised his arms, and even the loudest hoplites fell silent. Don't be children, he said in his powerful voice. They didn't make him polymark for nothing. Grown men, spear fighters, flinched at the admonition in his voice. This is the life of Athens we discuss here. These are the men you appointed as strategoi. Act like citizens. So they did. And I was afraid that Callimachus, so calm and so in command, was going to carry us right back to the city. Callimachus ordered the strategoi to vote again. But the result was another tie. War and politics make for strange alliances. Cleitus of the Alcmeonids voted with Aristides the Just and Themistocles the Democrat and Miltiades the would-be tyrant. The fifth vote for battle was Sosigenes, a well-known orator. The dissenters were just as disparate, and the split belied any notion that men had been bought by barbarian gold, despite all the muttering after the battle. Men were voting from actual conviction, and that is when politics grows most heated and most dangerous. I happened to be next to Callimachus after the second vote. By Zeus, Lord of Judges, he said, I should never have allowed that smooth-tongued bastard to exclude you, Plataean. No, I said, I'd have fixed this. He gave me a hard smile, and then Miltiades came across the circle of Strategoi and stepped up on his aspies. Of course, he said, the polemarch is also a Strategos. He must have the deciding vote. Miltiades' comment brought new silence. Callimachus muttered one word. I heard him say it. He said, bastard, quite clearly. Callimachus looked around the circle, and the silence of the army was thick enough to make cloth. Should I ask for another vote? He asked the strategoi. All of them shook their heads. Miltiades opened his mouth to speak, but Callimachus glared him into silence. Callimachus had a pebble in his hand. He tossed it back and forth for as long as it takes a man to eat a slice of bread. We do not... Just stand here for Athens, he said, looking around. And men in the front rows repeated what he said. He spoke slowly, like the orator he was. Nor do we stand only for Athens and Plataea, he added with a nod to me. What we say here, what we do here, win or lose, is for all the Hellenes. If we return to Athens and submit earth and water to the great king. He looked around again. The silence after his words were repeated was absolute. He tossed the pebble at Miltiades' feet. Fight, he said. The hoplites erupted in cheers, 
like men watching a race at a games. The cheers were audible everywhere, even in the barbarian camp. Immediately after the vote, the dissenters gathered around Miltiades, and Leontos took his hand. We'll be there in the line, he said. We want to win. Not the way we wanted it, said another, Euphonies of Oinoe, but we'll stand our ground. Then the dissenters walked off. I think they were wrong, but by the gods they did their part on the day. And that's how a vote is supposed to work. That's what made Athens great. Not just the men who voted for the fight, but those who voted against and fought anyway. Then all the men who had backed him gathered around. And you would think they'd just voted a new festival. They were beaming with happiness. And hundreds of men came from the surrounding dark to pump their hands and clap their backs. So, Aristides said, when the mass of well-wishers had gone to their rest, fight tomorrow. Too many front-rankers fought today, Miltiades said, or ran, I said with a wink, and the other strategoi laughed. Miltiades agreed, took exercise at any rate. He quipped. I thought he looked a foot taller. Tomorrow, Themistocles, I want the little men back in the fields, sniping at the barbarians. But tomorrow I'll have five hundred Athenians, fifty men of every tribe at the base of the hill, formed close, to give the Psiloi cover if they have to run. To show we're still warriors, more like, I added. That got me a look. Aristides nodded. Tomorrow's my command day. You have a plan. You should be in command. Themistocles agreed. I have the next day, he said. And I the next, the polymarch added. You may have my day as well. Miltiades grunted. Watch yourselves, he said. Too many days and I could be addicted like a drunkard to wine or a lotus eater. He looked out over the darkening plain. But I will fight on my own day, so men may not say that I acted from hubris. Let the barbarians stew. They may march, I said. He shrugged. If they march, we fight whatever day it is, he said. But the more I look at this, now that my eyes are opened, the better it appears for us. Look, they have a fine camp and good protection from wind and weather. But where can they go from Marathon? All roads go through us. If our little men bleed them every day, and I speak frankly, gentlemen, what care we if we lose Psiloi? But every dead mead is one less for the day. No one disagreed. It was true. The next day the Psiloi went down the hill in a wave. They were better organized than on the first day, and Themistocles played a role in that and he led the hoplites out onto the plain, more than five hundred or so, I thought. The barbarians countered with oarsmen, turned hastily into light-armed men of their own. But it was a poor decision, as every dead man was that much less motive power for their ships. The second day our light-armed were tired. Only a few went out, and the enemy cavalry killed some of them. The balance was returning, and men shouted for Miltiades to lead us to battle. Muttering began that the army had voted for battle, and now Miltiades was hesitating. Men are childish fools. Miltiades muttered as he watched the beaten Psiloi trudge up the hill. Don't they see? We've won. All we have to do is sit here and fill the plain with Psiloi and watch them eat. Their horses will be out of forage in a day. But the hoplites didn't see, and the pressure to fight mounted. The third day the light-armed men went out together, and the barbarians stayed in their camp. They had to be feeling the same fatigue as our men by then. But in our camp the hoplites boiled over. Sophonis, Aristides' friend and mine, led the protest. 
he came up to Miltiades with fifty spearmen behind him and demanded that Miltiades lead us to the plain there and then. Are we cowards that we're letting our servants do the fighting? Sophonius asked. What kind of city will we have if my shield-bearer can tell me that he, not I, drove the Medes from holy Attica? He had a point, as you can all see. If we are honest with ourselves, we hold citizen rights from our cities because we fight. True, eh? So if we, the armoured men, the heroes, were in camp and the little men were fighting, then who was a citizen, really? But Miltiades also knew he had a winning strategy. Men like Aristides worried about the consequences, but Miltiades was a fighter, and as we had put him in charge... His only concern was winning. He took Sophonis aside, talked to him the way a man talks to his son, and sent him back to his friends. He'd convinced the young men to give him another day or two. Not that it mattered, the barbarians had had enough. On the evening of the third day, the barbarians came out of their camp, and their army was unbelievably big. It was carefully planned, and they flowed out of their camp like water from a pot, and every contingent had its place. And then, having filled the plain from flank to flank, they came forward at a fast walk. The Psiloi ran for their lives. What else could they do? More than a few of them died, caught in the plain by the cavalry on the flanks, or the bows of the Sakai and the Medes and the Persians in the centre. Aristides had the hoplites on the plain that day, and he held his ground until the last of the little men ran past. And then, in good order, his hoplites walked back up the hill to us. But the barbarians didn't pursue. They turned about and walked back across the plain, fifteen stades back to their camp. The whole attack had taken less than the time it took for a speaker in a law case to give his argument. I was getting into my corslet by that time, afraid that we were about to be attacked right up the hill, my eyes glued to the maneuvers of the enemy. Miltiades came up next to me, jumped up on the wall, and watched them as they retreated. He had Phrynicus with him, I remember, and Phrynicus had a stylus and a wax tablet. Persians on the right, cavalry and then infantry, their best, just like us, Mounted Sakai on the left, then East Greeks. They looked like the marines of all the ships, some Phoenicians there. And then the dismounted Sakai. Persians again in the center, dismounted, maybe Medes. More Medes on the right. He watched them carefully. They filled the plain, Arimnestos. Phrynicus wrote the Persian battle order carefully. I was looking at the fact that the Persian right would have all their best troops. It would be opposite our left. That would be the Plataeans. Like the day my father faced the Spartans at Oinoe, we would bear the brunt of their best men. Of course I was afraid, young man. We're not the invincible hoplites of Greece. We were men who had lost every battle we'd tried with the damned Persians. But I swallowed my fears, like a man should. I nodded, and my voice barely caught when I spoke. About twelve thousand, give or take. Not as deep as we fight. Deep enough, though. Miltiades gave half a grin. We need to fill the plain, too. Ha! I said. I could see it. If our hoplites brushed against the hills and the sea... The cavalry had no way to slip around us, and no hoplite feared a horseman in front of him. Actually, that's bravado. All men on foot fear cavalry, but a mass of spearmen who keep their nerve are not really at risk, however loud the thunder of hooves. Plataeans on the left, then the tribes in order or precedence, Miltiades said. That puts your men on the far left and mine on the far right. You ready for five hundred new citizens? What, tonight? I quipped. But in my heart I was afraid. My Plataeans against the Persians. 
It was not just a matter of whether we could win. It was that I was taking my friends, my brother-in-law. By the gods, I was taking my city into action with the most dreaded foe in all the bowl of earth. I'm about to free every slave in the camp, Miltiades said, and his eyes sparkled. Then I'll send them to you, the free men and the psiloi. I'll arm them and fill the back of my tribes with them. Half of them won't have spears, I pointed out. They'll take up space, he said. They can get up in the rough ground on your flank if you have to spread out, or help thicken your charge if you need. And if the cavalry gets around you, he shrugged. Well, they'll buy you time while they die. I nodded. Are we going to run at the barbarians or walk? Miltiades chewed on his moustache. I thought we might tell off the picked men to go at a run, starting at long bowshot, the way Eualcidas did it. I shrugged. Why don't we all run at them? I said. I'm not saying anyone will shirk, but if we're all charging forward, it's hard for anyone to take a step back. We'd end up with holes in the shield wall. He said. We'd scare the shit out of them. I countered. He sighed. This is a big risk, and you want to do something new? He said. He nodded. I'll think on it. I'm going to free the slaves. I'll get a feast together, I said, and grinned. The sun was still up when a crowd of poor men, recently freed slaves, appeared in our camp. Themistocles led them. Plataeans, Themistocles said, Athens has freed these men and asks your aid in enfranchising them. I had Miron right there. I had warned him, and he rose to it like, well, like the Archon of Plataea. Freedmen, he said, and they were quiet, probably still delighted to hear that they were freed. Many of you are in your hearts, men of Athens. Perhaps you will always feel that way, but Plataea is honored to have you, and if you will let us, we will make you feel honored to be Plataeans. Welcome. Come to our fires and let us feed you your first meal as free men and citizens. We had bread and olives, pork and wine all prepared, and we fed the poor bastards a feast. Our own men joined in. I went over to Jalon and tapped him. You're free too, I said. He grinned. You're all right, he said, and went to stand with the freedmen. They ate the way starving men eat and drank like men who never saw enough wine. Our citizens joined them and moved among them, speaking to one, learning the name of another, and serving them like slaves. Makes me weep. Sorry, honeybee. I need a moment. When they were done with libations, and being blessed by our priests and eating, I stood on my aspies. I was once a slave, I said. That shut them up. I was once a slave, and war made me free. Now I am the polymarch of Plataea. I know how well a freed slave fights, so I won't give you a long speech. I pointed out of the firelight towards the barbarians. Right now, not one of you has the value of a medimnos of grain. But over there in that camp are your farms and your plows and your oxen, your house and your barns, for some of you, your brides. Every Sakai wears the value of a Plataean farm on his back. Some Persians are worth three or four. I pointed at the men who had marched here with me. Tomorrow night we will pool everything we take, Every item we win with our spears, and men who fight will each take away a share. Everyone will share. Now, I said, 
and I hopped off my aspis to stride among them. Who has a spear? Stand over here. A helmet. Anyone? It took forever. The sun slipped below the western rim, and I was still trying to build my phalanx. My Plataeans were generous. Men who'd picked up a good helmet offered their old one to the new men, and men with a spare leather hat traded it round and so on. It went on and on. Men with two spears shared one. Men gave slaves a pair of sandals, a clamis, anything that would help the poor bastards to live a minute longer. I received four hundred new citizens, give or take a few, and we managed to arm almost two hundred of them as spearmen, if not hoplites. Most had to roll up a cloak and use it as a shield. Many had neither helmet nor hat, and behind them stood men with a bag of rocks or a pair of javelins or a sling. But when I had them all placed, and as well armed as I could, I sent them to bed. Sleep well, I said. Dream of a rich farm in Plataea. I hoped that they would, because I knew that it was as close as most of them would ever get. Chapter 18 I slept badly. I hope you won't think the worse of me if I admit that the night before Marathon, despite my head telling me that we had the men and the will to win, I lay awake and worried. Not about death. I never worry about death. It was failure that troubled me, and I lay on my bearskin with the sound of snoring around me and nervous whispers and probably the occasional fart and wondered what I could do better. The night raid haunted me. I'd been lost, and I hadn't told my men what I needed, and I'd made a dozen other errors. So I lay awake, thinking through my actions in the morning. When you're in command, you worry about the damnedest things. I worried about getting my armor on and needing to take a shit. I worried about what I should say. A polymarch is expected to give a speech. I worried about sleeping too late, about what my armor looked like. Jelon was free now, and my helmet hadn't been polished since I left Plataea. A hero should look the part. I worried about how to deal with the rough ground that would be on my left all day. And I worried about the effect of four hundred untrained men at the back of my phalanx. Hades, friends. I can't even remember all the things I worried about the night before Marathon. And when I thought of my wife, my glorious wife, all I could think was that if she were there we could make love, and that would cheer me up, except that she was well along in pregnancy by then, and they say making love when the belly is round is bad for the baby. I don't believe that making love is ever bad for anyone myself, but people say these things. I think that's when I fell asleep, thinking of her. No, that's a lie. My mind was its own traitor, and I'm here to tell the truth. My last thoughts were of Brisset's. If we won, if we won, would I be closer to her? And where was she? I said Sappho's poem to Aphrodite in the dark, for Brisset's. And then I went to sleep. I awoke in the dark, and I could hear the snores. But as soon as my eyes opened, it all came in, the way animals come in, an open gate when there's food in the mangers and they haven't been fed. All my worries. I got up. The dog star was going down, and morning wasn't far off. And besides, I was cold. Idomeneus had snuggled close in the night. And as I rose, he rolled over. Ares, he said. Morning already. I tossed my heavy himation over him. Sleep another hour, I said. Aphrodite's blessing on you. 
He smiled and went straight back to sleep, the Cretan bastard. Odd that he mentioned Aphrodite. I stirred our fire. My mess group had a fire, of course, and added an armload of wood that someone had left already, like a proper soldier. The fire sprang up and I was warm. My kit was neatly stowed under the leather cover of my aspies. Jelon had done it, he must have, after the muster of the freedmen. My corslet had been buffed until the scales shone, and the helmet was like a woman's mirror, and the reflected gleam of the fire danced on the curved brow and the ravens on the cheek plates. Jelon came and knelt by my side. I hadn't seen him get up. Good enough? he asked as he had on other mornings when he'd done a half-assed job. This wasn't half-assed. Splendid, I said. He'd even mounted my fancy plume, the one Euphoria had made me, and laid out the cloak, too. Might as well look the part, Polymarch. He gave my arm a squeeze. I gather from Stygis that you brought my armour. I did, I said, but I haven't polished it for you. He laughed soundlessly. You're all right, he said. In the baggage? With Stygie's mule. I didn't want you to find it. I waved down the hill. In the east, the black-blue sky was moving towards grey. A thousand of us had only a few hours to live. I ate alone a bowl of hot soup, and a big chunk of pork from the feast the night before. I dunked bread in the soup and drank two big cups of water and another of wine. Then, clad only in my arming chiton, a stained thing of linen that had once been white, I crossed the camp to where the strategoi met. The day was warm already and promised to be as hot as my forge. I was the first strategos there, Miltiades was second, which says much about the state of his mind, and Aristides was third. Then the rest came in a clump, and this time we stood together with no regard to who voted for battle and who voted against. In fact, I helped Leontus tie his thorax while Miltiades spoke. Leontus had a beautiful white toward leather cuirass with a heavy black leather yoke and scales on the sides and his armour tied with scarlet cords. So, Miltiades said, he looked around in the half-light, today's my day and today we'll fight. As soon as the boys have food in them, we'll go down the hill. I want the Plataeans down first. They get their leftmost man's shield up against the hills, and then we'll all form on them, so there's no gap. And friends, he said, and he looked around. All we need to do to win is keep the line solid from end to end. No gaps, no spaces, nothing. Shield to shield all the way from the hills to the sea. Everyone got it. We all nodded. You all know the order, left to right, yes? So each contingent goes down in order, and no rushing and no pushing. Forming the line is the key to victory. Once we're formed, we're halfway to it. Fuck this up and we're all dead men. Aristides raised an eyebrow. We get it. Miltiades didn't crack a smile. See that you do. Next thing, when we reach the bowshot of the enemy, the range where they shoot, we charge, understand? Dead run and to Hades with the man who slows or falls. That got them talking. We'll fall apart, Leontus protested. Miltiades shook his head. It works in the east. Young Arimnestos there once charged a hundred Persians all by himself, with ten other men, I said. And the rest of the phalanx came in behind. It wrecked them, right? Miltiades said. I got the last of Leontus's ties done and faced the others. It hurries their archers, I said. They lose time and space to shoot. I looked around. We're the best athletes in the world, and we can cover that ground in no time with the gods at our backs. You're in command, Leontus said to Miltiades. He shrugged. Then he smiled, 
All right, I'm fast. I'll run. Just make sure the rest of your tribe goes forward too, Sophonis said. That was it. Perhaps our shortest command meeting to date. Callimachus asked Miltiades where he should stand, and Miltiades nodded gravely. You are the polymarch, he said. You take the right of the line. Callimachus bowed. I am honoured, but the place is yours if you wish it. Miltiades shook his head. When I'm polymarch, I'll take the place of honour, he said, and that was that. Then many of us embraced, and if my voice chokes to tell this, I embraced many men I loved forever, and we all knew it. We all knew that win or lose, the price would be high. That is what a battle is, a culling. Except this time, instead of standing with strangers and allies, I was standing in an army with my friends in every rank, and every dead man would be the loss of someone I knew. It was all very personal. More wine, girl. And this for the shades of the heroes who fell there. So my friend Hermogenes, phylarch of the leftmost phyle of Plataea, was the first man down the hill, the first to form and the linchpin of our line. And Callimachus was the last phyle leader down the hill and formed the farthest to the right in the front rank. Hermogenes' shield brushed against the trees, and Callimachus's right sandal was in the water, or so we used to tell the story. Our Plataeans were twelve men deep and one hundred and twenty men wide. We took up a little more than a stade of the plain's width, and our rear rank was just twenty-four paces at normal order from our front rank. The three tribes next to us had been bolstered with light-armed men, and they too had twelve ranks. Many of the Athenian archers had also been put in the phalanx on the left, so they were deep and they stretched three more stardes. We couldn't even see the middle as it started to form. Aristides was in the centre with his Antiochi, and they formed twice as wide as we did and only half as deep, just six deep, to cover more frontage. That's where the richest, best-armoured men were, and Miltiades felt confident that they could take the brunt of the archery. At least I hope that's what he thought because otherwise what he thought was that the cream of the enemy's archers, the Sakai, would rid him of a world of political opponents. There were three tribes in the center, and they covered almost five studies. And on the right there were three more tribes, double depth as we were, and they covered three more studies. So our line was twelve or more studies from end to end. No one could keep a line that long from buckling and flowing and bending, but we formed it well, and even as we formed, the barbarians came. They did what they had done the day before, but it all went mad like a sudden thunderstorm. First, the forming of the Persians was terrifying from ground level. Yesterday I'd watched it from a hundred feet above the plain. It had been majestic and professional. At eye level, it was like a lion pouncing. They flooded out of their camp in silence, twelve thousand professional soldiers all running to their posts in about as much time as it takes to tell the story. And then they came forward, at us. My end of the line had settled in position. Men were kneeling to tie a sandal, wiping the dew from their shields, laughing, resting their heavy shields on the ground, or on the instep of their left feet. The onset of the barbarians blasted the laughter from us. They flowed over the plain like a sudden flood, and the horsemen on their flanks looked like gods in a blaze of sunlit gold. They came on without a sound, except the ring and jingle of harness, of metal on metal, the hollow knocking of wooden shields on armoured legs. Just as yesterday... They put their Phoenicians and Greeks on our right, so that I was opposite Persians, the front ranks armed just as we were armed, big men with heavy armour and shields, mostly oval shields, almost like our old Beotians, with short heavy spears, 
but with six ranks of archers behind them. Opposite Hermogenes was a troop of Persian noble cavalry. Directly opposite me was a man in a helmet that seemed to be made of gold. As he came forward in the new sunlight, he called out a war cry, and his men answered all together a single shout that carried to us like a challenge. I remember my breath stopping in my throat. To his right, from my perspective, were the Medes. The dismounted Medes were the second largest contingent after the Sakai, and they had armor, the best bows, sharp swords, and axes. Beyond them, I assumed, were the Sakai, the best of the enemy's archers in the center, and then the enemy Greeks and Phoenicians on our right, facing Mithyades. They were formed exactly the way they'd formed the day before. My Plataeans faced the cream of their army. It steadied me. Being the underdog has its advantages, and in that moment I knew what I'd say. They came closer, moving swiftly across the plain like hunting hounds or wolves, hungry wolves. I had Leontus on my right. I left my shield with Teuser and ran to Leontus, a stade each way, thanks. I'm going to charge them as soon as they reach Bowshot, I said, pointing down the field. He was taken aback. Is that what Miltiades wants? He asked. I don't know what Miltiades wants, I said. He's five more stardies that way, if you want to ask. I shrugged. No easy thing in twenty pounds of scale armor. But as soon as they stop to shoot, I'm going at them. He was eyeing the Persians. His men would be in the arrow storm, not mine. I'm with you, Platean, he said. I tapped his aspis by way of a handshake and ran back to my place, and his tribe cheered me as I ran by. They were getting their shields off the ground, pulling their helmets down, and when I reached my own men, Idomeneus had already given the orders. The enemy was still three or four stardis away. So I walked, forcing myself to take my time all along my front rank. I met the eyes of every man there. Some said a few words. Some nodded their heads so that their plumes rippled, the horsehair catching the sea breeze. I walked all the way to Hermogenes. Fight well, brother, I said. Lead us to glory, Polymarch, he said. I could see his grin inside the tower of his face slit. By the gods, those words went to my heart. Then I walked back, making myself walk, even while the Persians and Medes were slowing, closer than I'd expected, faster than I'd thought possible. Their mounted Persians, the best of the best, seemed close enough to touch, close enough to ride over and gut me before I could take shelter in our ranks. I stopped in the middle of my line, turned my back to the enemy and raised my arms. Then, with the kind of gesture that Heraclitus taught us, a broad orator's sweep of my right arm, I indicated that I would speak. I could talk to you of duty, I shouted, and they were silent. Of courage and arete, and of the defense of Hellas, and all you hold dear. I paused, and forced myself to look at my own men, and not to turn my head and look at the enemy, who came closer and closer to my back. But you are Plataeans, and you know what is excellent, and who is brave. So I will say two things. First, yesterday, many of you were slaves, and for the rest, no one here expects us to beat the Persians. We are the left of the line, and all Athens asks is that we take our time dying. I paused, and then I pointed my spear at the enemy. Horse shit, brothers! We are Plataeans! Every man here is a Plataean! Over there is all the wealth of Asia. The gods have given us the Persians themselves. Every one of them is wearing a fortune in gold. 
You were a slave yesterday. Tomorrow you can be an aristocrat. Or be dead and go to Hades with the heroes. Whatever you were, whatever you are at this moment, however much you want to piss or creep away, tomorrow is yours if you win today. All of that gold is yours if you are man enough to take it. My Plataeans responded with a roar, a sharp bark. Only then did I sneak a glance at our enemies. They were a stardy away or more. I returned to my place in the ranks. I put my aspis on my shoulder and grasped my spears, my fine light deer spear in my right hand and my heavy man-killer in my left, sharing the hand with the antilabe of my shield. I turned to Idomeneus. How was that? I asked. He nodded. He wore a Cretan helm that showed his face, and his smile was broad. Everyone understands gold, he said. Arete is more complicated. See the mounted bastard in the gold helmet? I said. I'll take him, but he's got to go. And if I fall or I miss, you take him, understand? I tapped my spearhead against his and saw his grin. Good as dead now, Idomeneus said. Yes, I answered. He smiled his mad, fighting smile. Sure, he said. I turned to Teuser, who was tight to my back. Hear me, friend, do not take that man's life. I want his men to see him go down to my spear. In a fight like this, everything depends on the first few seconds. Aye, Lord, he said. He was doubtful. Opposite me, the whole enemy line, every bit as long as ours and at least as deep, was slowing. It didn't stop all at once. It takes time for a line fifteen stardies long to stop and straighten. Ready! I roared. Spears up! Idomeneus hissed. Close our order! At me. I know what I'm doing. I said. The Athenians obeyed me as fast as my own men, and three thousand men raised their spears over their heads, Spear point just clear of the rim of your shield. Spear butt well up in the air so that it doesn't foul the man behind you. Or worse, catch him in the teeth. We were one stardy from the enemy. The Persians were settling down, planting shafts in the ground. The cavalry were actually lagging behind their main line, with a few men trying to pick a way through the scrub to our flank and struggling, but giving me heartburn nonetheless. I nodded to Idomeneus, and he blew the horn, two long, hard blasts, and the pause between them was thin enough for a sword blade to fit, and not much more, and then we were off. Ever run a foot race? Ever run the Hoplitodromos? Ever run the Hoplitodromos with fifty men? Imagine fifty men. Imagine a hundred, five hundred, three thousand men all starting together, at the sound of a horn. We were off, and by the will of the gods no one stumbled in all our line. One poor fool, sprawling on his face, might have been the difference between victory and defeat. But no man fell at the start. On my right the Athenians moved as soon as I did, and the Persians and the Medes raised their bows and shot, too fast and too far. Men in the rear ranks died, but not a shaft went into the front. It's a tactic, honeybee. They halt at a given distance, a distance at which they practice, and pound the crap out of you if you stand and take it. But if you move forward, every step was a step towards victory. We were on the edge of a wheat field, tramped flat by Psiloi over the last few days, and the hobnails on my Spartan shoes bit into the ground as I ran, full strides, just like the Hoplitodromos. That's why I didn't close our order, of course, because men need room to run. I was neither first nor last. Idomeneus was ahead of me by a horse length, just heartbeats after he blew the horn. 
My old wound kept me from being first, but I was not last. I looked over the rim of my shield. We were facing Persians, Medes, and a handful of Sakai, and every man had a bow. Ten more paces, and the Persians were loosing, again a rippling volley, and an arrow skipped off the gravel in front of me and ripped across my greave at my ankle and vanished into the ranks behind me. They'd shot. Lo, this time men fell, a few Plataeans, and more Athenians, and other men fell over the wounded. A man can break his jaw, falling with an aspis at a dead run, or break his collarbone or shield arm. Just opposite me, and a little to my left, Golden Helm was bringing his Persian nobles forward. I saw him raise his hand, saw him order them forward, saw his hesitation. We were charging them. The Persian polymarch had spear fighters, dismounted nobles for his front two ranks, but he had sent them to the rear for the archery phase. His archers would shoot better and flatter if they didn't have to lift their shots clear of the front rank. The problem was we weren't waiting to be pounded with arrows, and now his best fighters, killers every one like Cyrus and Pharnakis, were in the eleventh and twelfth rank. If he rotated them again now, his men would have to stop shooting. I read this at a glance because there were no shields facing me, only round Persian hats and bright scale armor like mine. A third volley flew at us. It is a fearful thing when the arrows come straight at you when the flicker of their motion seems to end in your eye, when the shafts darken the sky, when the sound is like the first whisper of rain growing swiftly into a storm. And then they hit, and my shield took the impacts like a hail of stones thrown by strong boys or young men. Two hit my helmet, and there was pain. Then I was free of them, and still running, more men were down, and the rest were right with me. Golden Helm had made his decision. He ordered his cavalry to charge us, slanting across our front. Horses take up three or four times the frontage of a man with a shield, unless they move very slowly. So suddenly the whole of the Plataean front was filled with Persian cavalry. I altered my stride and ran for Golden Helm. My Plataeans didn't know any better, so they followed me. The received wisdom of the ages is that infantry should not charge cavalry. In fact, it's about the best thing the infantry can do. Charging keeps men from flinching. Cavalry is only dangerous to infantry who break. I wanted their unarmored horses in among our rear ranks, where they'd be swarmed and killed. I didn't want to fight them later, in our flanks or our rear, but to be honest, it was too late to change plan. I ran at Golden Helm, and he became my world. He saw me, too, and he rode at me. He had a long axe in his hand, and his beard was saffron and henna streaked, brilliant and barbarous. He was someone important, and the way he whirled the axe was beautiful, magnificent. I could say the battlefield hushed, but that would be pig shit. But it did for me. These moments come once or twice in a lifetime, even when you're a hero. As far as I know, we were the first to clash on the field that day. I saw no one else in those last moments. I saw the fine ripples in the muscles of his horse, the way the sun glinted like a new-lit fire from the peak of his helmet the way his axe curved up from his strap, reaching for my throat. I was perhaps five paces from him, one lunge of his horse, three strides of my legs, when I cast my spear. The point went into the breast of his mount and sank the length of my forearm, and the horse's front legs went out from under it as if it had tripped. He cut at me anyway, but the gods put him on the ground at my feet, and my second spear rang on his helmet, Snapping his head back, he tried to rise, and quick as a cat, I stabbed twice more, eye slit and throat. The first rang on his helmet, and the second sank slickly and came out red. 
and then I was past him, and the world seemed to burst into motion as the rest of his cavalry slammed into us or slackened their reins. Confusion everywhere, but the Plataeans ran in among them. The Persians had balked, or most of them had. It happens to horses and to cavalry, especially men who are riding strange horses. Many of them were just Greek farm horses, and they balked at the line of shields and the elo, elo, elo shrieks from every throat. And then they broke. They wanted a shooting contest, not a toe-to-toe brawl with men in better armour. The noble Persians broke away from us, leaving their dead, having accomplished nothing. But we had. We were like gods now. We went after them at their infantry, at the archers who'd stopped shooting for fear of hitting their own. The gods were with us. I ran with a host of dead men. Ualcidas was there, I know, and Neoptolemus, and all the men who had died for nothing at Lade. I could feel their shades at my back, giving wings to my feet. But Persians are men, too. Those archers were not slaves, nor hirelings, nor raw levies. They were Darius's veterans, and when we were ten short paces from their lines, they did not flinch. They raised their bows and aimed the barbed shafts straight at our faces, too close to miss. And then they loosed. I remember hearing the shout of the master archer and the grunts of men as they let the heavy bows release. I was that close. I was in front. Men say that our front rank fell like wheat to a scythe. I know that the next day I saw men I loved with eight or nine arrows in them. Men shot right through the faces of their aspides, through leather caps or even bronze. But not a shaft touched me. Perhaps the shades kept them from me. Or Heracles, my ancestor. Nine paces from their line, I knew I would outrun their next volley. Eight paces out, and men in the front rank were as plain as day. Tanned faces, handsome men with long black beards, drawing swords. Six paces out, and they were flinching. This was not the fight at the pass. I didn't need to risk hitting them at full speed. I slowed, shortening stride, bringing my second spear up, gripping it short, just a little forward of halfway. Three paces out, and my prayers went to my ancestors. There is no paean at the dead run, but to our right the Athenians were singing, and I could hear it. I remember thinking, this is how I want to die. One pace out, the man in front of me wouldn't meet my eye, and my spear took him while he cringed. But the man to his left was made of better stuff, and he slammed his short sword into me. I blocked it on my aspis, and then I put my shield into him. He had no shield, and I probably broke his jaw. My strong right leg pushed me through their front rank, left foot planted, shield into the second ranker, and I knocked him back, Ares' hand, on my shoulder. The second ranker was a veteran, and he knew his business. He and the man to his right got their swords up into my face, points levelled, and they pushed back at me together. Then a rain of blows fell on my aspies as they tried to force me out of their ranks. I took a blow to my helmet and I went back a step. And then Tuser, already at my shoulder by then, shot one, a clean kill. I pushed forward against the other man, chest to chest, and he stood his ground. And our spears were too long to reach each other, close enough to embrace, to kiss, to smell the cardamom and onion on his breath. I thrust over his shoulder at the man behind him. He pushed me back. He was strong, and I remember my shock as he moved me back another full pace. But he was so dedicated to pushing me by main strength that I had time to throw my light spear into a second rancor. My sword floated into my hand, and I cut once, twice, three times at his shield rim. No art, no science, just strength and terror and the last shreds of force from my desperate run. And he raised his cloak-wrapped arm and ducked his head as men will, and pushed. My fourth blow came as fast as the first three, 
stooped like a hawk on a rabbit, bit through his cloak and into the naked meat of his arm, so hard that it cut to the bone, and my sword snapped as I wrenched it loose, falling because even as I cut him, his push overcame my balance. I fell, and the melee closed over me. Imagine, I had killed him or wounded him so badly he couldn't fight, yet still he knocked me down. At my shoulder was Tuser, who had no shield. At my victim's shoulder was a smaller man who hadn't quite kept up. In a fight like that, a rear ranker needs to be pressed tight to his front ranker to help him at all, or his spear thrusts are too far back. Tuser shot the next man, but the arrow skittered off his shield. Suddenly we were fighting their killers, their front rank men, who were pushing as hard as they could to get to their correct places. By all the gods, the Persians were brave. Even disordered, they fought, and their best men weren't finished. I saw it all from where I'd fallen backwards, my back against Tusar's knees, and my shield still covering me. I had never gone down in a phalanx fight before, and I was terrified. Once you are down, you are meat for any man's spear. In falling, my chin had caught on my shield rim, and I'd bitten my tongue. It may sound like a silly wound to you, Thugater, but my head was full of the pain, and I didn't know if I'd taken a worse wound. Arimnestos is down, Tusser called. He meant to rally aid, but his words sucked the heart out of our phalanx. The whole line gave a step to the Persians and Medes. I couldn't get an arm under me. My left arm beneath my shield was wrapped in my clammies, and I couldn't get the rim of the shield under me. My right arm slipped on the blood-soaked wheat stubble, and one of the enemy thrust at me. I caught a flash of his spearhead and turned my head, and his blow landed hard. His point must have caught in the repoussé of my olive wreath, and I fell back again, this time on my elbows. My aspis bore two heavy blows, and my shoulder felt the impact as my left arm was rotated against my will. I screamed at the pain. Then Bellerophon and Stygis saved my life. They passed over Tuser, their shields flowing around him in the movements we had taught in the Pyrrhiki. They stood over me, their spears flashing, the tall crest on their helmets nodding in time to their thrusts. And for a moment I could see straight up under their helmets, mouths set, chins down to cover the vulnerable throat. And then Stygis pushed forward with his right leg, and Bellerophon roared his war cry, and they were past me. I got a breath in me. Tusar stepped over me, close at their shoulders, and shot and there were hands under my armpits, and I was dragged back. I breathed again and again, and the pain was less. And then I was on my back, and my shield was off my arm. Let me up! I spat. They were all new men, the rear rankers, and they scarcely knew me. On the other hand, they'd been bold enough to push into the scrum and get my body. I finally got my feet under me, and I rose, covered in blood and straw from being dragged. You live, one of the new men said. I live, I said. I pulled my helmet back and one of them handed me a canteen. I looked at the front of the fighting, just a couple of horse lengths away. I could see Stygi's red plume and Bellerophon's white side by side, and Idomeneus's red and black, just an arm's length to the right of Stygi's. They were fighting well, the line wasn't moving either way. I looked to the right. The Athenians under Leontus were into the Medes, but the fighting was heavy, and the Sakai in the rear ranks were lofting arrows high to drop on the phalanx, where they fell on unarmored men, many of whom had no shields. To my left, the Persian cavalry were pressed hard against the front of our shields, stabbing down with their spears and screaming strange cries. A new man, little more than a boy, handed me a gourd. More water, Lord? I drank greedily, pressed the gourd back into his hands, 
and pulled my helmet down. Shield, I said, and two of them put it on my arm. My left arm muscles protested. Something bad had happened in my shoulder. Spear, I growled, and one of them gave up his spear, his only weapon. Behind me, the sound of battle changed tone. I had to turn round to look. Once I had my helmet on, my field of vision was that limited. Beyond the Athenians fighting the Medes, something was already wrong. I could see the backs of Athenians. I could see men running, but they were two or three stardis away, slightly downhill. It looked to me as if our center was bulging back. Remember that we'd been fighting for only two minutes, maybe less. I remember sucking in a deep breath and then plunging forward into the phalanx, the way a man dives into deep water. I pushed past the rear rankers easily. They were anxious to let me pass. When I came to armored men, our fifth or sixth rank, I suppose, I had to tap the men on the back plate. Exchange! I called. Rank by rank, I exchanged forward. This is something we practice in the Pitiki over and over again. Men need to be able to move forward and back. I went forward, sixth to fifth, fifth to fourth, fourth to third. Finally, after what seemed like an hour, I was behind Tuser, and I could see Idomineus locked in his fight with a Persian captain. They were well matched, and both of them were failing, their blows slowing. I've said it before, men can only fight so long, even brave, noble men in the height of training. I stepped to the right, cutting in ahead of Idomineus's second ranker, Jelon. He knew me immediately. I tapped Idomineus on the shoulder. He looked back, the merest flash of a glance, shield high to deflect a blow. But in that heartbeat he knew who was behind him. He sat his feet, and I put my right foot forward across my left, and allowed my knee to touch the back of his leg. He pivoted on the balls of his feet, and stepped to the rear. I pushed forward, and launched a heavy blow into the Persian shield with my new spear, rocking him back. He was tired. I could tell he was fading from that first exchange, and he crouched behind his shield and thrust low at my shins, but I was having none of it. I'd caught my breath, and I was as fresh as a man can be in a phalanx fight. I powered forward on my spear foot, and Jelon came at my shoulder, pounding away at the noble Persian with high blows to his shield and his helmet. He gave ground. Plateans! I roared. Take them! I remember that moment the best, children, because it was like the dance, and it was glorious. It was perhaps a taste of godhood. Enough men heard me. Enough men in every rank heard the call. I was Arimnestos, the killer of men. But in that kind of fight, I was only one man. But I was one Platean, and together we were that thing. I planted my right foot, and around me every Platean did the same. And though we had no pipes to call the time, every man crouched, screamed their war cry, and pushed forward. Apollo's ravens. The Persian officer was gone, knocked flat or exchanged out of the front rank. I lost him in the moments when we pushed, and my new opponent's eyes were wide with terror. I swept my shield forward and caught the rim of his oval shield and flicked it aside, and Jelon's spear robbed the man of life as easily as if he was a dummy of straw. Then we went forward. I had Stygis at my left shoulder, and Idomeneus was pressing up on my right. Jelon was at my back, and Tuser shot and shot from behind my left ear. We went forward ten paces, and then another ten, the enemy stumbling away before us. They didn't break, but suddenly there was less pressure on our front. Leontus and his Athenians were keeping pace, and the Medes were backing away almost as fast as we pressed forward. 
but they were not yet beaten men. In truth, it was the hardest fighting I had ever seen. By this time, we'd been spear to spear for as long as a man gives a speech in the Agora or more, long enough that the sun was suddenly high in the sky. I was covered in sweat. My face burned from the pressure of my helmet and the blood and salt against the leather of my helmet pad. My shoulder was lacerated by the damaged scales on my thorax, and my legs ached. The Persians flinched back again, and their front solidified. Men were calling to each other to hold their ground, and the Medes on our right got their spear fighters into the front rank and locked shields, and we came to a stop just a pace or two clear of their line. I looked around. We'd pushed them back a stadia or more, and as they recoiled, they were pivoting on their center, so that we were facing their ships in the distance, far away by their camp. All along the line, men breathed and stood straight. They switched grips on their spears or dropped a broken weapon. Many exchanged, giving their place to fresher men. You live, Stygis said. He raised my shield arm, wrenching my shoulder as he did, so that the black raven on my red shield rose over the battlefield. Men cheered. That is a great feeling, daughter, and worth all the pain in the world. When men cheer you, you are with the gods. Opposite us, an officer called for the Persians to cheer, and got a rumble and no more. Plataeans, I called. And Heracles or Hermes gave my throat power. Sons of the Daidala, now is the time! The spear came up again, and our cheer had the force of a crack of thunder, and we charged. Not far, two paces, but the Persians were yielding before we reached them, their shields moving, so that every veteran in our line knew that we had beaten them. And with a long crash, like the sound two boats make as they collide, the enemy gave way. The first rank man opposite me was brave, or foolish, and stood his ground. I knocked him flat. I threw my borrowed spear at the next man, and it stuck in his shield, dragging it down. Jelon put a spear tip into the top of his thigh, and I stepped on his chest and pressed forward, reaching for a sword that wasn't there, a moment of fear, and I was into the third rank. This part, I remember as if it was yesterday, Thugater. I had no weapon, and the next man should have killed me. But he cowered, and my right arm shot out as if it had its own life in combat, grabbed the rim of his scalloped shield, and spun it to the left. His shield arm snapped. He went down, he screamed, and his scream was the surrender of the Persians to panic, and the rest were running. The screaming man with the broken arm had a perfectly good spear, and the gods gifted it to me as he let go, and it seemed to leap into my hand. I looked left. Hermogenes was coming into the flank of the Medes, no idea where the beaten Persian cavalry had got to, but the Persians were wrecked. Men in front and the flank, and they ran, and the Medes started to run with them, all in as long as it takes to tell the tale. After an hour of endless pushing, we were winning. To my right, the Medes were backing fast, but they were not beaten, and their rear ranks continued trying to lob arrows high to drop them on our phalanx, and it was working. My men were still dying, but the Sakai had no shields, and our spears were hurting them. I was no longer in command. We were no longer a phalanx. Plataeans and Athenians were intermixed along two stadies, and men were plunging into the front of the Sakai in groups or alone. I remember that I stooped and picked up the Sakai axe and put it in my shield hand. Better than no weapon, I thought if my short Persian spear broke. I could hear a Mede demanding that his men rally, and they did. The Persians tried to form on them. They'd lost many men, 
and the Persian cavalry came forward with a shout and a hail of arrows. Hermogenes' men were still milling around in no sort of order. But remember, he had twelve ranks of men behind him. The cavalry hit his front ranks, and they locked up spear and aspis against horse and sword and bow. Our line moved back a pace, and then the men on my left ran at the flanks of the horses and started pulling the Persians from their horses. The Medes, like lions, came forward to take advantage of our confusion. Or simply to save the Persians, I have no idea. On me! I roared. Charge! The Medes were shocked as we ran at them again. Some stopped dead, and others kept coming, and they had no more order than we did. That's when the fighting was the worst, the fiercest. They were shamed from their brief rout and meant to have our heads, while we already thought that we were the better men and meant to have theirs. Both sides lost their cohesion, and men died fast. Blows came out of everywhere and nowhere, and the only hope was to be fully armoured, as I was. I must have taken ten blows that should have been wounds, on my arm and shoulder plates, on my scale shirt, on my helmet. Some must have been from my own men in the confusion. Then, somehow, I was in among the Persian cavalry, not the Medes, though I have no memory of running at them, and that made my fighting easier. Anyone on a horse was a target, Mounted men seldom have shields. I was like nemesis. Idomeneus must have decided to stay at my shoulder, and I had Jelon at my back, and we killed them. Ah, I remember Marathon, children. That day I was a god of war. My armor flashed and shone, and men fell under every blow of my spear. I ripped men from their horses, Mounted men have to fight to the front. They cannot face to the flanks or rear, not against two rapid blows anyway. Idomeneus and Jelon were not much worse than me, though. And as the fight became looser and ranks dissolved, we were more dangerous, not less. I had a simple goal, my usual goal in a melee, to burst out of the back of the enemy formation. So I killed and wounded... I knocked men off their mounts and stepped on them, and I kept going forward, and my little group stuck to me. It is possible to get lost in a big fight, the way a man may get lost in the woods. Confined in the eye slits of your helmet, it is possible to take a wound or die simply because some bastard turned you around. It is essential to have men at your back whom you trust, men who will turn you back round, or kill the opponent who is circling outside the realm of your helmet. But with such men, anything is possible, and it is incredible how a man can move inside a melee if he has purpose and companions. I went at a rider in a rich purple cloak, and he turned and jammed his heels in, and when I followed him we burst free. And then we were running in a hayfield, and the fight was behind us. The fleeing man took an arrow and fell back over the rump of his horse, and he rode away like that, a surprising distance, as I remember. Then Tiusser, at my elbow, grunted and released another arrow, high, and it fell on him, and he crashed to earth. He tried to rise, and a third arrow finished him. Tiusser came out from the cover of Idomeneus's shield, knocking an arrow, and the Persian cavalry folded up and ran, again, and this time they left half their men or more dead on the ground, because we'd burst through them. Then the Medes broke and ran, shooting as they went. There were horses down in the brush, and men screaming, and horses bellowing. Ares, it was grim, blood on the ground, Enough of it to splash over your sandals when the man next to you made a kill or died. So much blood that the copper bronze smell fills your nostrils. More even than the stink of sweat. The smell that men have when they're afraid. The smell of men's guts like new butchered deer. Only when you stop do you notice it. The stench of Ares. And then it makes you gag 
especially if some unarmored boy has been cut to death at your feet, his lips already blue-white and bled out, his eyes bulging from the horror and pain. War. But as I say, the Medes ran, the Persian cavalry ran or died, and the Sakai, despite their leader's calls, had not been keen for the second engagement, and the whole mass went back. This time they went back to the east, down towards the beach, trying to hide themselves among the Sakai of the center, I think. Tusser started shooting into them, and then he was out of shafts. It seems odd to tell it, but the only arrows I remember at that point were his, although I'm told that the Sakai kept shooting until the very end. I had other concerns. The Athenians were pushing the Sakai, and the Sakai, whether by intention or by chance, were backing only at our end of the line, so that they swung like a gate, still linked to their centre two stadis away. At our end, we'd won. The Persians, cavalry and infantry were dead or broken, fleeing, throwing away their shields. Once a man discards his shield, he's done. The Medes ran, and the Sakai nearest us were, well, mostly they were dead. Idomeneus was at my shoulder. Sound the rally, I panted. I could see it, by Ares and by Aphrodite. That's what I remember best of that whole glorious day. I could see what I needed to do, as if Athena stood at my shoulder, or perhaps Heracles, and whispered it in my ear. I pivoted my body to face the beach, twelve stardis away, and spear my arms wide. Rally here, I called. On me! Idomeneus went into his place, and Jelon and Thusser. In seconds, fifty more men were fitting in, and then a hundred. A long minute, and an arrow slew one of my Plataeans almost at the end of my spear. But by now the whole mass of them was forming up. Fifteen hundred men, even the former slaves, even when the old Plataeans had to show them where to stand. The Sakai weren't stupid. They were shooting at us as fast as they could. The far end of the line had Hermogenes and Antigonus. I ran down the front rank and counted off twenty files from the left end and pulled Antigonus out of the ranks. Take them! We'll left and pursue the beaten men. Stay close enough to keep them running and stay far enough that they don't turn and kill you. If you reach their camp, stop. Antigonus nodded. Pursue. He gave me a tired smile. Have we won? That's right. I slapped his shield. Go! If you think I was a good strategos, a just man, I'm no Aristides. I sent my brother-in-law and my closest friend away to a nice, safe pursuit. They'd done their part, and Penn would not become a widow this day. I didn't think that the remnants of the enemy had any fight left in them, nor was I wrong. Then back to my own, now formed facing the empty air that hung off the new flank of the Sakai. Slow and steady, keep together! I shouted these things. I wanted the Sakai to see us coming. Sing the pian! I yelled, and men took it up all along the line. There'd been no time to sing the pian, or give much of a war cry before our first charge. Now, now we had all the time in the world. We sang, and our lines stiffened, bent, righted themselves. It is hard to keep the line on rough ground and the plains of Marathon in early autumn are like farm fields the world over. We had to flow around clumps of trees, bushes, rocks. It was not like painting in the store, children. There were no straight lines at Marathon. But the Sakai saw us and gave more ground. They tried to run and reform to face us, but the Athenians stayed on them, and they died. Those Sakai were gallant, and they tried again and again to make a stand and hold the line. As we passed the edge of their formation, we saw why. 
our town centre was shattered, as if a herd of cattle had passed through. Where Aristides had stood, there were only victorious Persians, Datis's bodyguard, and dead Greeks. I cursed under my breath, trying to see. Had we lost? I faltered, and my voice roared forward without my volition. Some god took my throat, I swear. I went forward. Then, as we turned the flanks of the Sakai, they folded as fast as a man can lose a boxing match. One moment they were outmatched, but still game, their line backing away, but their men fighting hard, and the next they were finished, flying for their lives. They started to run in earnest because we were behind them. I didn't want to fight the Sakai anyway. I wanted to come to grips with Dathis. The day was neither lost nor won, and with everything in the balance, my men were not going to stop and fight men in flight. Pian again! I roared, and they obeyed, although as long as I have been a soldier, I have never heard the Pian sung twice in the same action. Now I could see the Greek centre, well back, almost where we had started our charge, and only clumps of men. I could see horsehair crests there, and Persian felt hats, and men looking towards us. It all happened in moments, heartbeats of time, too little for me to give an order or change our front. The Persian centre was killing the Antiochi, and then they were running, racing over the stubble of the hay for their camp. The sight of us behind them, however ill-formed our phalanx really was, terrified them the way our charge apparently had not. The Sakai had held the flanks for Dathis and his picked men to wreck the Athenian centre, and the dead were everywhere, or so it seemed. But by the gods, when they saw us coming behind, threatening to cut them off from the ships, I saw men grab the satrap, hard to miss in his scarlet and gold, and run him to a horse. His picked killers ran at his heels like dogs on a hunt. They were too far away for my formed men to reach. They ran through the hole in our lines and down towards the beach. Some of their men ran west, away from the beach, following an officer. More, I didn't see this, ran west and north, around behind our lines. The right wing, our right, Miltiades men, had fought as hard as we had and been just as victorious. And even as we came up to the Persians, Miltiades men began to form a new phalanx facing us. One of the strangest sights I've seen on a battlefield. Two victorious phalanxes from the same side, facing each other over three stadies of ground, with Persians streaming away between us. There was no holding my men then. It started with the rear rankers, the freedmen. They saw their fortunes running by, hundreds and hundreds of gold-laced Persians running for their camp, and they left their ranks and started in pursuit. I called for them to halt, and more men joined them. All my men streamed away after them. I stopped, popped my helmet on the back of my head, took a swig of water and spat it out and bandaged my knee. By my side, Idomeneus was panting, bent double, staring fixedly at the stubble, and Teuser was humming to himself, scouring the grass for spent shafts. When I raised my head, I could see all the way to the ships. There was haze in the distance, but I could see that the barbarians had formed again, well down the field, and there was fighting there, and over in the olive grove, west of the swamp, too. Most of my oikia, my own men, stood around me. Stygis had a cut on his sword arm. Jelon looked as fit as a statue, and a dozen of my new freedmen had chosen to loot the corpses in the area, so I had maybe twenty men, and there were knots of fighting all over the field. Men were leaving the field, too, dribs and drabs of Greeks, wounded or just too tired to continue. Not everyone lived the life of the palestra and the gymnasium, and there was no real discipline. A man who felt he'd done enough could just turn and walk away. But I was the polemarch of Plataea, 
and there was still fighting. The Greeks around me were saying, Nike, Nike. Maybe, but to me the sound from the north was an ominous one. It suggested that the battle wasn't over yet. I tested my wounded leg, and it was solid enough. Pain is pain. Fatigue is fatigue. Zeus Soter, one of the new men said. He had a wound on his hand with blood flowing out of it, despite the rag he'd put on it. I feel like shit, he said. I need to sit. I grabbed his shoulder. You feel bad? I asked. Think how they feel. I pointed to the row of dead Sakai, naked now, and their white bodies lying in a row where our rear rankers had stripped them. Idomeneus barked his battle laugh. More fighting, he said. We all drank our canteens dry, and then Greeks came up from the wreck of the Athenian centre, some ashamed and others proud. Many had run, and others fought on until the Persians were forced back, and you can guess which group included Aristides. By the gods, Platean, I think we have won, he shouted as he ran up. He had the cheek plates of his helmet cocked back to give him a better view. There was blood flowing down his leg, and Idomeneus and I insisted he be bandaged before we went forward again. Aristides brought a hundred men with him. They were weary, but they wanted to be in at the kill. We moved down to the beach. The fighting seemed heaviest by the ships, and we could see black hulls launching all along the bay. It seemed too good to be true, but one after another ships pushed their sterns off the sand, and their oars came out. Some stayed in close, rescuing men from the water, Others simply fled. That was when we knew we'd won. The barbarians had formed a line by the ships, whether by intention or merely in desperation, and Miltiades' men were fighting there. Most of my men and many of Miltiades went up into the camp and started to loot. The fighting by the ships was deadly. Aeschylus's brother fell there, and Callimachus, the polymarch of Athens. Simon, Miltiades' eldest son, took a wound there, and Ios was wounded when he leaped aboard an enemy ship and started to clear it. We were walking, I can hardly call it a march, along the beach, passing over the wreckage of the Persians, corpses of men and horses as thick as seaweed after a storm, dead meads cut down by Miltiades' men, and as clear as an actor on the stage of the Agora, I heard Ios calling. Then I saw him on the stern of an enemy ship, half a stardy away. I wasn't going to let him die while I had breath in my body. I started to run. At my back, all my Oikia followed me. Aristides and Miltiades heard him too, and like a flood, the best spears of the army converged on the stern of that ship. We weren't far, a hundred paces. How long does it take to cut your way through a hundred paces of panicked Medes and desperate Persians? Too long. I went through the remnants of the Medes with my trusted men at my shoulders, but then we hit the Persians, and we slowed. There were a dozen of them, not men I knew, thank the gods, but the same sort of men as Cyrus and his friends, and they fought like demons, and we slowed. Ios probably died then, while I was face to face with an armoured Persian. The Persian fought well. We must have exchanged four or five cuts before my spear ripped his forearm, and my next thrust sent his shade down to Hades. As I stepped past him, the Persians backed away, grabbing at a man with a hennaed beard. His helmet was gold and set with lapis, and I'd seen him before. That is, I thrust at him and saw my spear drive home under the skirts of his armor, and then his men were all around him. I was an arm's length from the ship where Ios lay dying, pierced fifty times, shot with arrows, and continuing to call the battle cry of Athens, so that the whole army heard him, and men pressed forward, possessed with the rage of Ares. 
The barbarians could have rallied. They certainly should never have lost a ship. But we cut into them the way the sickle cuts into the weeds at the edge of a garden. Ios's shouts grew weaker, and my blows fell faster, and I got a mead against the stern of the ship and punched my spear at him so hard that my spearhead stuck in the tar-coated wood. Then I dropped my shield and jumped. As I got my leg over the thwart, a Sakai archer cut at me, his short knife caught in my clamis and turned against my scale armor. With that axe in my right hand, I cut into him, and he fell away, and I got my feet under me. I could see the faces of the panicked oarsmen, and Ios collapsed across the helm. A spearman stood over him, having just stabbed him, and my axe licked out and cut the back of his knee so that his leg gave way, and he fell, spraying blood. But I hit him again and again and again, until the side of his helmet caved in. Now the blows of five men fell on my armor, and I had no shield. I took a wound in the thigh, just a pinprick, but enough to snap me out of the blood rage. Suddenly Aristides was beside me, using his spear two-handed, and then Miltiades came over the other gunwale, then Stygis, Gelon, Sophanes, Bellerophon, Fuser, Aeschylus, and we stormed that ship, the living wrath of Athena. Six more ships were taken and cleared before they could get to sea. The Athenians and the Plataeans were no longer an army, nor were the barbarians. They were a fleeing mob, and we were in the red rage of Nike and Ares, when men die because they care about nothing but more blood. Our fire burned hot, and many were consumed. Indeed, I've heard it said that more Athenians died by the ships than when the center broke. But I've heard a great many things said by Athenians about the battle, and a few of them are true, but most are pig shit. We lost a lot of men, and so did Athens, although Simon will tell you otherwise. We burned like a bonfire in a high wind, and then their last ship was away and we burned to ash. We were spent. We came to a stop so that a hush fell over the field. I suppose that wounded men screamed and gulls screeched and horses trumpeted their pain, but I remember none of that. What I remember is the hush, as if the gods had decided that all of us deserved a rest. I leaned on the haft of my looted axe and breathed. I don't know how long I was out of it, but ask any man who's been in the battle haze and he'll tell you that when you are done, you don't cheer, you just stop. When I came back to myself, I was sitting on the blood-soaked planks of the marine box. My thigh wound was open and bleeding again, and Miltiades was beside me. We'd cut our way from the stern by Ios's corpse to the bow. I was covered in blood, sticky, stinking blood. I think we've won, Miltiades said. He didn't sound proud or arrogant, or in any way like the hero of the hour. He sounded awestruck. We all were children. I don't think that we really believed we could win, or perhaps the issue was so much in doubt that we couldn't separate what we dreaded from what we hoped for. But as we watched the last shreds of the Persian cavalry swimming their horses out, and the ships closing round them to save them, we knew that these Persians were not coming back, especially when they abandoned their horses in the water. I remember then watching the ships creep past us from the north. Many had lost oarsmen as well as hoplites, and they didn't move fast. Behind me the victorious Athenians had started to sing. Some hymn to Athena I didn't know. Out across the water, a ship's length away or less, I saw the scorpion shield standing on the stern of a light trireme. The enemy ship was going past us, picking men out of the water, bold as brass. Thusser had an arrow, and he drew it to his chin, but I put my axe head in front of his arrowhead, just when he went to loose, and he cursed. Archilogos saw it all. His mouth formed an O. 
and his head tracked me as my eyes must have followed him. He raised his shield. Tell Briseis I send my greetings, I called across the water. His men rowed him away, and he didn't reply. It was harder to leap down from that hull than it had been to climb aboard. My muscles were seizing, and I remember Aeschylus catching me as I stumbled. We were much of an age, he and I. He was a good man, despite his jealousy of Phrynichus's success. Idomineus had my shield. You alive, boss? he asked. You've got a cut. So we bandaged my thigh again, and then we looked after the dozen cuts he had, one in his bicep so deep I couldn't see how he could use his sword arm. Aeschylus helped. I didn't realize then that he was standing a few paces from the corpse of his brother. Miltiades came up to me. I need the best men. He said quietly, We're not done. Just north of the plain, was an extensive stand of olive trees surrounded by a stone boundary wall. The Persians who had run north and west when their line gave way ran all the way around our army, but were cut off from the beach by the ruin of their camp. Being true Persians, they refused to surrender. They went into the walled olive grove and determined to die like men. Half of our army must already have started back across the fields to our camp by the time Miltiades became aware of what was happening, and good men had died, some of them Plataeans, trying to storm the olive grove. The rumor spread that Datis was there, and the Persian command staff. I gathered my Oikia, and Miltiades gathered his, and Aristides, his best men from the wreck of the center, and we walked north along the beach, and then through the Persian camp. We passed beautiful carpets and bronze urns, and I saw silk and finely woven wool, but we had no time to loot. I did pause to pick up a silver-studded sword. That, that one, honeybee. Look at that steel. Too light for me, but so well crafted. Hephaestus's blessing on the hand that made the blade that I would use it in preference to a better hefted blade. I found Hermogenes at the edge of the camp with Antigonus, who had a wound in the foot. Peneleos and Diocles were there, although other men who should have been with them, like Epictetus, were missing. Those are some tough bastards, Hermogenes said. He had four arrows in his shield. He looked sheepish. The Athenians tried to storm them and got in trouble. We just went in to help them out. He looked as if he would cry. I lost a lot of the boys. He said quietly. They beat us, Antigonus said. Miltiades took a deep breath. They're desperate men, he said. Surround the grove and get them tomorrow, Themistocles suggested. He had a dozen hoplites with him, and they looked as tired as the rest of us. Or oh, burn it. They'll break out in the dark, Aeschylus said. His voice was thick. He knew by then that his brother was dead, and he wanted revenge. They'll break out, and every cottage they burn, every petty farmer they kill will be on our heads. It was true. Tired men have no discipline, and the Athenians were tired. Indeed, every man looked twenty years older. Miltiades looked sixty. Aristides looked, well, like an old man, and Hermogenes looked like a corpse. Ever been exhausted, children? No, you are soft. We were hard like old oaks, but there was little flame left in us. I remember how I walked, forcing each step because I heard, and because my knees were shaking slightly. My sword wrist burned. Miltiades looked around. The sun was setting. Where had the day gone? And we had perhaps two hundred men of all the army standing there at the north edge of the enemy camp. Others were looting. 
but most were sitting on the ground or on their aspides, some singing, some tending wounds, but most simply staring at the ground. That's how it was, how it always is. When you're done, you're done. Miltiades watched the ships behind us. Where are they going? He asked suddenly. The barbarian fleet was forming up, out in the bay, and starting not east, towards Naxos or Lemnos, or an island safely owned by the great king, but south, towards Athens. They're making a stab for the city, Cleitus said softly. I hadn't seen him since the fighting started, and there he was, covered in dirt, as if he'd rolled in the fields. Perhaps he had. I had. His right arm was caked in crusted blood to the elbow. His spearhead dripped blood, and flies buzzed thickly around his head. Miltiades took a deep breath. He was the eldest of us, over forty, in fact, and his face beneath the cheekplates of his attic helmet was grey with fatigue. And below his eyes he had black lines and pouches like a rich man's wallet. But, as I say, none of us looked much better apart from Sophonis, who looked as fresh as an athlete in a morning race, and Bellerophon, who was grinning. We have to clear the olive grove as quickly as we can, Miltiades said. We can't leave them behind us. We'll have to march for Athens. There was a groan. I think we all groaned at the thought of walking a hundred stades to Athens. Miltiades stood straighter. We are not done, he said. If the old men and boys we left behind surrender the city to their fleet, and there are people in the town who might do it, then all this would be for nothing. He sighed. Pheidippides, the Athenian herald, pushed forward. Give me leave, Lord, he said, and I'll run to Athens and tell them of the battle. Miltiades nodded, his face full of respect. Go, and the gods run with you. Pheidippides was not a rich man, and had only his leather cuirass, a helmet, and his aspis. He dropped the aspis and helmet on the ground, and eager hands helped him out of his cuirass. He stripped his chiton off, and put his sword belt on his naked shoulder. Someone handed him a clamis, and he gave us a grin. Better than mine in camp, he said. I'll be there before the sun sets, friends. He'd fought the whole day, but he ran off the field, heading south, his legs pumping hard. Not a sprint, but a steady pace that would eat the stardis. Miltiades turned to me, or perhaps to Aristides, I have to get the army ready to march, he said. I need one of you to lead the assault on the grove. I'll give Miltiades this much. He sounded genuinely regretful. I'll do it, I said. Then we do it together, Aristides said. He looked at his men, the front rankers of his tribe. We need to do this, he said quietly. We broke. We must find our honour in the grove. Miltiades nodded curtly. Go with the gods, get it done and follow me. He took his hyperetes and began to walk across the fields. The boy at his side blew his trumpet, and all across the field Athenians and Plataeans looked up from their fatigue, summoned back to the phalanx. Many of my Plataeans were right there, perhaps a hundred men. They were a mix of front and rear rankers, the best and the worst, and the Athenians were in the same state, although there were more of them, and they had more armour and better weapons. Mind you, the Plataeans were working hard to remedy that, stripping the Persians at our feet. They can't have many arrows left, I said. Why not? Cletus asked. They'd be shooting at us. Teusser answered. Aristides smiled a little sheepishly. Then he frowned. You have a plan, Plataean? I shrugged. 
and the weight of my scale corslet seemed like the weight of the world. Even Cleithus, bloody Cleithus, who I hated, looked at me, waiting. The truth is, I didn't have enough energy to hate Cleithus. He was one more spear, and a strong spear, too. So I raised my eyes and looked at the grove. The precinct wall was about half a man tall, of loose stones but well built, and beyond the wall the grove climbed a low hill, completely inside the wall, of course. It was a virtually impregnable position. Seems to me they're as tired as we are, and their side lost. Nothing for them now but death or slavery. I was buying time, waiting for Athena or Heracles to put something in my head besides the black despair that comes after a long fight. I remember I walked a little apart, not really to think, but because the weight of their expectations was greater than the weight of my scale thorax and my aspis combined, and I wanted to be free of it for a moment. And it was as if a goddess came and whispered in my ear, except that I still fancy it was Aphrodite, whose hymn had been on my lips when I fell asleep, because I turned my head, and there it was. I put my helmet back on my head and my shield on my arm. I was only a few steps from the others. I see a way to distract them and save some fighting. I think you Athenians should go for them, right over the wall at the low point by the gate. The rest of us, you see the little dip in the ground there, I nodded my head. Don't point. If fifty of us go there, up that little gully, I doubt they'll see us coming. The rest of you form up twenty shields wide and ten deep. When we hit the grove, well, you come at the gate and it's every man for himself. Aristides nodded. If they see you coming, you'll be shot to pieces. He said. Then we'd best hope they're low on arrows. I said. No time for anything fancy. Someone shouted, Can we fire the grove? No time, I said. In truth, it was the best solution. L let me tell you something, young man. I believe in the gods. One of them had just shown me the gully, and that olive grove was sacred to Artemis, and the gods had stood by me all day. To me, this was the test. It is always the test of battle. How good are you when you are wounded and tired? That's when you find out who is truly a hero, my children. Anyone can stand their ground with a full belly and clean muscles. But at the end of the day, when the rim of the sun touches the hills, and you haven't had water for hours, and flies are laying eggs in your wounds, think on it because hundreds of us were measured, and by Heracles we were worthy of our fathers. You man enough for this, Platean? Cleithus asked, but his voice was merely chiding, almost friendly. Fuck off, I said, equally friendly. Let's get to it, Aeschylus said. He put the edge of his aspis between Cleithus and me. This isn't about you, Cleitus. I remember that I smiled. Cleitus, I said softly, and he met my eye. Today is for the Medes. I said. I offered my hand. He took it and clasped it hard. Aeschylus nodded. I asked to be the first into the grove, he said, for my brother. Athenians and aristocrats, not a scrap of sense. So the Athenians formed a deep block the width of the low wall. Behind the screen they provided, I took my Plataeans, household first, in a pair of long files, and ran off to the south, around the edge of the low hill. I pushed my legs to do their duty. I think run may be a poor description of the shambling jog we managed, but we did it. We ran around the edge of the hill, and there was the entry to the gully, as I'd expected. That gully wasn't as deep as a man is tall, but it was shaped oddly, with a small bend just before the west wall of the grove. And I trusted my guess and led my men forward, still in a file. 
the Persians had formed a line, not, to be honest, a very thick line, facing Aristides's small phalanx. We could see them, and by a miracle they still hadn't seen us. It was, well, miraculous. But on the battlefield, men die because they see what they expect to see. Then Aristides and Aeschylus led their men forward. They were so tired that they didn't cheer or sing the paean, but simply trotted forward, and all the Persians shot into them. The clatter of the arrows on their shields and the solid impacts drowned the sound of our movement. Form your front, I called softly, but my men needed no order. The men behind me started to sprint forward. I didn't slow. The neatness of our line was immaterial, and by the gods Aphrodite was there, or some other goddess lifting us to one more fight, raising us above ourselves. Two or three times in my life I've felt this, and it is beyond the human. And at Marathon, every one of us at the Grove felt it. I was at the edge of the gully, and it sloped steeply up, head height to the base of the stone wall. The Persians had assumed this part was too tricky for us to storm. I was first. I ran up the gully lip, and at the top a Persian shot me. His arrow smacked into my aspis at point-blank range, and then I was past him, over the wall in a single leap, and a flood of Plataeans poured in behind me. I have no idea who killed that man, or, to be honest, how I got over the wall. But we were in, past the wall, among the trees. I crashed into the end of the Persian line. Most of them never saw us coming, so focused were they on Aristides and his men to their front. They died hard. When they stood, we slew them, and when they ran, some in panic more just to find a better place to die, we chased them tree to tree. Those with arrows shot us, and those without protected the archers. Some had spears, and a few had aspides they'd picked up from our dead, and many had axes, and they fought like heroes. No man who survived the fight in the olive grove ever forgot it. Desperate, cornered men are no longer human. They are animals, and they will grasp the sword in their guts and hold on to it if it will help a mate kill you. The fight eventually filled the whole grove, and some of them must have climbed the trees. Certainly the arrow that killed Teuser came from above, straight down into the top of his shoulder by his neck. And Alcius of Melitus, who had come all this way to die for Athens, went down fighting, his aspis against two axemen, and I was just too far away to save him. A Persian broke my spear, dying on it, and another clambered over his body, and his short sword rang off my scales, but didn't go through, or I'd have died there myself. I put my arms around him and threw him to the ground, rolled on top of him to crush him, got my hands on his throat and choked the life out of him. That's the last moment in the battle I remember. I must have got back on my feet, but I don't remember how. And then I was back to back with Idomeneus, but the fighting was over. The fighting was over. All the Persians were dead. Idomeneus sank to the ground. I'm done, he said. I'd never heard those words from him, and never did again. That was Marathon. Equally, to be honest, I remember nothing of the march over the mountains to Athens, in the dark, save that there was a storm brewing out over the ocean, and the breeze of that storm blew over us like the touch of a woman's cool hand when you are sick. I must have given some orders, because there were nigh on eight hundred Plataeans when we came down the hills above Athens to the sanctuary of Heracles. And as each contingent came up, Miltiades met them in person. That part I remember. He was still in full armour, and he glowed. Perhaps that night he was divine. 
Certainly it was his will that got us safely over the mountains and back to the plains of Attica. The Plataeans were the last to leave Marathon, apart from Aristides' tribe, who stayed to guard the loot, and the last to arrive at the shrine of Heracles. And as we came in, not marching but shuffling along in a state of exhaustion, the sun began to rise over the sea, and the first glow caught the temples on the Acropolis in the distance. We've made it, friends, Miltiades said to each contingent. Men littered the ground. Shields were dropped like olives in an autumn wind, as if our army had been beaten rather than victorious. My men were no different. Without a word, men fell to the ground. Later, Hermogenes told me that he fell asleep before he got his aspis off his arm. I didn't. Like Miltiades, I was too tired to sleep, and I stood with him as the sun rose, revealing the Persian fleet still well off to the east. Even if they came now, he said, Pheidippides made it. See the beacon on the Acropolis? I could see a smudge of smoke in the dawn light. I nodded heavily. By Athena, Miltiades said. He stood as straight as a spear shaft, despite his fatigue. He laughed and looked out into the morning. We won. You should rest. I said. Mithiades laughed again. He slapped my back, grinned ear to ear, and for a moment he was not ancient and used up. He was the pirate king I had known as a boy. I won't waste this moment in the arms of sleep, Arimnestos, he said. He embraced me. I remember grinning because few things were ever as precious to me as the love of Mithiades. Despite the bastard's way with money, power, and fame, sleep would not be a waste. I said. He shook his head. Arimnastos, right now, this moment, I am with the gods. He said it plain, no rhetoric, and he wasn't talking to a thousand men feeding on their adulation. I honestly think every man in our army was asleep but us. No, he was telling the plain truth to one man, and that man was me. I remember that I didn't understand. I do now, but I was too young, and for all my scars and the blood on my sword arm, too inexperienced. He laughed again, and it was a fell sound. I have beaten the Persians at the gates of my city. I have won a victory, such a victory. He shrugged. Since Troy, he said, and burst into tears. We stood together. I cried too, Tugater. I cried. And the sun rose on the Persian fleet, turning away in defeat. Many men were dead, and many more would die. But we had beaten the great king's army, and the world would never be the same again. Truly, in that hour, we were with the gods. Epilogue A day later, the Spartans marched in on the road from Corinth. Their armor was magnificent, and their scarlet cloaks billowed in the west wind, and the head of their column was just in time to see the last of the barbarian fleet, as it turned away from the channel by Salamis and started back for Naxos. They marched over the mountains to Marathon and saw the barbarian dead, and then they marched back to Athens to shower us with praise. I think most of the bastards were jealous. Many men died at Marathon, my friends, and men who had followed me, and worse awaited me at home although I didn't know it. As soon as our likely wounded could walk, I took our men back over the mountains to Plataea. We still feared that Thebes might move against us. Indeed, Athens sent us a thousand hoplites to accompany us home, to show Thebes that they had backed the wrong horse. Athens could not do enough for us. 
to this day, Thugater, the priestess of Athena blesses Plataea every morning in her first prayer. And within the year we were made citizens of Athens, with the same citizen rights as Aristides and Miltiades, so that all those freed slaves were able, if they wished, to go back to Athens as free men. We came down the long flank of Citharon, three thousand men, new citizens and old, and the valley of the Asopus was laid out before us, the fields like the finest tapestry a woman could weave in soft colors of gold and pale green. At the shrine of the hero, Idomeneus halted his men, those who had survived, and we embraced. Good fight, he said with his mad grin. We poured libations for the hero, probably hundreds. It is odd, but one of my memories of that autumn day is the wine lying in pools before the hero's tomb. I had never seen so many libations poured there and the image of wine filling the wagon ruts is, to me, one of the strongest I associate with Marathon. We did not commit hubris. We gave thanks. Then we went down into the lengthening shadows of the valley, and we halted under our own walls and formed the phalanx one more time. Thousands of citizens came out to see us. Indeed, they'd known we were coming when the first glint of bronze was seen on the passes, and runners had long since brought them the tale of the battle and the number and names of the dead. We formed one last time, and Miron came out of the phalanx. I took off my helmet and handed him my spear. We are no longer at war. I said, I was the Archon of War, and I returned my spear. He took it. Plataeans, he said. I return you to your city, at peace. And they cheered, the hoplites, and the new citizens, and the women and children, and even the slaves. It would be good if I could leave it there. Pour me a little more wine. I looked around for euphoria, I hadn't really expected her, as she would have been in her ninth month. But I saw neither Hermogenes' wife, nor my sister. I remember that Antigonus and I stood together, and I had a joke at the edge of my tongue, about how for the first time we were timely and our wives were late. Before I could make that cruel jibe, one of my Thracians, the men I'd freed, came on to the field of Ares, he told us his news, tears running down his cheeks. To be honest, I don't remember anything after that until I stood by her bedside. I had missed her by perhaps three hours. There was blood. Enough blood that she might have died at Marathon. She had fought her own fight, a long one, and she had not surrendered or given way. She stood her ground until the very end and pushed our child out and died for it. I told her you were coming, Penn told me. She held me tightly against her and I felt nothing but the fatigue and the crushing lack of emotion that had dogged me since we stormed the olive grove. I told her and she held my hand. Oh, Penn wept. Antigonus wept. I felt as if I'd been wrapped in thick wool. I drank some wine, and later I lay on some blankets, my eyes open. Then, my choices made, I got to my feet. I lifted her. She weighed nothing and carried her outside to the stable. I took a horse. No great crime with a brother-in-law and I carried her body across my lap as I'd carried her over the mountains when first she was my bride. I carried her home. Of course, there was nothing left of my home but the forge. Cletus and Simon had burned my house. I laid her on the work table in my forge, 
and I put everything on her, every jewel Martyr had saved from the house, every piece of loot I'd taken from Marathon, or been given by thankful Athenians until she glittered like a goddess. Then I lit my forge. I prayed to Hephaestus, and I lit my torch from my forge fire. Then I set my forge ablaze, and I left it to burn as her pyre. It burned behind me, bright as a new sun. I rode down the hill, away from the farm and the fire. I rode steadily until I heard the crash as the roof tree gave, and the whoosh as the rest of the building leaped into new flame. And then I pressed my horse to a gallop and rode away. I never promised you a happy story. If I tell you more... If I tell you more, Thugater, it will be another night. And then I'll tell you how I broke the mold of my life and cast it away. How I went with Miltiades and then to Sicily and left Greece behind me. For now, though, leave an old man to weep old tears. So many dead, and only me to sing of them now. I am the last. But remember when you pray to the gods that men stood like the heroes of old at Marathon, and were better, and that they are still no better than the women who bear them. Wine. You've been listening to an Orion audiobook, Marathon, Book Two of the Long War series, by Christian Cameron, read by Peter Noble. Produced by the Audiobook Producers. The text is copyright Christian Cameron, 2011. The recording is copyright 2019 by the Orion Publishing Group. For information about other Orion audiobooks, visit the website at orionbooks.co.uk. For more on the works of Christian Cameron, please visit christiancameronauthor.com. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program. You have the name of an athlete. Do you know this big lummox charged the Persians single-handed at the Pass of Sardis? Cleon was proud to know me, proud to show me off to passers-by. I shrugged. You Alcidas of Eubea led the way, and there were ten of us. Cleon laughed. It froze my fucking blood just to watch by Aphrodite's burning cunt. His face was red, and I thought that he'd had too much wine already. You look rich and pampered, he went on. I thought he looked like a broken man. How are things with you? I asked. He had told me that his house was smaller than the stern galley on a trireme, and I could see it was true. My wife died, he said. He shrugged. And both of my children. Apollo sent some affliction and they were gone in a week. He looked at the floor. Then he straightened his spine. Anyway, how are you? Famous, son Talk of my fame made me nervous. I'm here because Idomeneus killed one of the Alcmeonids. I said to cover the pain in his eyes with facts. Men do these things. Men are cowards when it comes to sorrow. Good for bum boy. For a coal-eyed catamite, he's a fine man. Killed an aristocrat. That's something, he said. I laughed nervously. Cleon was drunk and difficult. Sophonies and Glaucon were both aristocrats, and they were not pleased. I shrugged. I have an appointment, I said. Damn, you remind me of better times. I'm not even a hoplite anymore, eh? Failed the property qualification. He looked at the floor and then hugged me. Damn, listen to me. All whines and self-pity. Come and see me again. I hugged him hard, took my two guards, and left for the potters. My two aristocrats clucked and muttered. 
and finally Glaucon spat that I had a friend of no worth. I stopped and put a hand on his shoulder, older man to younger. Cleon looked a little drunk. His wife and children have died. I held his eyes and the boy flinched. He stood his ground and kept men off me many times in the rage of Ares. When you have done as much, then you may speak of him in that way in my hearing. Glaucon looked at the ground. I apologize. I liked him for that. The young are superb at disavowing responsibility. Hades, I was myself, so I know what I speak of. But this one was a better man. We walked east into the morning sun, and I lightened the atmosphere between us with tales of Miltiades. I was beginning the tale of the fighting in the Chersonese and the tearless battle, where we took all the enemy boats with the loss of a dozen men and smashed the Phoenicians. When we crossed the festival road and found ourselves in the midst of a forest of brothels and taverns and free men's houses, only Athens could so hopelessly over-commercialize something as simple as sex. I remember losing the thread of my story as I contemplated. Well, I'll gloss over what I was contemplating, as you virgins would probably expire on the spot. So we took fishing boats. I remember saying, there was a fair fishing fleet at Kalipolis. The dagger punched into my back just above the kidney. The blow was perfectly delivered and had a great deal of force behind it. I staggered, fell to my knees and felt the blood leak out over my arse. I should have been dead. But I wasn't. So I rolled through the fall and rose, my clamis already off my throat and around my arm. As I came up, I had my knife in my right hand. Glaucon was down, but Sophanes was holding his own, his stick against two bullies with clubs. Even then, at seventeen, he was a foe to reckon with. My man was big. Titanic, in fact. I hate fighting big men. They don't feel pain. They have a natural confidence that is hard to break, and they are strong. My man was still trying to figure out why I wasn't dead. I shared his confusion, but I wasn't going to dwell on it. It crossed my mind that I probably didn't want to kill him. Legal troubles and all that. I sidestepped, got down in my stance and flicked my clamis at his eyes. Behind him, Sophanes landed a blow with a crack that must have been heard at the peak of Kitheron, and his man went down. The other backed away. My opponent had a club and a knife. He cut at me with the gross ineptitude of the professional bruiser. I killed him. It was no big deal. He was big, not skilled. And as the club rose, I put my knife in between the shoulder muscles and the throat. Interesting point, I can remember that I had been planning a much more complicated feint when he left himself wide open from sheer folly, and I took him. That's single combat. I threw my clamis over Sophanes' second opponent. It had corner weights and the gossamer wool settled like a net. Sophanes stepped in with his stave in two hands and broke the man's head as if we'd planned the move for weeks in the palestra. That was the fight. I felt much better. When you are enraged at injustice and humiliated by your helplessness in the face of towering bureaucracy, killing a couple of thugs is deeply satisfying. At least it is to me. Sophanes must have felt the same as he flashed me a grin and we embraced. Then he went to his friend who was starting to stir. I stripped the bodies of cash. Each had a little purse with a dozen silver owls. Quite a sum. The daemon of combat was wearing off, and suddenly I thought, why am I alive? The first blow should have been the last. I never saw it coming, and I was bleeding just a little from a deep puncture above my hip. A prostitute fetched water and cleaned my wound, and said a prayer for me. 
Meanwhile, I cast around the ground, trying to find the dagger. All I could think was that the blade must have snapped. The dagger was under the dead titan. Lost things are always in the last place you look, I find. Glaucon was getting colour back in his face, and a pair of local girls were stroking him while a doctor felt his skull. Sophonis helped me roll the dead man over, and there was the dagger, a single finger of bright steel sticking out of Aristides' wax tablet. Sophonis whistled and made a sign of aversion. The gods love you, Platean. I'd fought with pleasure, but the sight of the tablet with the dagger right through it made me shake for a moment. Just a moment. That close. I gave the girls, five owls, a fortune to make the body vanish. Sophonis was, I think, both appalled and thrilled. The morning was young, and I found a brothel keeper and had him take the other two thugs and lock them in his cellar which was cut straight into the rock of the hillside. I paid him, too. The free-spending habits of a life of piracy instantly conquered a few months' attempt to be a farmer. Kill people, take their money, spend it recklessly. Yet I had changed, because another part of me registered that I'd just spent the value of thirty-five medimnoi of grain at current prices merely to get rid of a body. We left Glaucon to recover, ostensibly to watch the prisoners. I went and bought a wine crater. It's that one right there. Achilles and Ajax playing polis. It tickles my fancy that it wasn't all war. Men had time to gamble at Troy. The sun was high, but not yet noon, when we got back to the brothel. Glaucon looked like a dog with too many bones. He'd had his flute played, I could tell. But the two men were both in the cellar. One was dead. Blows to the head can have that effect. Sophonis didn't like that, that he'd killed a man. I shrugged. If you fight, you will kill. I said. The other was terrified. He wasn't a citizen and the punishment for his crime would be the silver mines until he died. Nor was he brave. But all he knew was that some men and women, all veiled, had paid the titan to find me and kill me. They'd been paid at sunrise, in the grove of Pan. That's all he knew. I looked at him and tried a few more questions, listened to his tears, and cut his throat. Sophonis was shocked. I stepped back to avoid the flow of blood, and then handed the brothel keeper five more drachmas. He nodded to me, as one predator to another. The two boys who had been sent to guard me were spluttering. Listen, lads, I said. I caught their arms and held them. All he had coming was to be worked to death as a slave, right? I looked at both of them. And now the only story that will ever be heard is ours. Hard to cook up a lie if none of your witnesses can speak. You killed him. Glaucon got out after some muttering. He tried to kill you, I pointed out. That was in the heat of battle, Sophonis said. By Zeus Soter, Platean, this was murder. It's different. I shrugged. Not when you've killed as many men as I have, I said. Console yourself that he was a foreign mythic, probably an escaped slave, and a man of no worth whatsoever. He wasn't even brave. I wiped my knife on the dead man's chiton, poured a little olive oil from my aribalos to keep it bright, sheathed it, and headed up the rock-carved steps. We were a silent crew as we walked to my murder trial. I was pretty sure that my two companions were no longer in the grips of hero worship. Athenian justice is swift. I arrived a little early, but most of the Areopagitica was already on the hill, and the last of the old men made their climb just behind me. Aristides was there. He had a bruise on one shoulder that he hadn't had that morning. Tried to kill you, 
I said quietly. Yes, he said. And you, I take it. I handed him the tablet with the dagger through it. Heads turned all over the summit. He was angry. This is not Athens. He spat. What are we, some court of Medes? Some soft-handed Lydians? Next men will turn to poison. But then he calmed. This will tell in your favor. I'll hand it around. The symbolism is so clear, it's like an augury. The dagger through the law. So I watched the tablet passed from man to man, and the muttering must have helped me a little. Aristides was calm and forceful when the trial started. L let me digress a moment. You've noticed that I wandered the city without much trouble. I could have run, but of course I didn't. That's how it was then. Athens assumed that I would come to my trial, and I did. In a murder trial, each side gets one speech, a couple of hours by a water clock. First the prosecution, then the defense, and the verdict is delivered immediately after the defense delivers its argument. We're much the same in Plataea, although it's years since we had a proper murder trial. Simon, my cousin, killed himself rather than face the tribunal. So we all stood in the blazing sun, and Cletus of the Alcmeonids began his speech. I can't remember all he said, but I know it was damning, and at the same time, utterly inaccurate. I accuse Arimnestos of Plataea, the man who stands before you, of the murder of my cousin Nepos. Nepos was murdered within the precincts of a shrine, foully murdered with impiety, unarmed, standing, making an oration to the gods. Cletus had a good voice. I couldn't speak, but I could roll my eyes. So I did. All of you know of this man, a notorious pirate, a man who serves with the vicious cutthroat Miltiades. With Miltiades he sacked Naucrates. With Miltiades he attacked the great king's ships, and those of our allies at Ephesus and other places, over and over again. It is men like this who bring the just wrath of the great king down on our city. Well, I couldn't really disagree with that. So I smiled genially. Don't let this man's reputation as a fighter cloud your vision, though, gentlemen. Look at him. This is no Achilles. This is a fighter trained in the pits of slavery. A man who has neither arete nor generosity. He is merely a killer. Is the look on his brow more than that of a bestial destroyer? Is he different from a boar or a lion that kills the men who tend our crops? This is a man bred to slavery. And what he has now, he has stolen from better men, first through piracy, and then through open theft of a farm in Plataea. No man in Plataea dares act against him. They fear his wrath. But here in Athens we are better men, with a better strength of law. There was more, much more. Two hours of detailed and fallacious vilification. Cletus knew nothing of me, save some highly coloured details from Plataea, and it was obvious where they came from, because my cousin Simon, son of Simon who hanged himself, was standing a little to the left of Cletus, with a look of joyous hate stamped across his features. I locked eyes with him and gave him some bland indifference. By the time Cletus was finished, many of his audience were asleep. He had, after all, repeated the charges and assaults on my character fifteen or twenty times. His arrogance showed through too plainly. Heraclitus would have taught him better. At Ephesus, one of the things we learned was not to annoy a jury, nor to bore it. 
On the other hand, none of the men in that jury were my friends, and most were bored, only because they'd made up their minds before they put a sandal on the slippery rock of justice. The slaves came and refilled the water clock. I leaned over and pointed out Simon to Aristides, who looked at him and nodded to me. Aristides stood up slowly. He walked gracefully to the speaker's podium and turned to me. Our eyes met for a long time. Then he turned back to the jurors. My friend Arimnestos cannot speak here today, as he is a foreigner. He said, but although his tongue cannot speak, his spear has spoken loud and long for Athens, louder and longer than any of you Alcmeonids. If deeds rather than words were the weight of a man, if the price of citizenship were measured in feats of arms, not barley or oil, he would sit in judgment, and none of you would even qualify as Thetis. Ouch! Powerful rhetoric, but a damned annoying way to win over a jury. Aristides walked across to Cletus. You maintain that my friend is a slave, or some sort of penniless foreigner. Cletus stood. I do. Aristides smiled. And you have received my suit against you for the theft of a horse and a woman. I have taken them against the man's indemnity, Cletus said. In other words, you admit yourself that my friend was the owner of the horse and the slave. Aristides stepped back just like a swordsman who administers the killing blow and now avoids the fountain of blood. Cletus flushed red. He probably stole them, he shouted. But the Archon Basilius pointed his staff. Silence, he roared. Your time is done, and you speak out of turn. Aristides turned to the jurors. My friend is the son of Technes head of the Corvaxi of Plataea. My friend could, if he might speak, tell you how his father was murdered by the father of that man standing by Cletus and his farm stolen by the same man, and how Arimnestos later returned from ten years of war, war at the behest of Athens, I might add, to find his enemies in possession of his farm, he might speak of how the assembly of Plataea voted to punish the usurper, that man's father, and he might speak of what a twisted claim has just been made, accusations void of truth. Any man of Plataea would tell us, if called to witness, that my friend is master of a farm that provides three hundred measures of grain and oil and wine. Aristides had them listening now. But none of this matters. What matters is simple. My friend did not kill Cletus's useless cousin. In point of fact, Cletus's case is already void because he has spoken, and he may not speak again. Yet he has not troubled to prove that his cousin is dead. Cletus had missed the matter entirely. His head snapped up. His mouth worked. Really, cousin? For we are cousins, Cletus, are we not? You are too young to plead before this august body. You needed first to prove that your cousin Nepos is dead. Second, you needed to demonstrate that my friend was in some way linked to his death. Beyond the circumstance that he is from Plataea, if you had remembered, you would have maintained that your cousin died at the shrine of Latos, on the flanks of Kitheron. But like a young man, you let spite carry you away, and you forgot to mention the place of this supposed murder, or any other facts relating to it. What you have not told these worthy men is that your whole knowledge of this matter comes from two panicked slaves who returned to you, claiming that their master had been killed. 
You have never been to Plataea. You have no idea if the claim is accurate. You have acted on the word of two treacherous slaves. And in truth, as far as you know, at any moment your cousin Nepos may stroll into the crowd and ask what this is about. Cletus rose again. He is dead. He was killed at the shrine. The Archon rose. Silence this instant, puppy. Listen to me. Cletus spat. The Archon waved, and two gaudily dressed Scythian archers took Cletus by the arms and carried him off the hill. Aristides looked around in silence. I claim that my opponent has made no case. He has not shown a body. He has not offered a witness. There is nothing for me to answer but the slander of a traitor's son. I call a vote on the evidence presented. Stunned silence greeted him. The water clock was running noisily. It was still almost full. The Archon looked them over. I cannot direct you, he said. But if you pretend that Cletus has a case, I'll make you pay. I was acquitted, twenty-seven to fourteen, a carefully arranged vote as it meant that I could not claim damages from Cletus. Several men tried to force through a different boat that would have made me stand trial again, if more evidence could be gathered. They were still arguing when the sun set, and Aristides led me off the hill. You are the very Achilles of orators, I said. Aristides shook his head. That was bad. I used arts to win. Had I argued the case on its merits, they would have found a way to kill you. He rubbed his nose. I feel dirty. Perhaps I should exile myself. This is not law. This is just foolishness. The Archon was just. The Archon hates the Alcmeonids as upstarts and posturers. He's no friend of mine, but he'd raise me to Olympus if it would hurt the new men. All I had to do was put Cletus in a place where his arrogance would count against him. What now? I asked. I want my horse and my slave girl. Aristides shook his head. Perhaps in the spring. And if you stay here, you'll be dead. I don't have enough wax tablets to keep you alive. We walked to his farm, and Jocasta served wine. I told her the whole of the trial, while Glaucon and Sophanes sulked. They didn't love me any more. Aristides noted them. He inclined his long chin in their direction and raised an eyebrow at me. Hmm, I said. Jocasta was looking at her husband with her eyes shining. Should I invite this pretty foreigner to live in our house? so that I can finally hear what happens at your trials, love. She asked. To me, she said, He never tells me a word of his speeches. The great man looked down his nose. If I told you my speeches, you would only seek to improve them. He said, I could not bear that. Their eyes met, and I felt a twinge of jealousy. Not bodily jealousy, like a boy feels when a girl leaves him for another, but something in the soul. Those two had something I had never had, something calm and deep. Why are the boys on edge? Aristides asked quietly. I killed some thugs, I said. I saw the effect my words had on the lady. Killing was part of life for me, not for her. Sorry, Despoina. When Aristides shrugged, I clarified why the two young men were upset. One I killed in cold blood. Aristides shuddered in revulsion. How can you do such things? He asked. It's much like killing a man in a fight, only quicker. I retorted. His squeamishness. Did I mention that he was a prig? Offended me. 
I cannot have you under my roof while you are tainted with such a crime. Aristides said, I all but fell over in shock. They attacked us. But I could see it on his face. This was Athens. I had spent too long in the camp of Miltiades. Men didn't simply cut other men's throats here. I had unwittingly committed a crime and offended my host and patron. I'm no fool. I got to my feet. I understand, my lord. But the man... What was before him but death in the mines? And he might have been used against us in law. Aristides kept his head turned away, as if breathing the same air as me would hurt him. A thug. A metic. He could never have been used in a trial, and you should know better. Are you a god, that you may choose who lives and who dies? You killed him because it was easy. Alas, he was right. A god, or one of the fates, might well say that this man had no future but a straight trip to the mines and a few months of wretchedness. Aristides pulled his clamis over his head in disgust. You have no such knowledge. You killed him for convenience, your own convenience. Now I am beginning to doubt my wisdom in defending you. Jocasta was standing as far from me as possible. They were a very religious household, and my bloody pragmatism now looked to me as it did to them, like selfish crime. I had two choices, the amoral outrage of the pragmatist, or admission that I had acted wrongly. Rage rose within me, but Heraclitus was there too. You are right, I said. I clamped down on my anger. It was wrong, ugly, unworthy. Aristides raised his head. You mean that? Yes, I said. You have convicted me in the court of my own mind. I should not have killed him, though he was of no use, even to himself. I shuddered. It was so easy to fall back into the habits of the pirate. Cleanse yourself, he said. I need my horse and my woman, I said. I swore an oath. Aristides shook his head. Cleanse yourself, and perhaps the gods will provide. There were in those days a number of temples that offered cleansing from the stain of death and impiety. Even the shrine to Latos in Plataea, although that was open only to soldiers. But the principal places of cleansing for crime were Olympia, Delphi, and Delos. And of the three, Delos was easiest to reach, though most distant in Stadis, I suppose. And the Apollo there was the most ready to listen to a common man. I will go to Delos, I said. You can be in Sunion by morning, Aristides said. Have you money? I didn't tell him I still had twenty drachmas from the dead men. Yes, I said. Gods speed you there, Aristides said. He stood by me while I rolled my blankets and an old bearskin, then followed me out of his gate. Listen, Arimnestos. You may take me for a pious fool or a hypocrite. Neither, my lord. We were alone in the dark. You need to be gone before your wagon arrives with the corpse and the goods, and they find an excuse to take you again. I will try to find your girl, but this murder is a stain, and you must be clean before you come back here. It may be that some god led you to it, because you do need to be gone, and tonight is better than tomorrow. He shrugged. They will kill you if they cannot convict you. I don't fear them, I said, but I wasn't telling the truth. In a year the balance will change. Right now you cannot be here, 
Even Plataea might prove dangerous for you. Go to Delos, and do as the gods bid you. He held out his hand. I do not fear pollution so much that I would not clasp your hand. And then I was walking in the dark, down the rocky road to Sunion. Chapter 3 I managed to find a ship at Sunion, practically on the steps of the Temple of Poseidon. He was a Phoenician bound for Delos, with a cargo of slaves from Italy and Iberia. I didn't think very highly of slavers, and I dislike Phoenicians on principle, even though they are great sailors. But I took it as a test from the gods, and I kept my eyes open and my mouth shut. All the slaves were Iberians, big men with heavy moustaches, tattoos, and the deep anger of the recently enslaved. They eyed my weapons, and I kept my distance. They all looked like fighting men. The Nabark, a man with a beard, trimmed the Egyptian way, curling like a talon from his chin, made them row in shifts between his professional rowers. He was training them so that he'd get a better price. He planned to sell the best of them at Delos, and the rest at Tyre or Ephesus. Ephesus? I asked. Ephesus always interested me. The satrap of Phrygia has an army laying siege to Miletus. He said his fleet is based at Ephesus. That was news to me. Already? I asked. The fall of Miletus, the most powerful city in the Greek world, or so we thought would be the end of the Ionian Revolt. Once again I have to leave my tale to explain. In those days most of the cities of Ionia, and there were dozens, from beautiful Heraclea on the Euxin, down along the coast of Asia to mighty Miletus, then to Ephesus, the city of my youth, richer than Athens by a factor of five times, across the Cyprian Sea to Cyprus and Crete. More Greeks lived in Ionia than lived in Greece, except that most of those Greeks lived under the rule of the King of Kings, the great King of the Persians. While I was growing to manhood in the house of Hipponax, I lived under Persian rule. The Persians ruled well, Thugater, Never believe the crap men say today about how they were a nation of slaves. They were warriors and men of honor, in most cases more honor than we Greeks. Artafernes, the satrap of Phrygia, was the friend and foe of my youth. He was a great man. In those days, in my youth, the Greeks of Ionia rose up to throw off the shackles of Persian slavery. Ha! Now there's a load of cow shit. Selfish men seeking power for themselves cousined the citizens of many Ionian cities to trade the safety and stability of the world's greatest empire for freedom. To most Ionians, that freedom was the freedom to be killed by a Persian. None of the Ionians trusted each other, and every one of them wanted power over the others. The Persians had a unified command, brilliant generals and excellent supplies, and money. The Ionian Revolt had lasted for ten years, but it was never much of a success. And when this story starts, as I was sailing as a passenger on a slave ship, it was entering its final phase, although we didn't know it. The Persians had seemed at the edge of triumph before, and each time the revolt had been rescued, usually by Athens, or by Athenians acting as surrogates for their mother city, like Miltiades. But Athens had its own problems, the near civil war I described. Persian gold was pouring into the city, inflating the power of the aristocratic party, 
and the Alcmeonids, and the Pisistratids were backed by Persia to restore the tyranny. Not that I knew that then. Persian gold was paralyzing Athens, and the Persian axe was poised over Miletus. To the Navarc of this slave ship, all this meant that he could make a handsome profit selling half-trained rowers to the Persian fleet anchored on the beaches around Ephesus, supporting the siege of Miletus. I listened, and managed not to speak. We were fifteen days, making a three-day voyage, and I hated that ship by the time we landed. His long black hull was swift and clean, and for a light trireme he was the very acme of perfection. Yet this Phoenician cur sailed him like a pig. The Phoenician was afraid of every cup of wind, and he stayed on a coast to the very end of a headland and crossed open water with visible reluctance. I've never loved the Phoenicians, but most of them were brilliant sailors. Every pack has a cur. I sat alone in the bow, sang the hymn to Apollo as we sing it in Plataea. I have Apollo's raven on my shield, and prepared myself to meet the god of the lyre and the plague. I tried not to think of how easily I could take this ship. Those days were gone. Or so I thought. The last night at sea, I had a dream, such a dream that I can remember wisps of it even today. Ravens came to me and carried my good knife away, and one of them set a lyre in my hand as a replacement. I didn't need a priest to tell me what that meant. The most dangerous of the Iberians, you could see it in his eyes, had a raven tattooed on his hand and another on his sword arm. When the slaver's stern was set in the deep sand of a Delian beach, and his people were moving cargo, I dropped my heavy knife into the blackness under the Iberian's bench, while he lay watching me, exhausted from rowing. Our eyes met. I nodded. His face was completely blank. I wasn't even sure he'd seen the knife, and I went ashore, poorer by a good blade. Priests are priests the world around. I've noted a certain similarity from Olympia to Memphis in Egypt. Many of them are good men and women. A few are remarkable, genuinely blessed. The rest are a sorry lot. People who probably, in my opinion, couldn't make a living any other way except as beggars or farm labor. The man who met me as I kissed the rock by the stern of the slave ship was one of the latter. His hands were soft, and his hand clasp was limp and unpleasant, and his soft voice wished me a speedy encounter with the god in a voice that seemed all too ready to wheedle and plead. You are Arimnestos of Plataea, he said. Well, that took me aback. I was naive then and didn't know the effort to which the great priesthoods went to be informed. Nor did I suspect how carefully engineered this might be. Yes, I allowed. Brought here by the god to hear your penance for murder, he said in the same voice that a man might tease a girl into his blanket roll. I didn't like him. But he had me, I can tell you. Yes, I said. The god has spoken to us of you, he said. He leaned his chin on the head of his staff. What have you brought? as offering. Just like that. My feet were still on the sand of the beach, and the priests of Apollo wanted their fees. I sighed. I've served Apollo and Hephaestus all my life, I said. I revere all the gods, and I serve at the shrine of the hero Lathos of Plataea. 
this by way of my religious credentials, so to speak. He said nothing. His eyes flickered to the purse in my hand. I have twenty drachmas, less the one I owe as passage to that slave trader. Need I mention that the priests of Apollo played an active role in the trade? Nineteen silver owls. That is all the duty you pay to the god. You, who are called the Spear of the Greeks. He shook his head. I think not. Go back and return when you intend to give the god his due. Now, lest you young people miss the accounting, nineteen silver owls was the value of a farm's produce for a year. But of course it was as nothing next to the profits a man might make trading, or as a pirate. I didn't know what to say. I had more respect for priests in those days, even venal creatures like this one. These nineteen drachmas are all I have, I protested. He laughed. Then Lord Apollo will give you nineteen drachmas worth of prophecy. I can feel his words in my heart. Go, and come back when you have learned enough wisdom to pay your tithe. Perhaps at eighteen I'd have obeyed, but I was older, out of my way. I said, I need to find a priest. He oozed insult. I am the priest. The god has a sign. I shrugged and pushed past him. I suspect the god can do better. He followed me up the rock, and his voice became increasingly shrill as he demanded that I speak to him. But I continued up the steps to the temple complex. At the gate he was still shouting at me as I asked the porter to find me a priest. The porter grunted, and I gave him a drachma and he sent a boy. Adam Nestos of Plataea, the priest from the beach persisted. This is not the way a gentleman behaves. Only eighteen drachmas left, I said. And by the time I get a new guide to the altar, there will be none. Your arrogance will be your death, he said. You seek to cheat the god. I do not. I said. I am a farmer in Beotia, not a pirate in the Kersanese. These coins are a fair share of my fortune in the last year. I said so, but I began to be afraid. Those coins were, as you know, taken from the corpses of men who tried to kill me. Perhaps the coins were polluted. But essentially my words were true ones. The eighteen coins in my purse were more than a tenth of all the coins I had in the world. Why have you requested a second guide? A hard voice asked. This priest was older, dressed in a simple wool garment that had seen better days. Thrasybulus, why have I been summoned? You may go back to your cell, the oily man behind me answered. This arrogant Beotian is attempting to bargain with God. I wish to be washed by the God for a murder committed in Athens, I said. If the God has words for me to hear, I would laugh with delight to hear them. But this man asks me for money I do not have. I pointed at the younger priest. The older man rubbed his beard. What price have you offered? He asked. He is silence, Thrasybulus. The older priest seemed a different kind of man. I have offered eighteen drachmas, I said. It is all I have. The cost of three new bulls. He looked at me. He can do better, much better. Thrasybulus pointed at the metalwork on my empty scabbard. The older man sighed. This is unseemly. The priesthood of Apollo does not bargain like fishwives on the beach. The porters laugh, 
suggested that this statement was not entirely true. I am Dion of Delos, the older man said. I am principally a scholar, and I seldom lead men to the gates. But Thrasybulus has, I fear, earned your displeasure. The older man glared at the younger. You will need silver for food, and passage home as well, will you not? I nodded. Give me twelve drachmas for your sacrifices, and I will lead you to the god. He said. Thrasybulus spat. You are a liar before the god, he said, pointing at me. Not an auspicious start to my time on the island of Apollo. That evening I made the first of my three sacrifices, this one on the so-called Altar of Ash. I sacrificed a black lamb, a symbol of my crime, and I told the god and all the other men waiting to sacrifice how I had come to kill the thug in Athens, and what my sin was, the sin of hubris, in feeling that I was as fit to decide his fate as the gods. Other men sacrificed for other crimes. One from Crete had killed his son with a javelin, an error, a grievous miscast while hunting. Another had slept with a foreign woman during her courses and felt unclean. I almost laughed, but everyone else seemed to feel this was a serious thing. Several men were soldiers, mercenaries, who had come to atone for killing other Greeks over dice or in battle. Two men were guilty of gross impiety. My sacrifice was refused. I took the animal to the altar and killed it, but the fire would not accept the beast. I saw it myself. The same happened to one of the men guilty of impiety and the man who had killed his son. My priest, Dion, led the three of us from the altar. He took us to a hut made of brush on the cliff high above the beach. You will remain here for a week, eating clean food and drinking only water. Consider how you became unclean. Consider your life. I will return for you. That was a long week. The Cretan was called Heracles. He was tall and strong, noble in his carriage, and so broken by grief that it was hard to speak to him. He felt the guilt that I did not feel. He felt that he had killed his son and deserved the wrath of the god, while I felt that I had acted hastily, selfishly, but that I had now learned my lesson and did not deserve the wrath of Apollo. Yet I had enough sense to see that I had far more culpability than this Cretan lord. In fact, he was mistaking sorrow for guilt. I sat with him night after night, held his hand and spoke to him of hunting, and of Crete, a place I knew well. I could get him to listen, and I could make him smile, and then some chance of speech would cast him back into the pit. I am cursed, he said. I have killed my son, and now my wife is barren. Take a concubine, I said with all the arrogance of youth. I cannot replace eighteen years of my life and his just by making another squawking babe. He shot back with more spirit than I'd seen so far. Lord, you can. And then you must toil for as many years again until he comes to manhood so that your patronage is secure. I spoke carefully, for I felt I might be speaking wisdom. He sighed. Perhaps... He said, You are young, when you have seen fifty winters. Tell me how you feel about lasting through another fifteen seasons of war and the hunt. My joints hurt just lying here. The other man was a blasphemer, 
I could tell this because he swore by various gods every hour on the hour and cursed the gods for setting him on Delos. He was a little man, in mind, not stature, and a lesson to anyone who would listen about the vices men can get into through idleness and superstition. I might have been a foolish young man, but I was the very king of piety next to Philocrates. If you care so little for the gods, why did you come here and confess? I asked him. He shrugged. I swore an oath. Nothing big. Just part of a business deal. I never meant to pay the bastard. He was cheating me. But the priest of Zeus in Halicarnassus will not let me do any business in the Agora until I atone. He shrugged. All mummery. No greater liars or thieves than those priests. And grunted. And now I have to put up with this. My money is as silver as everyone else's. Fuck the gods. Why am I singled out? Because they think I should pay more. He spat. I didn't like his attitude. But I had to agree with the sense of his complaint. You're hardly repentant. I said... What are you, some kind of aspiring priest? He asked. Fuck off. I'll eat my bread and water for a week, and if they don't take my sacrifice, I'll sail away and let them dance for the money. But the god? I asked. How much of a bumpkin are you? He asked me. Listen, there's a pair of bellows behind the altar. They manipulate them to decide which sacrifices are accepted and which rejected, right? You understand, boy? Or are you too thick? There are no gods. All you get is what you take. I felt the sort of shock that a man might feel when lightning strikes too close at sea. I had thought of myself as a man of the world. I was a hardened killer, a soldier of fortune, a former pirate. But that men would manipulate the sacrifices of the gods, or that this man would claim there were no gods... Heraclitus told us that such men were contemptible, but very brave. Only small men are incapable of seeing something greater than themselves, my master once said. So I shook my head at Philocrates. You're a sad case, I said. He just smirked. Bumpkin. He shot back. The week was hard. I drank water and watched the sun, and I sang a hymn to Apollo every day. I set myself a task, to remember all the men I had killed. Of course, there were men I couldn't remember. The Carians at Sardis and Ephesus had died in the anonymity of their armor, and the Phoenicians I'd killed on my ship during the mutiny didn't even have faces in my memory. But I was able to conjure up fifty men in the theater of my head. And that seemed a great many. And I had probably killed twice that. Or even three times. A week of consideration, and it seemed to me that the god was right to refuse my sacrifice. I killed too easily. I decided. It wasn't a hard decision to reach. After all, Heraclitus had said as much most of the days of my youth. When old Dion came for me, he was leading another black ram. Did you dream? He asked. I shrugged. I had dreams. I said. I dreamed once of a man I killed, a boy I put out of his misery on a battlefield. And I dreamed of a woman I love. Dion led me to the highest headland on the island, the ten stardis or more from our hut. The ram followed along obediently. Then he sat me down on a seat carved from the living rock. And why do you think the god refused your sacrifice? He asked. I looked out over the sea. There were a dozen ships on the beach below me. Two of them I knew, and I sat up with a start. That's my ship, I said. It was Storm Cutter, and he still had the Raven of Apollo on his sail, the first ship I had ever owned, spear one from the Phoenicians, 
Even now, his Navarch was likely to be one of my chosen men. Dion raised an eyebrow. Men have been asking for you for three days, he said. But you are in the gods' hands. Answer my question. The god refused my sacrifice because I kill too easily and for little things. I said. And yet even as I say this, I wonder what the god asks of me. I am a warrior. Dion nodded. I thought you were a farmer and a bronze smith. Dion was a decent priest, so I said what came to mind. The sight of that ship raises my heart in a way that my anvil never does. I confessed. So, Dion said. Now he smiled. So now you are confused. I laughed. Yes, I said. Answer me a question, priest. He shrugged. It is my place to ask. But I'll answer one question, if I can. I pointed at the temple. Is there a pair of bellows mounted in the altar of ash to control the flame of the sacrifices? Dion nodded. When you work bronze, do you use bellows? He asked. I nodded. And do you pray to Hephaestus to guide your hand when you work? Of course, I said. Before I started my helmet, I omitted the prayer and my work failed. Dion nodded again. And yet you had bellows, and a hammer, and an anvil, I expect. I did, I said, seeing his point. And if you sought to work bronze, and you prayed, and yet had neither bellows nor an anvil? He asked. I'd be a fool. I agreed. Some of us here are fools, Dion said. His eyes narrowed. I am not one of them. Are you? I'm still not sure I understand what the God asks of me, I said. The confession of confusion is often the beginning of wisdom, he said and slapped my knee. Let's make sacrifice. My ram died well, and the god accepted him in a blast of fire, and I walked down the steps of the altar, my bare feet treading on the burnt remnants of thousands of animals sent to the heavens here, so that I wondered for a moment what a herd they'd make and what the first animal to die here had been. Let me also note that the god accepted the sacrifice of the impious trader and rejected the sacrifice of the Cretan lord who had killed his son. My confusion deepened. There is more to God than a pair of bellows and an altar, Dion said. He's a good man and the god will send him home when he is ready. The next morning, in the first blush of dawn, I waited in the cleft at the base of the altar, clad in simple white linen without so much as a stripe woven in. The cleft smelled of almonds and honey, and I was afraid. Hard to say why, exactly. Dion held my shoulder while the first supplicant crawled up and into the cleft. He was gone for a long time, and when he returned... He was as white as a corpse and couldn't stand up, so that three acolytes had to carry him. When he was able to speak, priests gathered around him like sharks around a kill, demanding to know what words the god had spoken. Then it was my turn. Men were known to die confronting the god in the cleft. No amount of spearcraft on my part could avoid death if the god intended it for me. And I was afraid. The cleft itself was odd. A big shelf of rock overhung another, and the cleft was between them, so that a man had to climb up first, as if into a hearth. I could just get my head and shoulders through the gap, and I banged my knees badly and the smell of almonds 
grew stronger all around me. The priests had told me not to flinch and not to stop climbing, so I felt in front of me with my hand, all black, and me lying on my back, and I found the next handhold and pushed myself up with my legs, crouching and pressing myself flat against an invisible rock surface. My head bumped rock, and I felt a breeze on my face. I got a knee up and scraped it again, but the pain was far, far away. And then I was up on the second shelf, breathing like bellows. Eh, 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 said the dying man at my elbow. I looked at him, and he was younger than me, and Carlos, even at the point of death, with big, beautiful eyes that wanted to know how his world had turned to shit. His skin where it was not smeared with sweat and puke was smooth and lovely. He was somebody's son. I drew my short dagger, really my eating knife, from under my scale shirt where I keep it, and I put my lips by his ear. Say good night, I said. I tried to sound like Pater when he put me to bed. Say good night, laddie. Good night. He managed. Like a child, the poor bastard. Go to Elysium with the thought of home, I prayed, and put the point of my eating knife into his brain. I tried to stand, and my head hit the rock. I whirled, and I couldn't find the cleft any more. I knelt, and my knees were bleeding. How strong are you, killer of men? A voice said, uh, to be honest, I suspect I may have whimpered. I have no memory past that, until I was kneeling on the sand of the beach, puking my guts out like a babe. Dion held my hand. You are clean, and the God has spoken through you. He said, gently, I will send word to Aristides. You know Aristides? I asked. Dion smiled. The world is not so big. He said. Did the god have words for me? I asked. Dion nodded. Simple words. Simply obeyed. You are lucky. He patted me on the head. I was that weak. When you leave the temple, obey the first man you meet. Through obeying him, you will do a service for the god. It will come straight to you like an arrow. He held out his hand, and I got to my feet. A slave brought me water, and I drank it. Are you ready? My head was spinning, but the world was growing calmer by the moment. Yes, I said. I add, on my own account, the priest said as he led me up to the altar that if you were to hold your hand when you could kill, each time you acted so would count as a sacrifice to Lord Apollo. Mm. I said, but I knew that this was the most important message and the lesson I had come to Delos to learn. The stuff about the first man outside the temple... I'd seen Miltiadi's ship on the beach. I knew who would be waiting for me outside the temple, and I was cynical enough to wonder how much my former lord had paid for me. I sacrificed at the low altar and the high altar, and then I changed my temple garments for my own Beotian wool, with my own sturdy boots and my own felt hat, and the hilt of my own sword under my arm. I looked for my knife, and then I remembered that I'd given it to the slave, or it was lost in the bilges of a Phoenician slaver, rusting away. I kissed Dion on both cheeks. I couldn't help but notice that Thrasybulos was standing by the portico, eyeing me the way a butcher eyes a bull. Thank you, I said. You doubt? Dion said. I, too, doubt. Doubt is to piety what exercise is to athletics. But the gods spoke to you, and in a day or less you will see. 
Then I walked down the steps of the portico. I contemplated briefly a dramatic assault on my fate. I wondered what would happen if I ran to the left, accosted the slave sweeping the steps, and demanded that he order me to do something so that I might obey. But some things are ordained. Whether the hand of man or the hand of the gods is in it, matters little, as the petty hands of men may well be the tools of the gods as well. Dion's Lesson So I walked down the steps to where Miltiades stood, his arms crossed over his magnificent breastplate of silvered bronze. His helmet was between his feet, and his shield was being held by his hispatist. His son, Simon, stood behind him, also arrayed for war. In truth, my heart soared to meet them. Command me, Lord, I said. Follow me, he said, as his arms embraced me and he crushed me against his chest. Just those two words, and my fate was sealed. Again. Miltiades had had a bad season, and he'd lost two ships in the fighting. He had three ships on that beach, his own with Paramanos of Cyrene as his helmsman, whom I embraced like a brother, Simon with a long low trireme he'd taken himself, and Stephanos of Chios, a man my own age who had served under me every step of the ladder and now had my own storm cutter. Take command, Miltiades said, as I embraced Stephanos. I looked at Stephanos. He shook his head. I can't afford to run a warship yet, he said. It was true. It took treasure to keep a ship at sea, scraped clean and full of willing rowers. I turned to Miltiades. All my money gone? I asked. I'd left him my treasure when I went back to the farm. The Athenian shrugged. I'll repay you, he said. It's been a bad season. We've been fighting Medes and not taking ships. More losses than gold derricks. He shrugged. I lost two ships in the Euxin. I need captains. Who told you I was on Delos? I asked, curious. Not even angry. Fate is fate. I did. Idomineus said. He stepped out from the crowd of rowers as if produced by the machine in a play. I came to Athens with a wagon of goods and a corpse. Aristides took it all off my hands and told me to follow you. He grinned. I thought you were going back to the real world. Who's tending the shrine? I asked. Ajax, who served against us in Asia, and Stygis, he said. My hispotist had an answer for everything. I nodded. Will you be helmsman? I asked Stephanos. He grinned. Captain, my marines? I asked Idomineus. He grinned too. I didn't grin. I sighed, wondering why it was so easy to fall back into a life I thought I'd put behind me. Wondering why the god who asked that I avoid killing men would send me back to the life of a pirate. But before the sun slipped any farther down the horizon, our stern was off the beach and we were at sea. We weren't particularly elegant. My lovely storm cutter was unpainted, unkempt, and down thirty rowers from her top form. Neither of Miltiades' other ships was doing any better. Stephanos followed my eyes and nodded. It's been bad, he said. Artaphernes is no fool. That I knew, and hearing his name brought to mind the messenger I'd left waiting in the courtyard of my house in Plataea. I turned to Idomeneus. Did you stop by my home before rushing after me? I asked. Of course, Lord, he said. Where do you think I got the wagon or all the bronze? Any messages? 
I asked. He laughed. Despoina Penelope says that if you make money, you'd better send some home. Hermogenes says that he'll sit this one out. And there's a message from the satrap of Phrygia. He held out an ivory tube, slyly, knowing that he was causing me a certain consternation. I took it. Inside was a letter from Artafernes, inviting me to come and serve him as a captain, at a rate of pay that made me gasp. I knew he would remember me. I had saved his life, and he had saved mine. This was the message I had spurned in Plataea. As I contemplated the ways of the gods, a single curl of milk-white parchment fluttered in the breeze, peeking out of the scroll tube. I almost missed it. And when I saw it, I plucked at it, and it escaped me and flew away, but Idomeneus trapped it against the mast. On it, in a strong hand, was written, Some men say a squadron of ships is the most beautiful. But I say it is thou who art beautiful. Come and serve my husband, and be famous. Briseis. That night we landed on an empty beach on the south coast of Mykonos. After we'd eaten cold barley and drunk bad wine, I approached Miltiades. Hear anything of Briseis? I ventured. I'm sure I asked with the attempt at casual disinterest for which the young strive when they really want something. Your sweetheart is married to Artaphernes, he said. He shook his head and made as if to rest it in the palms of his hands, too weary to go on. He was mocking me. She's always by his side, or so I hear. Simon nodded. She wanted to be the Queen of Ionia, he said. It seems she's chosen her side, and her brother is no longer with the rebellion either. He's been restored to all his estates in Ephesus. She may have been the price of his return to the fold. I didn't weep. I took a deep breath and drank more wine. Good for her, I said though my voice betrayed me. And Simon was a good man, and let it rest. What's the plan? I asked Miltiades, after some time had passed. We do what we can to rebuild, the tyrant of the Chersonese said. We prey on their shipping and use the proceeds to rebuild my squadron, and then we retake some of the towns on the Chersonese. You've lost all the towns? I asked. Simon stepped between his father and me. Arimnestos, he said. This is it. This is all we have. He put his arm around my shoulder. And unless we convince Athens to get off its arse and help, Miletus will fall, and the Persians will win everything. When I had left Miltiades, he had four towns and ten triremes. I nodded. Well, I said, I guess there's a lot of work to do. Morning found us at sea, south of Mykonos, our sails full of wind as we bore north by east for Chios, now the heart of the rebellion and the only island on the coast whose harbours were open to us. About the time the sun rose clear of the sea, Stephanos spotted a sail on our bow. We watched it incuriously until it stood clear of the water with a hull beneath it, and then I recognized my Phoenician slaver. I closed with Miltiades stern to stern. See that ship? I said. Phoenician slaver full of Iberians to be delivered to Artaphernes. I remember grinning. It was as if the god had sent this gift to me. Legitimate prize of war, I shouted. Not that we were ever too precise about such stuff. Any Phoenician was fair game. Miltiades whooped. Yours if you can catch him, he shouted. 
and I was away. October is not the best month for a long chase in the Ionian Sea. October is the month when the winds change, and the rains become cold, and Poseidon starts to reckon on his tithe of ships. But it was a beautiful day, with a golden sun in a dark blue sky, and I'd spent fifteen days on that dark hull. His oarsmen hated the slaver, and he was undermanned like all men who made a profit selling their oarsmen. On the other hand, the ship carried more sails than I could, and his hull had a finer entry. Storm Cutter had started his life as a Phoenician heavy trireme, and nothing in his build was for racing. Even fully crewed, he was not the fastest. He had one great point. He was strong. I took Storm Cutter to windward, under oars, as if I was departing the rest of the squadron heading north across the wind for Thrace. When I was over the horizon, the sun was already high in the sky. And now I put my oarsmen to work, pulling hard while the sails were up, so that we piled speed on speed. Sometimes this works, but this particular set of oarsmen, not the same men I'd left in this hull, I'll add, weren't up to it and in the main their oars served only to slow the rush of water down our side. I cursed and put the wind directly aft. The wind was stronger than it had been in the morning, and the sky at my back was growing dark, and many of my oarsmen were muttering. All afternoon we raced along until I had to brail up the mainsail to keep something from carrying away, and still we had no sight of our prey, or even of Milpiades. Now I feel like a fool. I said quietly to Stephanos. He made a face. We should be up with them now. He said. I couldn't figure it out. We lost time on our first leg. I said. But unless he turns south... Miltiades made chase as soon as we went over the horizon. Idomeneus said. He needs rowers too. I grunted. I'd forgotten what a rapacious bastard my lord was. Pushed him south and didn't catch him, I added. Can we stay at sea with this crew? I asked Stephanos. What, in the dark? He shook his head. Nah, all good men ran or took their treasure and walked, or they're dead. Nobody wants to tell you this, but your friend, Archilogos of Ephesus, he came against us with eight ships, caught us beached and made hay. I had a hard time seeing Archilogos, one of the founding voices of the Ionian revolt as a servant of Artafernes, who had cuckolded his father and shamed his mother. On the other hand, his father had been a loyal servant of the King of Kings before the little incident of his mother's adultery. You escaped? I asked. I had Stormcatter off the beach. We were washing the hull when your friend came. I lost most of my rowers. He was ashamed. So what? I said. He saved the ship. Stephanos turned his head away. Not the view of everyone concerned, he said bitterly. We beached for the night, and I went from fire to fire getting to know my rowers. There were half a dozen men I knew, a couple of survivors of the storm-tossed days of my first command, and they were happy to see me. A few former slaves I'd freed for a year's rowing, now rowing as free men for wages. The rest were riffraff. I watched them land the ship at the edge of night and almost get her broached in the surf. I was angry, but instead of showing my anger, I walked around and talked. I offered them an increased wage on the spot. That helped a little. The next day we rose with the last light of the moon, and we were away before rosy-fingered dawn touched the beach. We rode on an empty sea bearing north and east. The wind was fitful, and the clouds to the north were thickening and looked like a shoreline in the sky.
an angry dark purple. The oarsmen muttered as they rowed. About noon, the sun vanished behind a wall of cloud, and Stephanos spoke up from the steering oars. Time to beach, Navok, he said formally. I shook my head. Lots of time, Stephanos. A little chop won't slow us. This is when we gain on Miltiades. I had abandoned any thought of my chase now. I was just aiming to get back with the squadron, or at least get into Chios on the same day. By mid-afternoon, we were out in the deep blue between Samos and Chios. The sky to the north and east was that terrifying dark blue-gray, so dark as to approach black, and the sky over the bow was distant and bright, like a line of fire. I'd misjudged my landfall, or misjudged the rate of our drift on the wind. Kios was over there, past the bow, somewhere. It should have been a low line punctuated by mountains, with the island's coast inviting me in for the night. I couldn't understand. We were hurtling along as if pushed by the very fist of Poseidon, and yet I wasn't up with Kios yet. The muttering of the oarsmen grew. We didn't have a proper oar master, and we needed one, if only to protect them from me. I missed this, I shouted over the wind. Take in the mainsail and strike the mainmast down on deck. Under the boatsail alone, we ran into the line of fire. The sun began to set red, and the dark clouds behind us swallowed the red light and looked more ominous yet. Just against the white line of the last of the good weather, my lookout spotted the hull of our slave ship. He had his masts down, and his oarsmen rowing for all they were worth. He was more afraid of the storm than of pirates. We came up on him fast, as our boatsail was enough in that wind to throw foam and spray right over the ram in our bow, and on to the rowers, who sat silently cursing their fates and looking at the madman who stood in front of the helm. I summoned Idomeneus aft. We'll have to take him fast, I said. We'll strip him of rowers and add them to our own, and then we'll live the night. Idomeneus shook his head in admiration. I thought you'd gone soft, he said. Don't kill the Iberians, I said. I poured a libation to Poseidon for his gift, because I knew that it was no seamanship of mine that had caught the fast slaver. When we were five or six stades astern of our prey and the storm line was visible behind us, a long line of rain flowing in the last light of the sun, the Phoenician changed tactics and raised his boatsail. But Poseidon accepted my libation and spat the slavers back. Before it could be sheeted home, his boatsail whipped away on the wind and the ship yawed badly and we gained a stade. Who knows what happened in the last moments as we closed. He was a slaver, and most of his rowers were slaves. And one of the slaves had a knife, a wickedly sharp raven's talon. By the time Idomeneus went aboard, the deck crew was dead, and the Iberians were loose, severed ropes hanging from their ankles, and their leader had an axe and was cutting their fetters. The Phoenician was pinned to the mast with a knife through his chest. We left him there, because sometimes Poseidon likes a sacrifice. I took every extra slave out of that ship that I could, left them undermanned but not desperate, and set them a landfall. Stephanos stepped up. He was a Kian, and he wanted his reputation back. They'll die in the dark. He said, send me aboard and give me a handful of marines and I'll get them through the night. Idomeneus nodded. Do it, I said. I stepped across to my new ship, even as the rain began. I walked down the main deck and touched hands with a few of the Iberians, meeting their eyes and nodding at the men I remembered from my trip to Delos. 
and many nodded back. A couple smiled. The dangerous one clasped my hand, hard testing me, and then threw an arm around me. After the master, a voice spoke up in Doric. By the gods, Adam Nestos, get me out of here. It was the blasphemer, Philocrates. I leaned down. You want to be thrown over the side? No, I want... Fat, get me out of here. He was pleading. You want to live? I said, row harder. I laughed at him. Pray, I suggested. The Iberian on the opposite bench showed me his teeth. Fucking coward, he said. I pointed at the Iberian. If you don't row, these men will certainly kill you, I said. Now, rationally, you must know that if you do row, you may live through the night. I stepped up on the bench, stepped up again to the rail, and balanced there as the swell raised the stern. But I don't have to be an aspiring priest, isn't that what you called me? To suggest that this might be a good time to examine your relationship with the gods. I leaped down from the rail into the midship of Storm Cutter, feeling immensely better. The storm was coming in behind us, but I'd done my service for the god, and I knew I could weather the storm. We turned north and rowed all night, and we constantly lost sight of the other ship, and as often found him again, so that the first fretful grey light, shot with lightning, found the eyes over his ram just a short stade to windward, and about the time that dawn was shining somewhere, it was a grey morning for us and lashed with rain. I swung the great steering oars to starboard to put the wind astern. I could see a great rock, the size of a castle or the Acropolis, rising from the water to starboard, and I thought that I knew where we were. Somehow we'd come two hundred stardis north of our target, and we were off the west coast of Lesbos. That rock marked the beach of Eresus, where Sappho had her school. Best of all, the beach there was wide and deep, and the rock would break the wind and rain long enough for me to get my ship ashore. My oarsmen were spent, used up long since. The Iberians had put some strength into them, and they weren't bad men. But I wasn't going to get a heroic burst of power from them, not in a month of feast days. No way to signal Stephanos, either, but he knew this anchorage as well as I. Better, no doubt. So I waved at him and turned my ship, hoping that he would read my mind. I got the Domineus to come aft, only a few hundred heartbeats left before the crisis. Go down to the benches and get every man ready. I intend to put him right up the beach, bow first. I pointed at the lights shining in the Acropolis, high above the beach. Hard to miss. I waited until I saw him understand. Idomeneus shook his head. You'll break his back, he said. I confess that I shrugged. We'll live. I nodded towards Asia, which loomed ahead, ready to catch us on a much less kind coast if we failed to land on the sand of Eresus. We're out of sea room. I pointed again. Every oarsman has to be ready to back water. Tell them to dip lightly so that they don't get killed by the oars. Idomeneus nodded and headed forward, shouting as he went. I hesitate to say how fast Stormcutter was moving when we came in under the lee of the rock, but I'd say we were faster than a galloping horse. It's less than a stade from the rock to the beach. We were going too fast. Oars out! I shouted across the gale. Backwater! It was ragged. I was as scared as the next man. Now that we were in flat water, our speed was shocking. The oars bit, and I couldn't see that we were slowing at all. But the ship yawed, and an oarsman screamed as his backed oar bit too deep and slammed into him, breaking his arms. Like a wool blanket that unravels in the wind, his failure spread so that the whole portside loom of oars began to fall apart. 
Men struggled to keep their oars clear, but the ship rolled from the mist strokes, and the port side oars bit too deep, and men died or were broken. We turned suddenly, and the port side dipped so low on the roll that we took water. We still had so much way on us that we were racing sideways into the beach. The port side rowers, those still in command of themselves, finally got all their oars clear of the water. The starboard side rowers were at full stretch, and the hull pivoted again, rotating on the starboard oar bank. And the bow hit the sand, a glancing blow as the bronze-plated ram caught the trough of gravel just shy of the beach and skipped along it. Then we could hear the ram ploughing a furrow in the gravel, and suddenly the boastmast snapped with a crack as loud as the lightning, and every man not sitting on a bench was thrown flat on the deck as a wave picked up the stern and tossed us. The kindly hand of Poseidon, I like to think, up the beach, stern first. Over the side, I roared, although I was lying half stunned. Get her up the beach! It was the ugliest landing I ever saw. We'd been rotated halfway round by the sea. Men were badly hurt along both sides, and I could see broken boards where my ram ought to be. But when I jumped over the side, my feet barely splashed. We were ashore. Stephanos didn't even try to land. He watched us, and he assumed we were lost in the waves. And he put up his helm and coasted by, a few oar lengths offshore. In seconds he was past the beach, and before we had our broken hull clear of Poseidon's reaching tendrils, his ship had gone around the promontory to the north of Eresus. I lay by the rope I'd been hauling and cursed, because the loss of Stephanos hurt me more than I'd expected. I hadn't seen him in a year. I wanted him back. Idomeneus had his marines in hand and was driving oarsmen to work, gathering wood to put supports under the hull timbers. We propped Stormcutter on sand that was only wet with rain, and then we drove the oarsmen into the sea to fetch the ram before it got buried in storm rack and sand. The ram was heavy bronze plate, but with thirty men helping, we hauled it above the tide line. Then we collapsed. I sent Idomeneus to the citadel to get us help and hospitality. Then I sat in my sodden clamis and watched the storm, and sang a hymn to Poseidon and prayed that Stephanos might live. The news came back that Sappho's daughter had died, an old, old woman but a great teacher, as awe-inspiring and God-touched in her way as Heraclitus in his and had been succeeded by another woman, Aspasia, who now led the school of Sappho. So much had changed in just a few years, but Aspasia was supported by Briseis's largesse, and she accepted me without question when I told her who I was, and she lodged my men and fed them. I let myself into Briseis's house and sat by her shuttered window, drinking her wine and eating her food. Surely it was she, and not Artafernis, who'd sent me that message. Hence she must have need of me, I reasoned. And not a need she dared commit to paper. I reasoned, with a brain clouded by Eros, let me add, that she must need me. I would find Miltiades soon enough, but if I could get Stormcutter rebuilt, I would cross the straits and run down the coast to Ephesus and visit my love and see why she had summoned me. The storm took three days to blow out, and my men praised me openly for bringing them to such a safe haven, with lamb stew every night and good red wine for every man as if they were a crew of lords. The folk of Eresus treated us like gods, as well they might, 
since it was Briseis's gold that kept the school going, and her political power that kept it free of outside control, and they feared us. When the storm was gone, we had beautiful weather for autumn. I put men on the headlands to keep watch, and I prayed to Poseidon every day and gave offerings of cakes and honey on the Cyprian goddess's altar, too. Anything to bring back Stephanos. We cut good wood on the hillsides east of the town and rebuilt the bow, with two carpenters from the town helping us with the main beams that had cracked. We stripped the hull clean, and rebuilt the bow, and found a fair amount of rot in the upper timbers. I built a marine platform, like a box with armoured sides, into the new bow, and a little shelf where an archer or a lookout could stand high above the ram. I borrowed from the Temple of Aphrodite, and spent the money on tar and pine pitch and blacked the hull, a fresh thick coat, so that he was armoured in the stuff, watertight and shining. I gave him a stripe of Poseidon's own blue above the waterline, and we painted the oar shafts to match, all in a day. And the women of the town washed our great sail, so that the raven was fresh and stark again. In such a way, we propitiated Poseidon, but there was no sign of Stephanos. So after a week of good food and freely given aid, we prepared to sail away in a fresh ship. I was somber at the loss of a friend, but the crew was wild with delight. Boys are saying their luck has changed, Idomeneus said. I had appointed two Iberians who could speak some Greek to be officers. My new oar master was Gallas, and he had more tattoos than a Libyan, for all that his skin was fairer than mine. He had blue eyes and ruddy hair, and his scalp was shaved in whirls, but he knew the sea, and his Greek was good enough, and he had taken command of the port side oars during the disaster of the landing. My new sailing master had the same tattoos, and his name was too barbaric for words, something like Malaleau. I called him Mal, and he answered to it. He spoke a pigeon of Greek and Italiot and Phoenician. I had thirty of the former slaves on my benches now. I'd lost more than a dozen men in that horrible landing, dead or so badly injured that they still lay in Lady Sappho's temple of Aphrodite, waiting to be healed or to die. The Iberians all viewed me as the author of their freedom. I explained to Gallus how small a role I'd played, and how much they owed to the gods, but I was not sorry to benefit from their gratitude. At any rate, we heaved Stormcutter into the surf and got the rowers in position as if we knew what we were doing. And then we were away. Gallus brought more out of the rowers than I had, and we spent two more days rowing up and down the sea off Lesbos to drill them until their oars rose and fell like the single arm of a single man. Then we rowed around to Methimna, and I put her stern on to the beach and asked after Miltiaris and my friend Epaphroditos, the Archon Basilios of the town. But the captain of the guard told me that Lord Epaphroditos was away at the siege of Miletus. I needed money, and Epaphroditus's absence left me no choice. I had to take a prize, and a rich one. My men needed paying, and I was down to no wine and no stores. I got one meal out of Methimna based on their memories of me, and my famous name, but we sailed from that town like a hungry wolf. We ran south along the east coast of Lesbos, and the beaches were empty at Mytilene, where the rebel fleet ought to have been forming up. And just south of Mytilene we saw a pair of heavy Phoenicians guarding a line of merchantmen. Egyptians, I thought, as I stood on the new bow. Get the mainmast up! I called to Mal, and motioned for Gallas, who was steering, to take us about. 
We could no more face a pair of heavy Phoenicians than we could weather another storm. Fuck, I muttered. They were none too happy to see us when we put on to the beach at Mitilini, but men remembered me there, and I arranged for a meal and some oil and wine on credit. Miltiades's credit. I was sitting alone at a small fire on the beach, cursing my fate. Or rather, my ignorance of events and my inability to accomplish anything. When a pair of local men, traders, came up out of the dark. Lord Arimnestos. The shorter one asked. I, I answered and offered them wine. In short, they had a cargo of grain. Several cargoes, in fact. And they wondered if I'd like to have a go at smuggling it into Malitus. The rate of exchange they offered was good, good enough to give me some slack. So I loaded grain at their wharf and filled the ship so that she sat deep in the water, and my rowers cursed. We're fucked if we have to run, Idomeneus said. Really? I asked, as if the thought had never occurred to me. We sailed at sunset, ran along the coast of Lesbos before full dark fell, and were off Chios in the light of a full moon. My oarsmen were none too happy with me, because this was flirting with Poseidon's rage and no mistake, or so they said. I made my sea marks off Chios, and we passed silently along the beaches I had known like family homes in my youth. Just past false dawn, we passed the beach where Stephanos had lived before he went away to sea to be a killer of men. There was a long, low trireme, beached there. My heart rose in my chest, and I abandoned my plan and put our stern to the beach, and we went ashore. I thought you were done for, Stephanos said, and I thought I could weather the cape by Methymna and run free in the channel with the two islands to break the fury of the storm. He shrugged. Those Iberians don't know how to row, but they have a lot of guts. I got us around the corner, and they kept the bow into the seas, and we determined to land at Mitilini, but there was a current. I've never seen anything like it. We went past Mitilini in the blink of an eye, and north of Chios, we hit a log that was drifting, broke aboard amidships, and started to take on water. Stephanos was a big, plain-spoken sailor who'd grown to manhood as a fisherman, and his hands moved like an actor's as he told the story. His sister, Melina, was beaming up at him. She, too, was a friend of my youth, from the heady days when I was newly freed, just finding my power as a man-at-arms. We kept grinning at each other. Then what happened? Idomeneus asked. The back of the ship snapped like a twig. We sank and the fishes ate us. Stephanos laughed. His sister swatted him, and he ducked. One of the rowers shouted that we weren't done yet. A Greek fellow, Philocrates. He put some heart in the boys, and we got the head around. Then the wind led up for a few moments, and in that time we got into a cove on the north shore. It was as if Poseidon agreed to let us live. I put the bow on the shingle, and to Hades with the ram, which took a right battering and we've been a week repairing her, but we lived. As did we, I said, and we embraced again. I looked at his ship. What do you call him? I asked. Stephanos grinned his easy grin. Well, we thought of calling him Stormcutter, but that's taken, so we opted for Trident. The sign of Poseidon. A fine name. He grinned again. So, how do we make some money? He kissed his sister and pointed up the beach. Go and find Harpagos, dear. Harpagos proved to be Stephanos's cousin. Melina brought him down to the beach, and he was no smaller than Stephanos, and his hands were hard as rock. Stephanos introduced him with flowery compliments. This is my useless layabout cousin, Harpagos, who wants to ship with me. He's never been to sea. Stephanos spat on the sand and laughed. Harpagos had the look of a man who'd kept the sea his entire life. His hair was full of salt. 
but he stood abashed. I winked at Stephanos. It was like old times. You're a triarch now, my friend. No need to consult me on every raw man. I've been helmsman on a grain ship, Harpagos said. I want him as my helmsman, Stephanos admitted. Then he said, I need him where I can see him. I liked Harpagos. His embarrassment at all this attention shouted of the sort of solid, quiet confidence that makes a man able to go and see and fish every day for forty years. On your head be it, I said. Arpagos, can you fight? He shrugged. I wrestle. He said, I'll teach the boys in the village. I can take this big fool. He indicated Stephanos. Hmm, I allowed. Well, he can take me, and that would be bad for discipline. Ever used a spear and shield? I asked. Harpagos shook his head. Can't say I have. Ever killed? I asked. Harpagos looked out to sea. Yes, he said. Voice flat. We all stood together in silence, and the fine wind blew across us. Well, I said, welcome aboard. We're pirates, Harpagos. Sometimes we fight for the Ionian rebels, but mostly we take other people's ships for profit. Can you do that? He grinned. The first grin I'd seen. Yes, Lord. Melina listened to this exchange and brought more wine, and we ate fresh sardines and a big red fish I hadn't eaten often with flesh like lobster. We drank too much wine. Melina pressed herself on me, and I flirted with her, smiled, even held her for a time while standing by the fire on the beach. But I didn't take her into the dark. My head was full of brises, and Melina wasn't a beach girl. She was Stephanos's sister, and she dressed like a woman of property. Somewhere she had a man she was going to marry and to bed her would have been to betray my guest friendship with Stephanos. In the morning I gave him half the grain, and the next evening, full of food and a little too much wine, we were off the beach, rowing soft in the moonlight for Melitus. Our plan was simple, like most good plans. We both had Phoenician ships, both newly repaired and looking fairly prosperous. We sailed due south, got behind the coastal islands west around Samos, rowing all the way, and came into the Bay of Melitus from the southwest, that is, from the direction of Tyre and Phoenicia, as the sun set in the west, mostly behind us. We stood straight down the bay, bold as brass, apparently a pair of their own ships, bound for the blockade fleet at Tirtarus on the island of Lade. The fishermen of Chios had been able to lay the whole siege out like a scroll for us, because they smuggled fish to the rebels and sold them openly to the Medes, Persians, Greeks, and Phoenicians who served the great king, too. Miletus is an ancient city, founded before Troy, and she stands at the base of a deep inlet of the sea just south of Samos, although the bay over towards Mikali is starting to silt up. Miletus has a steep acropolis, impregnable, or so men used to say, and her outer town is protected by a circuit of stone walls with towers. The Persians began by moving their fleet to Ephesus, just a hundred stades up the coast. Once they had a base there, they moved in and stormed Tirtarus, a fishing village with a small fort and used it as their forward base, so that ships from there could easily launch into the narrow channel and catch any vessel heading into Miletus. Mind you, it is possible to row north around Lade. The problem is that anyone holding the fort on Lade can see you coming fifty stades away, and when you turn north, they're waiting, and the currents around the island favor the side that holds it. Once the Persians had the fort at Tirtarus. They brought up their land forces on the landward side of the peninsula, 
Arta Fadnis came in person, and they built a great camp in the hills overlooking Miletus. After a few weeks of skirmishing, he started on the siege mound. Men tell me the Assyrians invented the siege mound, and perhaps they did. Although, as usual, the Egyptians claim they invented it. Either way, it was not the Greeks who prefer a nice flat field and a single day of battle to a year's siege. But the Ionians and the Aeolian Greeks have fortified cities, and when the Lydians or the Medes come against them, they fight a war of shovels. The Persians dig a giant hill that runs from the flat of the plain to the top of the walls, and the Greeks in the city counter-dig, trying either to raise the wall by the mound or to destroy the Persian mound. And while both sides dig, the men outside make sure that the men inside receive no help, no weapons, and, most of all, no food. Sometimes the men inside the walls triumph, boring their opponents into backing off, and sometimes a single load of grain can be a mighty weapon. First, because the men inside the walls can eat, and their hearts rise, Second, because the men outside the walls know they must struggle for so much longer each time a cargo reaches their enemies. But, in my experience, sieges are rarely settled by the hand of man. Usually, the Lord Apollo hurls his fearsome arrows of disease into one side or the other, or sometimes into both, and the dead pile up as if Ares had reaped them with a sword, but faster sieges eat men. I didn't know that then, as the sun set over my stern. I was twenty-five years old, and I had never seen a siege. South of Samos, and no guard ship came to look at us. We stood straight on, and as we entered the Bay of Melitus, we bore up and sailed along the south coast of the bay, as if bound for the island of Lade. We were sailing in light airs, but every bench was manned, and we were ready to run. In the last light of the day, two of their ships headed out to meet us. They took a long time coming off the beach, and we didn't hurry towards them. Or rake and passed, I called softly to Stephanos, and he nodded and repeated my orders to Harpagos, whose hooked nose could just be seen above the stem of the ship. We could see Miletus in the distance now, rising on the next headland, due east down the channel. There's a world of difference between being ready for action and expecting nothing to happen. And that world of difference separated our ships and theirs. They came out thinking we were Phoenicians, we knew exactly what we intended to do, and when we were at hailing distance and the lead ship called to us in their Phoenician tongue, I clapped my hands once. I remember that the sound carried over the water and made a little echo against the nearer enemy hull. Then every back bent on my ship, and the oars twinkled in the setting sun. If they'd been ready, they'd have leaped into action right there, but... Many heartbeats passed while their Navarch and his officers tried to work out why we were rowing so hard. The lead Phoenician was so ill-prepared that his crew caught a crab and he fell away from his course, which was almost the end of my plan. I wanted to oar-rake the pair, Stephanos taking the port side enemy and I the starboard, and my plan was that we'd crush their oars and raced through before any other ships could launch off the beach. But the lead Phoenician turned broadside on to us, and we had no choice but to ram him or abandon our attempt. The channel was too narrow to avoid him, so I caught him just after the midships, and Stephanos caught him a few heartbeats later, well forward, and together we rolled him over, dumping his rowers in the water. We'd turtled one ship, but the impacts tested our bows and cost us all our speed and hard-earned momentum, and we were all a stand for the second ship. He knew his business, 
and now that he'd had a moment to think he was ready. He loosed a flight of arrows, and some of my rowers were hit, but Galas had them in hand, and we were moving forward. Oars in, I called. It was sloppy, but we had all our oar shafts in as our bow slammed into the second ship. We weren't moving fast, neither was he, and the two ships didn't have the power to get past each other. As we came to a dead stop, broadside to broadside, Idomeneus got grapples over the side, but at the cost of three marines. The Phoenicians were poling us off while their archers flayed us. Gallus went down with an arrow in him, and my deck crew was melting. Men were taking cover behind the masts, behind screens, anything. And this from four or five archers. I had the helm, but we had stopped. On the beach, men were pushing ships into the water, a dozen slim hulls launching all together. Fuck! I said aloud. I remember because there was a lull, and my imprecation carried clearly across the water. I drew my sword and caught up my big hide shield, a simple Beotian I'd bought on the beach at Kiosh. I didn't have my armor or my good war gear or my new helmet, and I was carrying a shield just two goat hides thick. Even as I raised it, an arrow punched through, tore my hair, and carried on to sink into the stern posts. I ran down our central platform. A running man is a hard target for archers, but that didn't stop them. They knew I was the helmsman. Every archer fixed on me, and two arrows hit my shield, but neither pinked me. Amidships, Idomeneus had two grapples fixed and guarded by his marines, their big shields covering him and his ropes. Opposite, a pair of Phoenicians soared with swords at the hawsers that held us fast. I saw all of this in a glance and pivoted on one heel. I leaped from the command platform to the gunwale by Idomeneus, covered for a valuable moment by the two aspides of his marines, and without pause... Hesitation would have been death. I was across the gap, my left foot on their gunwale, and then both feet firm on a rower's bench. And I started killing. I took the men who were sawing at our grapples in two blows, and then I cleared the rowing bench by beheading the oarsman. His blood sprayed back on the men behind him, and I punched with the rim of my light shield, caught one of the Phoenician marines, who was surprised at the length of my arms, and knocked him flat, and I was on their command platform. Hellas! I shouted. I was fueled by desperation, and the elation of a starving man offered food. I hadn't fought like this in more than a year, and I was better than a mere man, Thugater. My shield and my sword were everywhere, as if they had eyes and thoughts of their own. I remember rotating my hips and punching back with my shield arm and catching a sailor in the groin and glowing with the joy of fighting so well. A winter of training the Plataeans had not been wasted. Each blow, each parry blended seamlessly into another. It was like a dance. It might have gone on forever. And then Idomeneus was shouting my name, and I raised my hand and the enemy deck was clear. I had my blade in the air, and there was a half-naked sailor under the edge. But I stayed my hand, as Dion had asked. Apollo! I called, and let the man live. Idomeneus and the marines had followed me aboard. There were a dozen warships in the water, and Stephanos was already past us, rowing hard for Miletus. That's what he was supposed to do, Mal! I called. He turned his head and I waved at him. At the same time, I cut the grapples that held the two ships together. Go! It took three shouts, but he got it. He started striking men with his stick, and the oarsmen on the starboard side began to push against our hull with poles and spears, and even their oars. Idomeneus was on the stern of the ship I'd just taken. I saw him grasp the oars, and I picked up a javelin that one of the enemy marines had dropped, 
or throne. Reverse your benches, I ordered in Greek. A few men obeyed, and others looked blank or mutinous. I threw my javelin into one of those who was refusing his duty, and he fell across his oar. Then I pulled the spear free of his corpse. Reverse your benches, I roared. They obeyed. I pounded the oar beat against the mast with the spear butt, and they rowed. It wasn't good rowing, but the men coming off the beaches weren't eager to fight in the dark, and they weren't any too sure what had just happened either. We backed down the channel, first the stade, and then another stade, and then the arrows from Miletus began to fall on the enemy ships following us. One bold ship made a last try. Before the final bend in the channel, a beautiful long trireme with a red stripe went to full speed in half a dozen ship lengths, a superb crew, and tried to ram us bow to bow. Idomeneus had the ship, and he steered well so that the two rams rang together like a hammer and an anvil, and our ship bounced away apparently undamaged. Arrows fell from the near bank, so many that they were visible against the faint light of the sky, and there were screams from the red ship, and it fell away. I could hear a familiar voice cursing and ordering men to reverse their cushions. A Greek voice. Archilogos's voice, a man I'd sworn to protect, now leading the ships of my enemies. The men of Miletus greeted us like brothers, better than brothers. We'd killed an enemy ship and seized another right under the eyes of their blockade, in full view of the walls and we would have been drunk as lords in a few hours if there had been any wine in the lower city. As it was, my first hours in the siege of Miletus showed me all the things I'd never wanted to know about sieges. The people were as thin as cranes. The children looked like old people, and the women looked like children. A handful of the town's best fighters still looked like men. They got extra food, and they needed it, the rest looked like starved dogs. And Histieus, the tyrant of the town, had to set his fighters as guards to get our grain ashore. I took our pay in gold darics. I'll be back, I promised. Histieus was a tall, beautiful man with a mane of black hair and golden skin and a heavy scar across his face. His brother, Istis, was another of the same. They had been raised at the great king's court and spoke Persian as well as Greek, and they looked like gods. I liked Istis better. He was less addicted to power and a better man. But he laughed at me. No one comes back a second time, he called as my men got the stern off the beach. But thanks. That stung I'll be back in ten days, by the fires of Hephaestus and the bones of the Corvaxi. I shouted to Istis. I craved his good opinion. In those days men said Istis was the best sword in Ionia. He was a few years older than me, and we had never been matched against each other. But we were instant friends that night in Melitus. So having sworn my oath before men and the gods... I ordered my men to row. We were heavily laden. I'd filled the ship with all the women and children that dared to come with us. We headed straight back to sea. It was dark as pitch. I reckoned that Archilogos wouldn't expect me to try again immediately, and I was right. We rowed out of the harbour at ramming speed, made the turn at the harbour mouth in fine style, and tore up the estuary. And the Medes and traitorous Greeks on the beaches at Tirtarus must have watched us go by and felt like fools, but none opposed us. I stood on my stern and laughed at them, and the sound of my mockery carried over the water and bounced back from the bluffs above the town. Probably a stupid taunt, but it felt good, and it still makes me smile to think of how Archilogos must have writhed at the sound of my laughter. 
and then we were out to sea and running before a freshening wind. All our rowers were exhausted by the time we made Kios. We disgorged our cargo of refugees, and the people of the fishing villages fed them. But they wouldn't keep them, and we still had them aboard when we headed back north to Mytilini. I had to give command of the new ship to Harpagos. I was out of officers, and Idomeneus, for all that he was a skilled killer, had no interest in the sea, and could no more inspire men than I could play a flute. Arpagos was a good seaman, and his quiet solidity was the sort of thing men trust in a storm or a fight. I gave him a try, and I never regretted it. I took all three ships back into the great harbour at Mytilini, and still there was no sign of the rebel fleet. Nor had anyone heard a word of Miltiades. It was as if the Persians had already won. I paid my grain merchants from the gold I'd received in Malitus. And I'll buy the rest of your grain, I said. I offered them a handsome profit for men who never had to move from the comfort of their own homes. And I filled three ships with grain in sacks and jars. I'll say this for them, for all the lesbians. They took the shiploads of refugees from Melithus and treated them like citizens. This time we sailed in broad daylight. My crew trusted me now, and weeks of action had made them better men. I knew the process, and I used it for my own ends. We rowed when we might have sailed, and I hardened their muscles as if they were athletes, and I promised them a gold derrick a man if they got us in and out of Miletus again. I waited for the dark of the moon, and the gods sent me a dark night and heavy seas. We had lights on our sterns, and we rowed across in the dark with the rowers cursing their ill luck and praying with every stroke. But after a month of constant adventure, my crew could row in the dark. We went down the bay with the wind at our backs, under boatsels alone, north around Lade. The wind defeated the currents and allowed us to move quickly, and the Phoenicians were snug in their blankets when we went past, because it was raining and winter had come. But some fool laughed aloud and alerted them, and when we'd unloaded and turned our bows to the open sea, they were formed across the bay, fifteen ships waiting for our three. And they were good sailors, I watched them for a while from the safety of the Milesian archers, and then I took my little squadron back into the harbour. All the gold derricks in the world weren't going to save me. I was blockaded in Melitus, and it looked as if our luck had run its course. Chapter 4 the Persian fleet didn't actually have any Persians in it, of course. There were Ionian Greeks and Phoenicians and a handful of very capable Egyptians on those beaches. And I stood in the so-called Windy Tower of Melitus and watched them. To the south, the Persian siege mound grew every day. No Persians there either, just slaves culled from the countryside. Hundreds and hundreds of agricultural slaves from the Milesians' own farms, carrying brush and soil while fending off rocks and arrow shafts and dumping it under the walls so that the siege mound grew the width of a man's hand every night. The Milesian aristocrats remained confident, however. Their city had never fallen, and they still had stores. They hadn't killed all their animals yet, and only the lower-class people were suffering. When I was taken up to the Acropolis, it was as if I'd entered a city free of war. I was bathed by slaves, anointed with oil, and served a meal that included thin-sliced beef tongue. But in the lower city, the people were starving. My grain put heart into them, and I wasn't the only captain who got through, just the only one who'd done it twice. And this late in the season, 
My second cargo, three ships worth, saved the city. Histios and his brother did not hesitate to tell me so. My second night in the city, Istis led the warriors in an attack out of a postern gate and set fire to a brush pile the enemy had been preparing. Brush, piled high as a city wall, intended to help with the last days of the siege mound. But they couldn't burn the soil, and in the morning the slaves were back at work. Persian archers appeared periodically and shot into the city, Fire arrows, sometimes, but mostly just war shafts, carefully aimed. Every day they killed a man or two on the walls. On the other hand, they kept the city supplied with arrows. Archilogos, or whoever was in command over there on the beaches of Lade, was not giving up either. They formed a cordon every night and had small boats rowing across the channel. And at least two ships out in the bay north of the island. At dawn and dusk they sortied out with at least fifteen ships, and I didn't see much hope for escape. But on the third night the city's defenders sallied out again, and this time I went with them. It is ironic that once you have the reputation as a great warrior you must support it constantly. I could no more sit in the Acropolis while the men raided than I could abstain from eating. The city was well appointed with regard to armor, and Lord Histios gave me a bell corslet and a fine Cretan helmet with a magnificent horsehair plume. It was a bit like living in the Iliad. I took my marines and Philocrates, the blasphemer, who had settled into the life of piracy like a veteran. I got him arms as well, a full panoply. You look like Ares come to life, I said to him when he was dressed in bronze. Ares is a myth to frighten children, he said. I see that a storm at sea and a life of war is not enough to restore your respect for the gods, I said. He shrugged. You can't respect what ain't there. I stood back a little and regarded him. There was something frightening about him. He ignored portents, laughed at talismans, and called the gods by foul names. At first only the Iberians would eat with him, but as he continued to blaspheme and the skies never swallowed him up, other men began to accept him. That said, I have to say that he had changed. I couldn't put my finger on why, but he explained it himself later, as you'll hear, if you come back for more of this story tomorrow. At any rate, sixty of us went out of the postern gate nearest the harbour. It was pelting down with rain. We slipped on the mud, and I blessed my good Beotian boots even as the other men cursed their open sandals. The ground in front of the walls had been churned to a froth by the passage of thousands of men, slaves and soldiers, and both sides dumped their waste and filth into that no-man's land. It was foul. You'd think that after a hundred of these raids, the Persians would have set a watch. But of all their contingents, only the Egyptians kept a regular guard. Most of their crack troops were cavalrymen who disdained such rigorous pastimes as guard duty. And who am I to comment? I never knew a Greek who was willing to stand a night watch. We crossed the mud and the ordure in the lashing rain, and then we went over the fresh brush they'd piled in lieu of a wall around their camp. No hope of lighting a fire on this night, but we had a different goal in mind. We weren't after Artafernes. If he'd been at the siege, he might have had Briseis, and my approach would have been very different. Indeed, since I'm trying to tell the whole truth here, I'll add that I didn't feel any particular commitment to the rebels. They weren't Plataeans, for instance. I was loyal enough to Miltiaris, but you'll note that I wasn't crisscrossing the seas looking for him. 
nor was I sailing up and down looking for the rebel fleet to offer my services. Mind you, once I was trapped in Melitus, my options were limited. But I wasn't an idealist. I was a Plataean, and I was Briseis's lover. Or rather, the same but in the other order. But neither the satrap nor his new wife was at the siege that autumn. Datis was Artaferni's lieutenant, and our aim was to kill him. His great red and purple tent showed clearly across the lines by day, and we'd worked out a couple of sea marks, torches mounted at two different heights in the town, to guide us to his tent. He was a relative of the great king. Artafernes was one of the king's many brothers, and this Datis was a cousin or some such, and a famous warrior. And the rumors were that when he took Melitus, he'd be sent with a great fleet against Chios and Lesbos, and perhaps Athens. Or so men said. No one expected us to succeed in killing him, but it was this sort of constant pressure that kept the besiegers on edge and encouraged them to pack it up for the winter and head home. We crept through the dark, soaked to the skin, squelching in mud, turning frequently to get our line of approach from the torches on the walls, and we crept forward, cursed by men in the tents whose ropes we bumped, little knowing, of course, that we were mortal foes. I wondered if this was what Odysseus had felt when he left the Trojan horse to sneak into the town of Troy. The Iliad is very real at times, but no one ever seems to be wet or cold or have the flux. I find that these three are the proper children of Ares, not havoc and panic, and whatever else the poets ascribe. Who ever had a war without wet and cold? We were in the middle of the column, so we had no idea what or who alarmed the camp. But suddenly we were discovered. It was raining so hard that no one could light a torch, and as soon as the enemy came out of their tents, they lost all sense of the situation. Our men killed the first to come close to them, then scattered, that's what we'd planned. The Milesians simply vanished. They had raided the camp before and knew it well enough. My marines were not so lucky, and in the dark we followed the wrong men. We thought we were following Milesians, and we ended up in the horse lines where a dozen conscientious Persian troopers had run to protect their mounts. Our men started fighting them with no cue from me. My marines were armoured, and the Persians were unarmed, and they died. Taking two of my men with them, Persians are brave. Cap the halters and undo the hobbles, I ordered. My survivors spread out and caused chaos on the horse lines, ripping pickets out of the ground. I ran to the top of a low hill and looked back at the city and only then did I realize that we had the whole width of the enemy camp between us. More immediately, men were boiling out of the camp, backlit by the lights on the city wall. Persians love their horses. My ten men weren't going to last a minute against a regiment of Persian cavalrymen. I thought of stealing horses and heading inland, but that sort of thing only works in epics. In real life, your enemies have more horses and native guides, and they ride you down. Besides, my men were sailors in armor, not cavalrymen. Most of them had probably never forked a horse. I was out of ideas, but Poseidon stood by us. Horses scattered in every direction, and I didn't have to be Odysseus to reckon that we could escape with the herd. A few of us mounted, and others simply clung to manes, even tails, and we flowed with the horses, moving west and north back towards the city. I got mounted, lost my bearings and my companions, and spent a watch among the rocks south of the city, 
where my horse left me. God helps those who help themselves, or so I've heard it said. And while I lay in the rocks watching the city and the force of Persian archers between me and the walls, cursing my fate, I realized that it was a six-stare walk along the ridge of rock to the beach opposite Tirtarus, and not a sentry on the way. I took the time to poke along the ridge of rock. Every piece of waste ground has trails, if you know where to look. Goats make them, and shepherds, and boys and girls courting or playing at being heroes. The moon came up late, and the rain ceased, and I walked to the beach opposite Lade, stripped to my skin, and swam to the hulls opposite. Really just a few horse lengths, well less than a stade. I rose up, dripping by the black hulls, close enough to the enemy camp to hear the snores of Archilogos's oarsmen, or so I reckoned. Then I swam back and picked my way among the rocks. As I had expected, the Persians had gone back to bed. I crawled through the mud and shit to the walls of the town, and wasted another half an hour persuading the sentry to let me climb the wall without gutting me. Oh, the romance of siege warfare. I was the last man back from the raid, and my sword had not left its scabbard. There were men in the upper city who were of a mind to laugh at me. I let them laugh. I was no longer a hot-blooded boy, and I didn't need a blood feud in the town. I wanted to take my gold and go, although I was keen to show Istis what I was made of. He'd killed three Persians, and brought in their bows and arrows as proof. I slept well enough. In the morning I ate honeyed almonds in the upper city, and took a long bath to kill the smell of the mud. Histios and Istis joined me. Your men accomplished a miracle, he said. Not a slave is working on the siege mound today. They're all out searching for the horses. He smiled grimly. We didn't get Datis, but we hurt them. A deserter says we killed fifteen Persians and some others. I nodded. None of this interested me much. This war of tiny increments was not something I could really appreciate. To me, the city looked doomed, and I wanted out before I was sold into slavery again. Will you raid again tonight? I asked. He shook his head. Even he, the best-fed warrior in the city, had circles under his eyes like shield bags and the lines on his face were as deep as new ploughed furrows. No, he said. We've been out two nights in a row. We can't keep it up. The fighters are exhausted. The real fighters, the men of worth. His eyes flicked to Istis, who also looked like a man at the edge of exhaustion. I'm leaving tonight, I said. He shook his head. I don't recommend that, he said. Mind you, if you stay much longer, I'll be selling you your grain. I'd appreciate a dozen of your archers to help me get clear, I said. I'd bring them back on my next trip. You plan to shoot your way out? Istis asked. Archers are our most valuable troops. He shrugged. You are the best friend this city has made in many months. But the loss of ten archers would be a blow. I understand, but I need the archers for my diversion. And I'll leave you a trireme as surety, the Phoenician I took on my way in. I pointed to the hull. On a dark night, you might use her to get some people out. He shook his head in puzzlement. Why leave a ship? He asked. I grunted. I didn't want to tell him. As in any siege, the town was riddled with deserters, traitors, and double agents, I had no doubt. We'll be away in the dark of the moon, I said. Poseidon bless you, then, the tyrant said. But his eyes flicked to his brother, 
and something passed between them that I didn't like. Oh, I was eager to be gone. I slept most of the day and mustered all my men, marines, oarsmen, deck crews at dusk. I put my plan to them as the sun vanished into clouds, and enough men volunteered to give me hope. I wish I could say that they all volunteered, but a week on half rations in a doomed city is enough to sap anyone's morale. I took my party out of the harbour sally port when the rain started. We made the rocks south of town in the end although I had an anxious time finding them in the dark. It is always easier to go to a town than away from it. We were soaked through and shivering by the time we made the rocks, and then we crept along, spear butts sounding like avalanches as they scraped the stone. Philocrates cursed steadily. When we were on the beach opposite Lade, we stripped and swam, clinging to our spears as best we could. We missed our way. The darkness was deep and there was no moon. Let me just say that swimming in the dark, no sight of anything, cold through, so that you shiver, clinging to your weapons, is perhaps the ultimate test of the warrior. Men turned back. And who am I to blame them? We ended up on the rocks east of the ships, and there was nothing for it but to crawl. I'd explained this part, but the execution was much harder than I'd anticipated. Try crawling on a rainy night, naked but for a wet clamis, and keeping a spear with you across broken ground thick with brush. Ha! We sounded like a herd of cattle, but fools that we were, and inept. The enemy were as bad, or worse. I made the most noise, as I was wearing Histieus's gift, the bronze cuirass. I wore it swimming, and it wasn't bad, but when I crawled across rocks it was loud, and the flare around the hips caught on everything. That was one of the longest, darkest hours of my life. I had not reckoned on losing my way again, we only had a study of open ground to cross, but I did. In the end, I had to rise to my feet, stumbling like a drunkard, and turn slowly, in full view of the enemy sentries, if there had been any, to realize that I had crawled right past the enemy encampment. Too late to correct my course. I was well south of my target, but I could see the black hulls of their triremes just to the left, shiny in the darkness. I had at least a dozen men with me, men who had chosen to follow me, even when their sense said they'd gone wrong. And now we crept across the dunes, then clattered across the tongue of rock that separated the mud flat from the sea until we were crouched by the ships. Most of the men had packets of oiled cloth and pitch, or even bitumen. There was plenty of it in Melitus, and we built a pile of the stuff under one hull. Although there was no moon, the rain abated while we crouched there, 
The camp had fires, mostly coals, and several Iberians crept between the boat cells, erected as tents, and lit their torches at the fires. By now there were thirty or forty of my men among the hulls of their ships, and we all called, Alarm! Alarm! in Greek, for all we were worth. Our Iberians ran through the camp with lit torches, before thrusting them into our pre-built pyre. And then, chaos came. The fire roared up in the time it would take a man to run the stade, from a few flickers of flame to a conflagration twice the height of a man's head. And as loud as a horse race, the ship caught immediately. Hulls coated in pitch are an invitation to flame, even in the rain. My sailors ran back and forth, feeding sails and oars into the inferno, and then throwing the lit wreckage into other hulls. Men came out of the tents, and we killed them. As we were the ones calling the alarm, they kept on coming to us for many minutes, unarmed or with buckets to put out the fire, and we put them down. By then we had three ships alight, and my two were out in the channel, already running free, while the archers on their decks shot fire arrows into the black hulls. A fire arrow is a feeble thing, and none of them caught, but it provided further distraction. The enemy was misled, again, into believing that the fire arrows were the cause of the fires. It took them a long time to realize that we were in amongst them. I had no idea how many men I had under command, or how much damage we'd done, but I knew that it was time to go. I had a horn, the gift of Istis, and I ran clear of the flame, the men closest to me following, and I stopped in the dark to sound the horn, but the only sound I made was the bleat of an old ewe looking for her last lamb. Give me that, Philocrates said, and he took it and blew a mighty blast. There was the sound of running feet, and we braced ourselves. We had no shields, and we were going to be reaped like ripe grain if the enemy had a phalanx to set against us. But it was the Domineus, laughing like a hyena, with fifty of our sailors and marines on his heels. Towards the back of his route, there was fighting, but so far, our enemies were disorganized. Get them into the ship, I called, because the storm cutter was coming ashore for us. Some men took some hide boats they found there. Tyche favors the brave, or so they say. And thirty men made it away in the small boats. But the fighting was intensifying, and I could hear the enemy getting into a line, their shields tapping against each other in the dark, and the fires behind them showed me how fast they were building the shield wall. The enemy hoplites were backlit by burning ships, and mine were hidden by darkness. One quick charge, I told the men I could find. On me, on me, I called, and I picked up a heavy rock. Get close and throw, I said. Put one man down and run for the ship. Don't stay and fight. Maybe a dozen men listened to me and obeyed. We ran down the dune out of the darkness, and just a pace or two from their shield wall, I threw my rock. A big rock, I can tell you. My rock caught my foe in the shin, and he went down, and I jumped through the gap in their line and plunged my spear into the unshielded side of the man next to me. Then the night was full of shouts. Fighting at night is nothing like fighting in the day. Men fall down when no foe assails them. They lose their way in the melee. I turned to run and somehow found myself deeper in their line. I came upon Archilogos as another ship burst into pitch-soaked flame behind my former friend. I think he recognized me as soon as I recognized him. Neither of us had a helmet on. No one wears a helmet at night. I knew that if I stopped moving, I was dead or taken, so I shoved him. He had a shield, and I had none. I had sworn to protect him, so I couldn't try to harm him. Such a thing 
would haunt me forever. He roared and cut at me with a long copies. The sword flared like flame over my head. I tangled his blow with my spear and jumped back, slamming into a man who had no idea whether I was friend or foe. I fell, lost my spear and rolled, and another man fell on top of me. That should have been the end. Archilogos called, Doru, stand and face me! And he cut at the man I'd tripped over. That's fighting in the dark. I saw the flash of his blow and heard it thunk home in another man's shield. I gave up trying to find my spear, or even getting to my feet. I crawled, and then I rolled, and at one point a man stepped on my breastplate in the dark. The hinges gave but held, and he stepped away, thinking me a corpse. There was shouting behind me where I'd been. I reckoned that the Ionian Greeks were fighting each other. Later I heard that the Greeks and Phoenicians started fighting. Many men were forced allies of the Persians, and not sorry to kill a Tyrian in the dark, I can tell you. And it may be that we only lived because the Ionians helped us. At any rate, I got to my feet, after what seemed an eternity of being helpless, tore my clamis from my neck, cast it at my feet, and ran to the beach. Storm cutter was already backing water. I was out of my breastplate even as I ran. I cut the straps with my eating knife, running parallel to the ship's course, easily outpacing it as it backed water. I dropped the thing on the sand, a fortune in well-tooled bronze, but a small price to give the gods for freedom. And I ran to the edge of the sea and dived in without pausing on the shingle, my knife still in my hand. Four strokes out, I got my arms around an oar and called for the rowers to pull me in. Something hit me in the head, and I started to go down. I took another blow between the shoulder blades, and my last thought was that their archers had got me. Chapter 5 Well, I wasn't dead. Does that surprise you? Idomeneus and Philocrates hauled me up the side. I'd been hit on the head by an oar, and when I awoke I had a rip on my scalp and a bruise on my side as if I'd been hit with an axe. We lost sixteen men, heavy casualties from the sixty or so raiders who'd started the night together. Later I learned that six of them turned back from the swim and remained in Miletus. The rest were killed. Two of them were marines, men who had been with me for years. On the other hand, we were free. In those days we seldom stopped to mourn the dead, although it was a humiliation to me to have left their bones behind. Greeks pride themselves on retrieving their dead, even on a raid, the sun was well up in the sky before I could think, but my first thoughts were full of joy. Joy at the cleanliness of the sea and the blueness of the sky. Sieges are ugly. The sea is never ugly, even when he means to kill you. We made our way north up the Samian Channel, and we took our time because we had three crews packed into two ships, with a dozen Milesian archers thrown in for good measure. They were good men. Tusser was their leader. When a father names his son after the greatest archer in the Iliad, he must expect the boy to grow to pull a bow, eh? Tusser and Philocrates were friends almost before he had his sandals off and they could be seen throwing knuckle-bones by the helmsman's station all through the day, as neither had a station except in combat. We stopped for meals, and we set good lookouts, but the sea remained empty until we were off Ephesus. There, out in the roadstead, we caught a pair of Egyptian ships with a pair of Cilicians for escort, or so we thought. Now, the Cilicians were great pirates, 
They preyed on everyone, but as the Ionian revolt grew, they took service with the great king, because preying on the Ionians and the Carians promised the richest pickings. Cilicians seldom use triremes. They are poor men, and they prefer smaller, lighter ships like the Hemiolia, a bireme with a heavy sailing rig and a third half deck in the stern. The two Cilicians in the distance were Hemiolii. Their raked masts marked them for what they were. My head hurt as if a horse had stepped on it, and I had to sit on the bench by the helmsman and watch as Idomeneus and Stephanos planned our attack on the little convoy. Closer up we could see that the two Cilicians were not guarding the Egyptians. They were taking them. One of the low merchant ships had already been grappled, and there was blood in the water. Naturally, the Cilicians thought we were Phoenicians. Not that they cared. Cilicians are against every race. They ran north. We let them go and took the Egyptians for ourselves. One of their ships had already been taken and abandoned, and he was empty of life, decks red with sticky blood, and already breeding flies,